Uh, good morning, everyone. We'll get started here in a moment. Um, and I see that Louis Zim has joined us. So I think we have pretty much everyone. So um, take your virtual seats. We'll get started here in a moment. Well, good morning, everyone. It's day two, Monday, November 16th of uh, our November council meeting. Um, before we get started with our salmon agenda item, I'll turn to Chuck Tracy to see if he has any announcements. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, not really. We're on schedule. We've got uh, three salmon agenda items and then a halibut item at the end of the day. Um, I do want to check and see if um, Susan Bishop has been able to join us. I, we tried to move her over from attendees, but I haven't seen her appear as a panelist. Susan, are you on? Um, hi, Chuck, can you hear me? Yes, okay, so you're the 562 number then, ending in yeah. 981. Okay, great, we'll just rename you then. And um, I think we're pretty good. All right. Um, that's all, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Chuck. And I'm assuming uh, I saw that Chris Kern announced that uh, he was in the chair for ODFW. I assume Kyle Addix and Brett Cormos are in their chairs for their respective states. So um, we will get started with agenda item F1, preseason management schedule. And I will ask Mike Berner to give us our overview. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, agenda item F1 is our annual look at the upcoming salmon preseason process. Uh, we take a look at this in November because a lot of the meetings happen before March and we need to get uh, notices in the Federal Register and such and make some arrangements over the winter. So under this agenda item, we'll review the schedule for what we can expect in early 2021 as we get ready for next year's salmon seasons and uh, look to the council to approve a schedule that we can move forward with as we plan over the winter. Uh, as the situation summary shows, we have proposed some uh, actual meeting sites for hearings as we do every year. I think it's a pretty low likelihood given the, the pandemic situation that we'll be having in-person hearings, but uh, we did lay out a proposed schedule there, I guess, optimistically. <laughs> um, so I don't know is that we need to get too far into uh, discussions of where those locations and such will be. I think that's a pretty tough pretty much a foregone conclusion that those will be uh, in a virtual sense, much like our plans for the spring council meetings themselves. But um, in your uh, materials for this agenda item under attachment one is the proposal uh, for the meeting dates and uh, key uh, points as we move through the preseason process next spring. Uh, this was discussed by a couple of uh, your advisory bodies. There's a supplemental uh, salmon technical team report uh, in your briefing materials, as well as a supplemental report uh, from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife regarding some of the effects of COVID on their sampling and how that might affect the way we shape next year or the way we plan for things next year. So uh, once I'm done with an overview of the schedule, I, I guess I would look to CDFW to speak to their report and then uh, call on Dr. O'Farrell to give the salmon technical team report before uh, hearing council comments on uh, next year's schedule. Uh, so turning to attachment one, if it pleases the chair, I can walk through uh, what we're anticipating for next year. Please. All right. Uh, looking at attachment one, obviously November, we're here now talking about the schedule and making plans. Uh, in uh, January and February, the typical weeks in those two months, the salmon technical team will meet, again, likely virtually, uh, to put together first in January the review of 2020 ocean salmon fisheries. Uh, and then in February, uh, as they usually do, uh, they look at uh, the uh, forecasts across the suite of stocks in our FMP and draft preseason report one. Uh, both of those reports then make their way uh, into the March council process. Uh, for council consideration for the SSC to look at forecasts. Uh, and we uh, use all that uh, information, of course, as we get into the March meeting to uh, 
draft up a range of alternatives. You can see the March dates there for the council meeting. They're reflective of the quick reference that's in your briefing materials for our future meeting planning uh, and has a bit of an extended uh, March meeting, if you will, much like we've done with this meeting, where uh, take advantage of the virtual uh, meeting arrangement and spread the meeting out. Uh, one cost there, I guess, if you want to describe it that way, is that starting a little earlier in March with the March Council meeting will mean that the review materials I just went through, particularly preseason report one, it's scheduled to get published at the end of February. But uh, starting up advisory bodies on March 2nd means it'll be a, a little quicker turnaround than it even normally is. But uh, as everyone uh, is probably aware, the salmon process is quite condensed and getting all that data together um, while fish are still swimming up streams in many cases is a time crunch. And so we'll have a little bit of a, a little bit of a time pinch there. But we'll, so at the March meeting, we leave with preseason report two drafted shortly thereafter that shows uh, three alternatives for the 2021 salmon seasons. Um, little typo there in the schedule I see, but um, then between March and April is when we typically go out to stakeholders and agencies to develop uh, public uh, and the public to develop uh, recommendations on which of the three alternatives we'd like to see move forward. Uh, see March 22nd, the salmon team is expected to post preseason report due. Uh, we have our hearings, as I mentioned earlier, scheduled for the 23rd and 24th of March. That schedule is obviously tentative due to COVID and likely to be virtual, so that might be a little fluid, but. Uh, we'll get as much public input as we can between the March and April meetings. Again, then on page two, we'll come to April. Uh, again, spread that meeting out a little bit and expect that to be a virtual council session where we uh, work from preseason report two to narrow down to one alternative. Uh, the, the salmon technical team then will spend uh, mid to late April, as they usually do, finishing up preseason report three uh, and bundle that up uh, in an EA to go to National Marine Fishery Service uh, by the 22nd so that NIMS can work that through the process and get uh, seasons started by May 16th, a little later than the previous May 1 start uh, due to uh, Amendment 20 being approved. So a little bit extra time for NIMS to get the, the regulations in place, but still, uh, as usual, a compressed and quick turnaround. But um, again, though, I would say it's a fairly typical schedule given uh, Given all the virtual meetings we've been having, I think uh, this is about as good a fit as we could make. So unless there's questions of me on this schedule, uh, I'd be happy to answer those, or we could turn to your advisory body reports. Again, we have a report from CDFW and one from the Salmon Technical Team. Uh, thanks very, very much for that uh, overview, Mike. Are there any questions of Mike on the overview or attachment one? All right, thanks very much, Mike. So let's now go to the CDFW report. I'm not sure if I'm going to Brett to call on Alex or directly to Alex. So Alex is Mike is live. So yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, can you all hear me? All right, let's go to Brett first. Brett, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. My apologies. Uh, just responding to your question, Alex will be reading this report, so thank you. All right, then go for it, Alex. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Great. Um, I'm Alex Letvin from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I will be reading from agenda item F1A, Supplemental CDFW Report 1 entitled California Department of Fish and Wildlife Report on the Effects of COVID-19 on Sampling the 2020 Ocean Salmon Fishery. And before I start, I'll just say that the title of this report maybe doesn't jive uh, with the actual agenda item that's talking about pre-season planning in 2021, but um, as there are connections uh, between seasons, uh, results from the 2020 season will have some effects on pre-season fishery planning next, early next year for 2021. So it seemed like an appropriate time to kind of give this information to avoid any surprises uh, at the next council meeting in March. So with that, I will begin uh, reading a statement. At the April 2020 Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting, prior to the initiation of ocean salmon fisheries in California, the states of Washington, Oregon, and California produced a joint report detailing potential challenges for sampling the 2020 ocean salmon fishery due to safety concerns stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic. 
C agenda item E9A supplemental joint state agency report one from the April 2020 meeting. Some of these challenges were realized in California as fisheries commenced before personal protective equipment was acquired and COVID-19 related field sampling protocols were developed and authorized by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, hereafter referred to as CDFW. This resulted in a lapse for some data collection during the early part of the 2020 season compared to data that would be collected following standard protocols. While the majority of the season was sampled normally, these omissions may or may not require some solutions while finalizing the data inputs necessary for preseason fishery planning and postseason assessments in 2021. CDFW's ocean fishery sampling programs collect an array of data in the field, which facilitate estimation of three fishery components that support salmon fisheries management. One, total salmon harvest, two, total salmon directed fishing effort, and three, stock composition of the harvest, which is estimated from coded wire tags recovered from the heads of externally marked hatchery origin salmon. Consistent with coastwide standards and Pacific Salmon Commission recommendations, CDFW aims to physically sample 20% of the harvest stratified by fishery, management area, and half month period. The extent to which field sampling activities did not occur in 2020 varied by fishery and month. The commercial fishery was sampled normally in most times and areas with the only exception being the month of May when the San Francisco and Monterey management areas were periodically open. Although field sampling did not occur, harvest data for May are available via fish tickets, which are mandatory for all commercial landings. Effort and stock composition data, however, cannot be obtained from fish tickets and are unavailable for the month of May. Sampling commenced in June and continued through the remainder of the season. Regarding recreational charter and skiff fisheries, uh, charter boats were not sampled during May. However, very few charter boats were allowed to operate during that month due to local COVID-19 regulations and consequently, relatively few trips occurred. Harvest and effort data for the limited trips that did occur can be obtained from log books, but stock composition data is unavailable. Beginning in June, salmon charters were sampled following regular protocols for the remainder of the season. Private skiffs were not sampled at all during May or June. However, a proxy for effort data during those months is available via trailer counts. No such proxy exists for harvest or stock composition data. Modified field sampling activities commenced in July and continued through the remainder of the season. Since field staff were not able to safely handle angler catch and maintain social distancing in the course of performing their duties, salmon head collection protocols were modified such that salmon heads were only recovered from anglers who voluntarily provided them to CDFW staff. Angler cooperation varied by area, resulting in low sample rates for coated wire tags in some ports. Coordination on how to approach these data deficiencies is currently is underway between CDFW and members of the Salmon Technical Team and the Scientific and Statistical Committee. Preliminary discussions suggest that wherever possible, it may be best to not calculate estimates using unconventional methods for the 2020 fishery at this time. Various solutions are currently being considered and over the coming months, CDFW plans to further refine these solutions in coordination with the Salmon Technical Team and the Scientific and Statistical Committee to be ready in time for the 2021 preseason management process. And that concludes our statement and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alex. Are there questions of Alex? All right, Alex, thanks very much. Uh, next, we will hear. Yeah, I'll also add that I believe I'm also going to be reading the STT statement. <laughs> All right. Well, then I won't call on Michael Farrell. I'll call on Alex Letvin to read the Salmon Technical Team statement. Unless Mike has gotten on this call, but I know he was having some uh, issues connecting to the meeting. So I'll just go ahead and read this report. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. Uh, I'm Alex Letman with the Salmon Technical Team, and I will be re reading from Agenda Item F1A, Supplemental SDT Report 1, entitled Salmon Technical Team Report on the Proposed 2021 Preseason Management Schedule. The Salmon Technical Team has reviewed Agenda Item F1, Attachment 1, the proposed schedule for developing 2021 ocean salmon fishery management measures and supports moving forward with the schedule as outlined in this agenda item. While the expectation is that the 2021 preseason planning process will occur entirely via virtual meetings, 
The Salmon technical team does not anticipate any setbacks and expects to provide accurate and timely analyses and reports. And that concludes our statement. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Alex. Any questions for Alex? Uh, I am not seeing any. Um, that completes all of the management entity and advisory body reports that I have. Um, uh, Mr. Tracy, I don't see any uh, public comment signups. Uh, that's correct, Mr. Chair. No public oral co public comment. So uh, that will then take us to our council action, um, which will be is on the screen there. So let me look uh, and, and see who wants to get us started with uh, our discussion. I know it's Monday morning and it's tough to reach for that unmute button, but Kyle Attix. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as we heard in the, the council planning schedule, our spring meetings are likely to be virtual online experiences this year. Washington will be working over the next month or so to set up our normal schedule for the North of Falcon process, um, both our public process and our co-manager process, and, and anticipate that those also will be moving to a full preseason of virtual meetings. So um, meeting places and dates not quite as important as they have been in the past, there'll be a little flexibility with dates for things like hearings, and we'll make sure that our North of Falcon process meshes with, with the council process again this year. Thanks, Kyle. Brett Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, similar to what to what Mr. Addix said and, and what we heard from Mr. Berner, um, we anticipate the public hearing as well as the uh, California state hosted annual salmon information meeting to be held virtually this year. Uh, but by some miracle, if we are meeting in person uh, for the public hearing, the state of California agrees with the council recommendation to hold that meeting in, in Eureka. However, we don't anticipate that to be a, a reality. Thanks for that, Brett. Chris Kern. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, same situation for Oregon. I think I'll just leave it at that. All right. Further comment or discussion? Mr. Chairman, I believe Susan Bishop has her hand up. Uh, oh. Um, okay, Susan, I didn't see it on my screen, but go ahead, Susan. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just encourage, just note that the April 22nd, the anticipated date by which the council would post the adopted regulations um, on the website is a Thursday. Um, typically, the council transmits the um, package to us on sort of the, the subsequent day. Um, I would like to encourage the council to uh, uh, transmit the package to NIMS on the same day that it posts it on, it, on its website. Um, that would give us an additional day to begin work. Um, I think as Ryan has mentioned um, previous, in previous discussions, there's a lot going, back, going on back at headquarters these days um, and taking things longer to get to the Federal Register, for example. So even buying an additional day would uh, really would uh, very much help us out uh, in moving that along. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that, Susan. And oh, look, Chuck, I don't see why that should be a problem. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. We will uh, do our best. Um, I think we should be able to accomplish that with, um, with enough uh, lead time here. Great. All right. So it, it so it sounds like um, the council has uh, confirmed uh, the hearing sites and the intent and the and the state meetings. Although even though physical locations are mentioned, um, it's generally understood those will be virtual uh, in all likelihood. And uh, I think that there's been an approval of the uh, proposed schedule and process. 
Um, anyone disagree with that summary? Uh, Mike Berner, how are we doing? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you just uh, summarized things nicely. I just would note at the bottom of the schedule, the line that says that we need to be a little flexible under this uh, COVID world uh, as we move through next year. But um, it sounds like we've got a schedule and plan and we can move ahead. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Any, any last words on this agenda item before we close it out? All right. Thanks, everyone, for... Uh, for your work on this and getting through it in somewhat less than the 30 minutes allotted. Uh, so now we will move, uh, Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, I'm a little late, or late on the draw here this morning. Um, this, I, I just would note as a, 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 the state and it states in the, in NIMPS are, are or um, I was going to say painfully aware, but hopefully not too painful, that this is a, a, a significant uh, step, um, I think, for the, for the council um, and the modifications that are contained in the schedule and the process that uh, we just confirmed um, is a notable change in departure from what we used to do and the timing, and, and it's uh, obviously largely driven uh, by a change in the a, the um, approval process uh, once it leaves the the council. And um, you know, we had some big challenges. I think trying to figure out how we were going to navigate the time period between the first of May and and May sixteenth. Um, and I think there's been a lot of uh, great collaboration between the NIMPS and the states, as well as the fishing, the, the people impacted, both particularly in the commercial fishery, to try to figure out a way to navigate our way through, uh, keep people on the water, uh, and at the same time uh, respond uh, to the, approve the changes in the approval process, in particular the engagement. Um, by by NIMS headquarters uh, in that in a in a that I guess uh, more meaningful way. So just just want to acknowledge uh, all that work and the and the and the change here and and the process that uh, led up to this uh, this point. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Anything further? All right, we will move on to our next. Agenda item, the Southern Resident Killer Whale ESA consultation, uh, final action. So I will go right back to Mr. Berner to get us started here. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Agenda item F2, the Southern Resident Killer Whale Endangered Species Act consultation. This is final action, as the title implies, and culmination of over a year's worth of hard work from the work group that was formed back in April of 2019 to um, work with the Council and National Marine Fisheries Service on the latest reinitiation of consultation under the Endangered Species Act on the effect of council area ocean salmon fisheries on southern resident killer whales um, with a focus on the effects that those fisheries have on the Chinook salmon prey base um, for the whales. As I mentioned, the work group's been working uh, diligently for quite a while now in your briefing materials is the culmination of all that work uh, under their work group report. One is uh, an analytical document, a risk assessment that they presented earlier this year. It's been updated a bit. Um, you can see in Strikeout where things were updated. So your attachment two then is um, an addendum, if you will, to that work group report that shows some updated management responses uh, to uh, some of the things in the original uh, risk assessment uh, that they've developed since your September meeting. Um, additionally, under their work group report three, uh, they provided a report that uh, looks into uh, forecasting error and a potential bias that might have in uh, the development of some of the triggers that are uh, proposed in the alternatives in their risk assessment document. Uh, so following September, the work group updated uh, their risk assessment, as I mentioned, and have those three reports uh, available for you uh, as you consider final action here to amend the SAM and FMP potentially to uh, address um, the need. 
Additionally, National Marine Fishery Service has a supplemental report. Oh, sorry, I thought I had an interruption there. Um, so additionally, the uh, National Marine Fishery Service has a fleshed out analytical document starting to look more like a, a, a NEPA a, a document, if you will, that looks at the suite of alternatives that you left the September meeting with uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, Jeremy Jording is on the line and is prepared to give presentations both for the well, we're working. That's the interruption here I'm hearing. We're working on getting Jeremy Jordan lined up to give you a presentation, uh, both from the work group's perspective and also to walk you through uh, the analytical document that National Marine Fishery Service has provided uh, in the briefing book. Um, as we've seen all along with this agenda item, this one is uh, has garnered a lot of interest. We have uh, over 100 public comments in your briefing materials. Uh, and last I looked, we have several people signed up for oral uh, testimony here to the council. Uh, so, but again, at this meeting, the council is scheduled to look at the analytical materials I just went through and to adopt a final alternative based on the range of uh, analyzed alternatives in your brief briefing materials. Uh, there are also, in addition to the um, abundance triggers and potential management responses that, e that you see in the analytical document, there's also some other recommendations from the Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group regarding uh, some, uh, I guess, research and data needs kind of things, if you will, to look into uh, Sacramento and Klamath River conservation, Falls from the conservation objectives. Uh, so those uh, those recommendations are also there for your consideration. Uh, regarding advisory body statements for this agenda item, the Salmon Advisory Subpanel spent quite a bit of time uh, last week working on this issue and has uh, a supplemental report that's posted on our website now. Uh, and addition, additionally, the Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel uh, took up this matter and has a short report that's also in your supplemental materials. Uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, quite a few public comments, both written submissions, and we have, uh, last I looked, 13 folks signed up for oral testimony, including a presentation from Oceana. Uh, so again, just wrapping up my situation summary, the council action here is to consider the public comments and the analytical materials before you hear from the work group and National Marine Fishery Service uh, before entertaining a motion to potentially amend the salmon fishery management plan, uh, depending on which way the council wants to go uh, with the proposed uh, actions. So unless there's questions of me on the overview or what it is the council's uh, looking to achieve here for final action, uh, and if assuming we have Mr. Jording on the line now. I guess I would uh, look to Jeremy to give a work group report. Well, before going there, let's just see if there are any questions of your overview. Also, I don't see Jeremy on the list yet, but um, maybe he has a pseudonym. Are there any questions of Mike on the overview? Uh, not seeing any. Uh, Jeremy, are you on the line? Okay, I don't, I don't think we have Jeremy yet, um, oh, or maybe we do. Appreciate that. Uh, apologies for the uh, technical snafu there. Uh, I am on the line, and if you can hear me, um, I believe I am ready to go if Sandra can tee up our PowerPoint. We can hear you loud and clear. Thanks. Welcome, Jeremy. All right, thank you, Sandra. So once again, this is uh, Jeremy Jording uh, from National Marine Fisheries Service, West Coast Region, uh, Sustainable Fisheries Division. And I will be uh, using PowerPoint underneath agenda item F2A, supplemental. Uh, actually, uh, Sandra, let's start with the other PowerPoint, which is the work, work group PowerPoint. believe there is a second PowerPoint underneath this agenda item. Bear with us, Sandra's working on getting that up now. No worries, Th thanks Mike.
There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so once again, this is the supplemental work group presentation one underneath this uh, same agenda item. Um, next slide, please. And so as we heard in um, the SITSUM today, the work group will be reviewing our report number one, which is the range of management alternatives adopted for public review at the September council meeting. Uh, and we'll consider our work group report two, which is an updated list of responses that the council asked us to uh, verify and update. <clears throat> and then we will discuss um, the work group's report three on forecast accuracy in an attempt to reach uh, adopting a final preferred alternative for recommendation to a uh, National Marine Fisheries Service today. Uh, next slide, please. So recall in September, the work group provided a range of alternatives and recommendations to the council for consideration. And at its September meeting, the council adopted preliminary preferred or preliminary alternatives for public review. For the November meeting, the council asked the work group to provide additional information on two topics. One, implementation aspects of the list of management responses, uh, which are contained in work group report two, and assessment of the forecasting performance, which is contained in work group report three. Next slide, please. And so I'll begin with a recap of work group report one. Next slide, please. And so this slide provides a, a comparison from uh, the September work group report. And so you can see that section one is still no change, section two, no, no change. And all of the information that I'll be presenting in work group report two today will come uh, changes in section three, specifically the management strategy alternatives, which in the work group report is section 3.1.2.E. And uh, the following recommendations two and three, also no change from what was previously adopted, as well as section four. And so next slide, please. To refresh our memories as to how uh, the recommendations were structured, recommendation one includes management strategy alternatives and um, alternative 3.1.1 is the no action, which is on page four of work group report one. Alternative 3.1.2, is an action based on a single year, thresholds based uh, with four subgroups of thresholds, which start on page nine. Alternative 3.1.3, which would be based on multiple years with two subgroups of th thresholds. And then alternative 3.1.4, which is a tiered response still based on the thresholds. Recommendation two, would be to reevaluate conservation objectives for Chinook stocks, uh, labeled as alternative 3.2.1 for the Sacra Sacramento River Falls Chinook stock and 3.2.2 for the Klamath River Falls Chinook stock. Then finally, underneath recommendation three uh, for improving stock assessment analytic methods, there's a recommendation as alternative 3.3, which is to develop an age structured stock assessment for the Sacramento River Falls Chinook stock using a cohort reconstruction method. Next slide, please. And so to refresh ourselves, given three point, alternative 3.1.1 underneath recommendation one is the no action status quo FMP implementation, which would continue to simply use existing harvest control rules and reference points currently defined in the FMP on an annual basis. And there's some details here on this slide as to um, refresh how that would work, applying the FMP forward. Next slide, please. So alternative 3.1.2 is still establish a threshold for low Chinook abundance in the North Falcon area below which some management action would be triggered. 
And so uh, for folks under this concept, it would still be that council area ocean salmon fisheries would incorporate a responsive action designed to account for uh, the status of southern resident killer whales by establishing a pre-fishing Chinook salmon abundance using time step one as the starting abundance in the North Falcon area, below which some management action would be triggered. Next slide, please. So once again, here are the four variations of this alternative under alternative 3.1.2. I'm gonna go through them. They start on page nine through page 10. Um, 3.1.2.A is a single year base threshold based on the year 1994. Alternative 3.1.2.B is a threshold based on the arithmetic mean of the lowest three abundance years. Alternative 3.1.2.C is a threshold based on uh, 2020 NIMS guidance which is an arithmetic mean of the seven lowest years of abundance. And the years are listed on the slide as 1994 through 96, 1998 through 2000 and 2007. And then finally, alternative 3.1.2D, which is a threshold based on the maximum abundance during the mid to late 90s. So 95 through 2000. Next slide, please. So this slide depicts um, the alternatives and the resulting abundances. And uh, please note that these values represent the combined outputs from the Fram and Shelton et al. models uh, that the work group developed and are subject to change whenever recalibrating these models do occur. Please also note that um, the if adjusted for error value, um, should be recalibrated based on the work group's third report, which updated the forecast error estimate based on uh, finding an error in the calculation from our September 2020 report. So I'll just pause here so folks can uh, refresh their memories as to uh, the numeric values between 3.1.2a through d. Next slide, please. So then moving on to alternative 3.1.3, which would establish a threshold and responses and compare to a multi-year metric to determine if the time step one abundance projection is below the threshold. This alternative um, utilizes geometric means as three, a two-year geometric mean is under 3.1.3a and a three-year geometric mean is 3.13b. This type of approach would allow for consideration of multiple years that are likely important for reproductive success of Southern residents. And however, a single year low abundance would affect the geo mean for multiple years, which would increase the chance that responses would remain in place for multiple years if triggered. Next slide, please. And so then alternative 3.1.4 is a tiered response. And this option considers similar rationale to either alternative 3.13a or b in that a single year below the threshold is a concern, but consecutive years below that threshold uh, would trigger additional subset of responses that were not included in the prior year. Next slide, please. So moving into recommendation two, as I described in uh, an earlier slide, would be review escapement objectives for the major Chinook stocks in California, underneath 321, Sacramento River Fall Chinook, and underneath alternative 322, Klamath River Fall Chinook. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, recommendation three, once again, is to develop an age-structured stock assessment for Sacramento River Falls Chinook using cohort reconstruction methods. Next slide, please. 
And so now I will move into our work group report two, which um, will be an update to section 3.1.2E of uh, work group report one. Next slide, please. And so uh, moving into the management responses, once again, the goal would be to benefit Southern residents while still providing some fishing opportunity in years when Chinook abundance is deemed low uh, by surpassing a defiant threshold. And so when during years when Chinook abundance falls below the defined threshold, the following measures would apply and override prior language in the FMP where differences may occur. Uh, next slide, please. And so underneath management response number one, <clears throat> this is specific to North Falcon non-treaty fisheries. Chinook quotas would not exceed the point estimate generated by a regression analysis. So on this slide uh, is provided the regression analysis utilized that underneath option 1A, in the area north of Cape Falcon, Oregon, for all non-treaty ocean salmon fisheries, Chinook quotas would be reduced as needed to not exceed the point estimate of catch generated by this regression analysis, given preseason modeled abundances and based on the historical relationship between time step one North Falcon abundance Chinook and non-treaty Chinook quotas. At abundances that project quota values of less than zero, uh, based on that regression, the quota would be zero. Next slide, please. So underneath uh, response number two here in the area north of Falcon, there are several options by which the non-treaty commercial troll quota would be obtained incrementally over time. Option 2A would be a 50% cap, meaning the spring period assigned 50% or less. Option 2B uh, in the original report just referred to the 10-year geometric mean. Here we've defined that, which is 61% cap, as you can see by the information presented on this slide. And then option 2C would be to implement additional sub-area caps north of Leadbetter Point during the spring period. Next slide, please. So underneath management response three, in the area north of Falcon, we would adjust the time and area of the control zones used in non-treaty ocean salmon fisheries. Option 3A would be to increase the area of the Columbia River control zone from the start of non-treaty ocean salmon fisheries until June 15th. Here we've provided a map of the Columbia River control zone uh, that's proposed for change underneath this management response. There's also option 3B underneath this management response, which would close the Grace Harbor control zone. Given that that control zone is not changing in geographic area, uh, we have not provided a map for that particular control zone. Next slide, please. Underneath management response number four, this, has, this deals with North Falcon non-treaty start and end time adjustments. Option 4A in the area north of Cape Falcon, the start of the non-treaty ocean salmon fisheries would be delayed until June 1st. Underneath option 4B, that delay would occur until June 15th. Next slide, please. So management response number five deals with Oregon coastal waters. And so um, starting with option 5A, in the area between Cape Falcon and the Oregon California border that would delay the start of the commercial salmon troll fishery until April 1. Option 5B is in the Oregon uh, KMZ. It would close commercial and recreational fisheries beginning October 1st through March 31st of the following year, only when the California portion of the KMZ is concurrently closed. Option 5C, in the area between Cape Falcon and Cape Mears, consistent with the proposed Southern Resident Killer Whale Critical Habitat Area 1, would delay salmon fisheries until June 1st. And option 5C is intended to be implemented in concert with option 4A. Additionally, option 5D is very similar in that it would delay ocean salmon fisheries in the same area until June 15th, which is intended to be con uh, in concert with option 4B. So one thing of note here, 
um, a delay of fisheries in the area between Cape Falcon and Cape Mears may ultimately be easier for compliance and enforcement underneath, underneath either option 5C or 5D. Next slide, please. So management response number six deals with uh, California coastal waters. And so option 6A, beginning October 1st through March 31st of the following year, we close commercial and recreational fisheries in the Monterey fishing area. Option 6B, beginning October 1st through March 31st of the following year, close commercial and recreational fisheries in the California waters of the KMZ. Then option 6C, increase the duration of the Klamath control zone area expansion beginning September 1st through March 31st of the following year. And then option 6D, maintain 2020 status quo for the control zones in California state waters. Next slide, please. And so here we have um, highlighted maps for the council to indicate where these areas occur. You can see the Southern Resident uh, Critical Habitat Areas 1 and 2 to the map on the left and the map on the right on this slide. You can see the approximate location of Cape Mers, Oregon. Next slide, please. And so here, I, you know, given that um, we are working in generally a webinar only environment, um, if folks had had the chance to print any of the materials out, uh, this is a slide that is somewhat of a cheat sheet for the council so that you can grab each alternative, see a brief description, and uh, the comment hopefully captures a little bit of information as to uh, what exactly the brief description is, is meaning. And you can see underneath, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the numbers in blue, if it's showing up on your screen, are the updated uh, for the new error adjustment from the September meeting. Next slide, please. Similar in vain, here is a uh, hopefully a cheat sheet, so to speak, for the management responses. So this summarized list of responses goes from response 1A through 6D. Uh, once again, you can see responses 1A through 4B are in the North Falcon area. Responses 5A through 5D are Oregon coastal water areas. Responses 6A through 6D, again, are California coastal waters. Next slide, please. And so now I will go through work group report number three underneath this agenda item. Next slide, please. And so our work group report three um, includes two analyses used to assess the forecast bias, which produced similar results using the best information available. We do note in the report uh, the, the small sample size limitations. And so uh, we provide considerations based on the information in report three that if the council decides on an adjustment to a particular threshold is necessary to address forecast bias, the work group suggests an adjustment of 1.08. And as you can see from earlier slides where I indicated there were updates uh, to numeric values based on these uh, updates here, our original estimate, estimate was 1.19. Uh, the other consideration would be to consider periodic reviews to assess if a fundamental change to the forecast bias has occurred over time. Um, next slide, please. And with that, I would like to uh, express my extreme appreciation for all of the hard work that the work group members have put in in between uh, the September uh, webinar and the November council meeting to have these materials ready, as well as uh, working through the environment we find ourselves in. And with that, I'll entertain any questions that council may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Obviously, uh, you and the work group have put in a tremendous amount of effort on a difficult and sometimes contentious issue. So thanks to all of you. Um, let's see if there are questions 
for Jeremy. No hands. Uh, Chuck Tracy. Mr. Chair, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, I think I understood uh, just about everything there. I just I just did have one question about the uh, uh, forecast error bias calculation. So just wonder if you could give a little more detail on, on how that works. So I, I gather that when the forecast is low, there's uh, tends to be a low bias. And so is that is that how that's working? And then presumably when it's higher, there's a high bias. Um, good question, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tracy. And so in terms, if I understand the, the question correctly, you're your understanding that the bias may change or asking if the bias changes with um, annual variation in um, salmon abundance, either low or high. And <clears throat> it, it's more that the forecast may tend to be too high when true abundance is low, which often comes when forecasts are low. So, um, does that answer the question, Mr. Tracy? Yes, thanks, Jeremy. Pete Hassemer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Jeremy, for the presentation. <clears throat> I'm not sure, uh, maybe if Sandra could go back to slide 25. Um, I'm just trying to, to sort out the difference between some of these options and um, and discern whether or not we're, we'd be selecting between different options. The one that uh, I have a question about, uh, I guess most directly is three, three A versus B. And for comparison, when, when you look at option two, uh, two A, two B, it, it, it seems pretty, well, my understanding would be you're you're deciding on what level the cap should be. Would we want to select a 50% cap or a 61% cap? So you'd be choosing one or the other, uh, specifying a level of cap. But in three, it's two different areas, control zones, the Columbia River and the Grays Harbor. And I, I question why it, it's an option of one or the other, or is would the intent be to include both of those? I, I guess I'm trying to figure out if you went with the Columbia River control zone option, would the effect of that, or, or is the expected outcome from modifying those areas the same? regardless of which control zone is modified, or could you fine tune it that you would expect a different outcome in one year if you just closed the Grays Harbor control zone and left the Columbia River control zone. So sorry if that's confusing, but you know, those, it seems like those two aren't an either or that you would want to have them on your menu to be able to implement either one, or am I looking at the expected outcome from that option incorrectly? Thanks. And I can clarify that more if you need, if you need it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hasmer. I, I believe I understand the question and I, I do uh, apologize up front for somewhat placing us in this conundrum by the formatting because I do understand this could have been formatted a bit um, better to address uh, what I should have anticipated was this question. You are correct. So if you look at this slide, uh, technically management response 1A operates by itself. When you get into uh, management response 2A through 2C, 
they are more of pick a particular management response here than when you move into um, management response three. Once again, it's very similar. You can choose 3A or 3B. Uh, management response four is um, you can choose one or the other, whereas underneath three, you could choose uh, both. And so as you work your way through this, um, I believe the, the date restrictions of both June 1st and June 15th, uh, recall that I'm, I'm skipping down here now to management response 5C and 5D are coupled with management response 4A and 4B. And so there is, once again, a, a bit of um, complexity if choices are made to incorporate the delay um, starts of seasons there if, if the council so chooses. Um, I think maybe management response six in total is the clearest that each one of those is a, a singular choice. But hopefully this updated information uh, answers uh, Mr. Hasmer's question. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. I, I'll think about that a little more. I think I, I get it now. Thanks, uh, Pete and Jeremy. Uh, any further questions of Jeremy on the multiple uh, work group reports? Uh, not seeing any. Jeremy, thanks very much, but I'm sure you'll stick around because uh, I imagine there'll be further uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. As we get into council discussion. All right. Uh, next, uh, I have the Salmon Advisory Subpan report. I have Ryan Johnson providing that. So go ahead, Ryan. Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you. Um, the Salmon Advisory Subpanel was provided an overview of the Southern Resident Killer Whale Workgroup Report for this agenda item by the Workgroup's co-chair, Jeremy Jording. The SAS appreciates the Workgroup's hard work and time spent on first developing a risk assessment and now a range of alternatives for council consideration. The SAS understands that SRKWs are affected by multiple environmental pressures with availability of prey being one of those factors. Although noise pollution and toxins are also major factors affecting the whales, the work group was tasked with focusing only on the effects of council area fisheries on the abundance of Chinook, the primary prey of SRKWs. The SES feels strongly that increased production of salmon at federal, state, and tribal hatchery facilities is the most dependable tool available to increase the prey base for whales. Following a lengthy discussion, the SAS continues to recommend the adoption of Alternative 3.1.1, a no-action status quo fishery management plan implementation. The SAS agrees with the work group report outlining that weak stock management requirements already embedded in the directed fishery harvest process, and the SAS would emphasize the uncertainties regarding the effectiveness of action alternatives in achieving something better for the whales. <clears throat> While there are uncertainties about the outcomes of implementing the other alternatives, there is no uncertainty as to the impact of those actions on fishermen and coastal communities. Reduced opportunities, shortened seasons, and severe financial impacts will have very real consequences for the industry with only speculative benefit for the SRKW population. The SAS feels that eliminating fishing in April and May removes the most lucrative fishing period and the strongest markets for troll caught Chinook salmon and is an unnecessary burden to place on the fishing community. The SAS would note that reduced ocean abundance forecasts for salmon have historically resulted in proportionate reductions in the allowable salmon catch and further that um, in season management adjustments are commonly used to address so real time performance to meet management objectives. 
annual scientifically developed ocean salmon abundance estimates coupled with the management decisions by the council is a much more fluid and dynamic approach to dealing with the requirements of providing sufficient forage for SRKWs and balances the social and economic needs of fishermen and coastal communities and is responsive to rapidly changing conditions. Should the council consider an action rather than status quo, the SAS feels the least restrictive is warranted until more contemporary data are collected, until other means of increasing the prey base, such as increased hatchery production are implemented, and until other factors affecting SRKW health are addressed. Due to the lack of significant relationship between salmon abundance and SRKW demographics and health, the SAS feels that a lower trigger threshold value is justified. The SAS would propose for consideration a trigger value of 957,330 Chinook based on the arithmetic mean of preseason abundance north of Cape Falcon in time step one between the years 1994, 1995, and 1996. <clears throat> Recognizing the importance of using a suite of low abundance years in succession when evaluating the lag survival of SRKWs. The SAS also notes that this particular set of years coincides with a decline in the whale population as seen in figure 3-3 on page 35 of agenda item F2A, leading the SAS to believe that during times such as these with lower levels of Chinook abundance, a fisheries management response may benefit the whales. The SAS believes a, a trigger level of 957,000 330 finds a balance between providing opportunity to the fleet in years of low abundance while potentially benefiting the forage needs of SRKW. The decrease in the trigger threshold from alternative two value of 966,000 could provide a very impact, could be very impactful to the survival of individual fishing vessels and be able to maintain SRKW health in years of low abundance. Although the benefits to SRKW resulting from proposed management responses is difficult to quantify, the SAS out of an abundance of caution for the SRKW conservation would prefer some of the management responses listed in alternative two, including 1A, the further limit of North of Falcon non-treaty Chinook quotas, 2A, attain North of Falcon non-treaty quota incrementally over time, 3A, closure of the Columbia River control zone, including spatial expansion from January 1 through June 15th. 3B, closure of the Grays Harbor control zone, including temporal expansion adjustments. 5A, delay in the opening of Oregon South Falcon control until April 1st. Uh, 6A, close the California uh, KMZ and Monterey areas October 1 through March 31st, 6B, close the Klamath River control zone, including expansion. The SAS opposes the implementation of management responses 4A, uh, delay of North of Falcon until June 1, 4B, a delay of North of Falcon until June 15th, and 5C, a delay of non-treaty fisheries between Cape Falcon and Cape Mears until June 1st. These very restrictive responses place a heavy burden on the fleets because they impose time and area closures at a time of the year with the best market conditions for the commercial sector. The SAS would prefer to limit the spring quota over time according to a 50-50 split to allow limited springtime access to markets while removing less forage base than in years past. These low abundance years will be lean economic years for the fleet in this early market opportunity and corresponding increase X vessel values for Chinook in this period would help keep small family owned businesses and supporting industries afloat. <clears throat> the SAS also supports recommendations two and three from agenda item F2A, the work group report one, regarding the reevaluation of conservation objectives for Klamath and Sacramento Fall Chinook and improvements to stock assessment and analytic methods. The SAS does not support the method of using a running two-year geometric mean to determine if the current abundance falls below the set threshold. Instead, the SAS sees the value in using a single year's preseason time step one abundance in relation to the threshold because the single year method 
is more reactive and quicker to respond to changes in Chinook abundance. The SAS does not support incorporating forecast air into the preseason time step one abundance value as supported in agenda item F2A, NIMS report one, which states on page 19 that since we are comparing the threshold to post-season estimates of abundance, Oh, turn my page. As opposed to preseason estimates, there is no need to apply the forecast air adjustments to the threshold. The SAS would like to recognize the many years that the Cape Flattery Control Zone has been in effect, which has provided a benefit to the killer whales in a known feeding hotspot and restricted fishing in a large portion of very productive fishing grounds. <clears throat> Due to the new management strategies, assumptions, and uncertainties, in the existing analysis, the SAS further recommends that the council consider adding the SRKW threshold and response analysis into the annual consideration of the model evaluation work group to evaluate the accuracy of the Shelton distribution model, errors in time step one forecast, and any modeling bias that may lead to the benefit of whales at the cost of restrictive fishery regulations placed on fishermen and coastal communities. In conclusion, the SAS continues to recommend the council adoption of alternative 3.1.1, the no action status quo fishery management plan implementation, because the existing plan is already well suited to reducing fishing opportunity at low salmon abundance and the beneficial relationship between the proposed managers, management responses and our SRKW health is uncertain, but they come with a high cost to salmon fisheries. Should the council decide to move ahead with an action alternative to implement a Chinook abundance trigger, below which fishery management actions are taken, please strongly consider the SAS proposed abundance trigger and avoid the unnecessarily restrictive responses noted above. And that concludes the statement. Thank you very much, Ryan. Are there any questions for Ryan on the SAS statement? Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just had a question about some of the management responses that you listed here on page two. Uh, in particular, um, if you or if the SAS meant to omit management response 5B, which was closing the Oregon KMZ October 1st through March 31st, um, and, and, and if so, why? And, and, my, and the reason why is because I believe that action was meant to complement response 6A, the California KMZ closure, which the SAS did include. Um, I do not believe we meant to omit that. Um, there was opposition um, from the SAS that there's uh, important fisheries that happen in that time and area um, to the coastal towns within Oregon. So I think um, it was should have been listed under uh, the opposed paragraph. Great, thank you. Thank you. Chris Kern. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up on that um, uh, question from Mr. Wolf and, and Ryan's response just to clarify something. I think the issue in the Oregon area that is being referenced there is um, clarifying that the, the uh, what we call the bubble fishery uh, near the Chetco, and we do uh, um, have that in some years, uh, would not be part of the closure. It's a uh, basically a river mouth centric fishery as opposed to a you know the full zone um, Ryan does that sound and and so clear clarifying that that action would would not include that bubble fishery but would still go with uh, the closure in California is am I recalling that conversation correctly that's what I've been sort of hearing from RSAS folks I would say that is correct then yes thank you Any, anything further, Chris? No, I'll put my hand down now. Thank you. Great. <laughs> uh, Phil Anderson, followed by Butch Smith. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Ryan, and, and to the SAS for the the uh, great report you provided us. Um, Ryan, I was I was in particular looking at the suggestion that the threshold be determined by um looking at the 94 95 96 time frame uh, the result is um a, a change in in um 
from alternative two from 966 down to 957, 330, and you go on to state that uh, that could prove to be very impactful to the survival of the individual fishing vessels. And so I was looking at that and I'm looking at the data uh, that I've got available to me here in a in a in the quick time frame of of looking for it, and I'm not. Uh, I guess uh, in in looking back, I, I don't see um, years where the threshold. You know, if we would have hit that threshold at 966, we would have also hit it at 957. From what I can see. Um, and maybe I'm missing something, but I'm just trying to understand how what I see is a fairly small difference between those two could have a, quote, very impactful, uh, could prove to be very impactful to the survival of the individual fishing vessels. I mean, I understand if you do, if it's 960 and we had 957, that you'd have a year when, when the trigger wouldn't be... Um, implemented, but um, I'm not, in looking back, I'm having a hard time understanding the, the conclusion that it would be very impactful to the survival of the individual fishing vessels. Wondered if you could comment on that. Ryan? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question. Um, I think the SAS was interested in just kind of looking to the future and um, because that threshold would have a response, it was an implemented um, in terms of an individual fishing boats, profit mar salmon boats, profit margins on the year, it could have a impact to that individual boat, whether they can, um, make their boat payment or whether a young salmon fisherman has just come into the fleet, um, can continue to make the boat payment, um, in terms of deckhands making some of that <coughs> increased springtime, um, income for, um, uh, versus, not um so it would be the just have that lower trigger because it's a important value to the fleet just follow up mr chairman please yeah thanks Ryan, for that um that explanation so i just wanted to confirm that in looking at when we look back understanding that and yourself and the SAS was trying to look out ahead and, and I appreciate that perspective but you didn't you didn't necessarily see anything in, a, in the way of hind casting between those numbers that there would have been a significant change in the number of times the threshold would have been triggered that's, that's correct. correct not so much in the time in the respect of hind casting but just looking out for the fleet moving forward right Gotcha. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thanks, Phil and Ryan. Uh, Butch Smith. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have two questions for uh, Mr. Johnson. Um, great presentation by the SAS, by the way. Um, Mr. Johnson, I think it's important maybe to elaborate, um, you know, the difference of, of uh, being able to start earlier in the year. Um, Price wise, you know, for the fleet versus, you know, a delayed fisheries. Um, in my experience, sometimes fish can be as much as three or four pounds or th three or four dollars a pound different. Um, was that was that the thinking? That's question one. And then and then question two is the, uh, the virtual penalty box. Um, geometric mean two year or three year penalty box versus you you get a you get a bad year you sit on the beach and then the fish come roaring back like we have seen uh you, you get to go fishing uh, again can you elaborate how important that was a discussion to the sas and and uh who you represent please sure uh the dealing with the um market conditions in the springtime um Sometimes the the price will be um, almost double compared to what it can be in the middle or later part of June. Um, sometimes it can start as high as twelve, eleven dollars a pound, and fall to half of that. Um, and it's an important time to the fleet because uh, the business model works in that um, 
you, you know, a responsible vessel is going to budget last year's income into the spring, but sometimes it's difficult. You have unforeseen costs that come to repairs and haul outs in the springtime. Um, there's some certain Coast Guard regulations that have to be undertaking, and, and the majority of the fleet um, starts in the red and, and very much looks forward to that um, spring income in that spring time period. Um, in terms of the North Falcon fishery, uh, it benefits from, um, uh, it's just that it's just important to the fleet to have that springtime period. Um, in terms of the penalty box in the, in the, the single year threshold, um, it's, uh, we just felt it was more responsive that if, you know, if we say, if the council so choose to adopt a threshold, um, we couldn't understand the rationale to once it's implemented to, to maybe not take an action that year. So we thought um, the single year would benefit the whales. And in terms of when abundance responds, um, the fishing fleet would be able to resume um, a normal FMP plan um, and wouldn't be subject to the uh, severe crash one year and then a, a normal abundance and uh, restricting fishing the second year. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Follow up. Um, th thank you. Those are, those are good answers. And so recognizing that, um, you know, the, the price thing between the spring um, is very important because also the, these quotas are going to be severely re, uh, restricted also. So trying to, trying to virtually, or in a way of saying getting the biggest bang for your buck then is what you're saying is is to uh, make sure you have some of that early time so you can capitalize on, on the market which would probably be a, a a poor season in general anyway because of the of the difficulties we're in with the chinook um uh is that correct is that what you're is that what you're leading to ryan yes that's correct um there wouldn't be um the high quota numbers as at these low abundances so it would already be tight times so of our removals um the more we could take in a better market condition uh the better it would be for the fleet thank you mr johnson that, that's all mr chair thank you uh thanks butch kyle addicts thank you mr chair um mr johnson thanks for the very thorough report um, on page three of your report, you mentioned the Cape Flattery control zone. It was also mentioned in some of the um, public comments through the council website. Um, not necessarily a question, but that, that's a control zone that was mentioned in the work group reports, but not necessarily highlighted in um, any of the presentations to the council. But it's an area that's larger than any of the control zones being considered for um, additional action here but it's completely composed to non-treaty troll fishing. So it's not a proposal for a new closure, but I think it's worth um, recognizing what you highlighted there, that there's a very large area right off the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, an area that um, whales have to transit through as they come and go through Puget Sound out into the ocean, and that that area has been closed for, for more than 20 years, um, all times of year, to non-treaty troll fishing. So thanks for um, pointing that out in your report. Third question. Sorry, as I said, it's not really a question, but Ryan, could you just confirm that that's the area you're talking about that's already completely closed, closed to the non-treaty troll fleet? Yes, sorry about that. Yeah, um, Cape Flattery up at the mouth of Strait of Juan de Fuca is a, a large area with, um, yes, known, known killer whale feeding hotspot, and um, we've been restricted from that area for several, for over 20 years. All right, thanks for that, Ryan. Any further questions of the SAS? Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, and with that, we'll go back to Jeremy Jording. I neglected to call on Jeremy for the NIFS presentation. So, um, Jeremy, you're back on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
And for the council, I will be utilize once again, this is Jeremy Jordan from NIMS West Coast Regions, Stanford Fisheries Division. I will now be using NIMS Supplemental Presentation 1 here, okay, under Agenda Item F2A to summarize NIMS Supplemental Report Number 1 under this same agenda item and walk the council through its construction. And so, uh, next slide, please. So the report is designed to inform the public and council of the range of effects from the recommendations the council adopted at its September 2020 meeting. We want to acknowledge the work group again with its workload was busy uh, with what the council had assigned it. NIMPS thought it important to be able to contrast the range adopted. So provided this report to disclose differences among the range for the council's consideration as it develops its preferred alternative. As you know, this type of contrast is typically part of the control rule development as it provides important information on performance metrics of interest to the council and is important um, to NIMS subsequent National Environmental Policy Act analysis. Next slide, please. And so the report is organized into five sections and an appendix. Uh, with section one providing background information, the purpose and need, and a description of the proposed action. Section two describes the alternatives uh, constructed in the report. Section three then describes the affected environment. Section four analyzes the potential environmental impacts of the alternatives from section two. Section five lists the references cited in the document, and Appendix A describes the data modeling used for section four. Next slide, please. And so the comparisons we provide are to the no action alternative. But given there are three recommendations accompanied with multiple management responses in the range that the council adopted, we also provide comparisons across different threshold strategies by comparing the alternatives in the NIMS report to each other. So we compare annual to geometric mean use. We compare the management responses such as hard dates of closure versus limits when catch could occur. Uh, we utilize the data series from the work group's risk assessment to assess effects on the metrics across our alternatives. And this is because we expect the range of abundances experienced over this data series is likely representative of the range of abundances we expect to see in future years. Next slide, please. So there are three alternatives in the NIMS report. Uh, first, the no action, which is the management under the current FMP provisions. No, alternative two, which is a mid option in between the no action and alternative three, which alternative three is the highest threshold with the most restrictive fishery management options determined. Within the report, uh, table 2-3, and then the accompanying text, pages 23 through 25, explain why certain elements of the council's range of recommendations, but notably the threshold values of 813 and 874 were not analyzed further in the report. Next slide, please. And so I'm going to walk the council here through an example using alternative two of how the report is organized um, so that you, if you were reading it and it was um, somewhat confusing, hopefully this clarifies how you can interpret the report's organization and results. So using the threshold of 966, on page 18, uh, there are tables that describe underneath this alternative, here are the management responses that are implemented. And you can see uh, by the X's, the management response 1A, 2, 3A, 3B, 5A, 5B, then 6A, 6B are incorporated in this alternative. Um, next slide. And you can see in contrast that these responses that are unchecked here would be included on alternative three. 
Next slide, please. And so we compare the threshold in each alternative and associated management measures retrospectively by time step across three different periods to what actually occurred. And so here it's important to recall that the threshold is evaluated against this time step one in the North Falcon area. So that first line and uh, this slide depicts table 3-4, which is the baseline for what actually occurred. And so you can see against these three different time periods, which we describe as to why these different time periods are chosen in the report, you can see the relative actual abundance that occurred over those different decadal uh, periods fluctuates a bit. You can also see in... Um, Table 4-1, page 59 of the report, that as over time you have seen Chinook abundance increase, as this slide depicts in the numeric values for the time step one North Falcon area, that uh, current FMP management provisions um, have restricted fisheries over the same time period to the point where they're taking uh, less fish than they did uh, back in the early earlier portion of this time series. Next slide, please. Moving through our example, as part of our retrospective analysis, this uh, we determined the number of years when an abundance was below an alternative's threshold. So in this particular slide, we're depicting a table 4-3, which is showing if you apply alternative 2, the abundance threshold of 966, you can see, uh, if, if, if you can see it, maybe I should have chosen different colors, uh, recognizing potential color blind, blinded people, but there's pink that identifies when years would have been uh, below the threshold, and the green is uh, threshold determination years when it's above the threshold, and once again, you can kind of see a general pattern here that there's a period with poor ocean conditions and periods with better ocean conditions, which generally means you're not going to experience a, a threshold trigger at all. Uh, next slide, please. And so then we move into evaluating how the fishery is affected by the management responses. So on page 67 for alternative two, you can see that by um, adjusting what proportion of catch is available to a different time step, it pushes the, the catch into a later time step. And then you can see, and that's in the North of Falcon area, as there are different management responses um, in each area, you can see I've highlighted just a few uh, in case you're wondering what the numbers mean from positive to a negative value. And you can also see in um, the California coastal waters, some of the closures make reductions. And so the way you read this table would be the difference from alternative one, which is the no action through management responses modifies how many um, fish were expected to be modeled caught. And then the difference from alternative three here would mean that um, alternative three is actually more restrictive because this allows positive catches in, in certain cells. So next slide, please. So then our modeling also allows us to evaluate what abundances would be after fishery management responses are implemented retrospectively. And this slide depicts very much what I was describing earlier in the uh, color-coded table, which indicates if, if you, uh, next slide please, Let's see if this, there we go. You can see that uh, the North of Falcon time step one uh, abundance in this particular uh, period uh, was generally closer to the uh, threshold. And so 
you're going to see that the difference between the uh, uh, the way a fishery response would adjust how much abundance is left over is generally smaller, um, but still applies, meaning the positive has increased the amount of fish available versus the difference from alternative three means alternative three because it's all negative numbers in this value means alternative two would not increase the abundance by as much. As you move across the line, that's how you interpret the positive and negative values. But you can also see in the, in the last row, because the abundance since 2009 in the time series has been so high that you're not going to experience triggerable events. And therefore the zeros in the last column simply mean that during periods of stronger ocean conditions, when the threshold is not implemented, you will not see any changes from um, current management. Next slide, please. We also provide qualitative comparisons underneath each alternative for effects to the uh, killer whales uh, in each in each table. Uh, in this table, you can see that there are uh, qualitative positives when comparing alternative two compared to alternative one. Next slide, please. And so here is our take home slide. This report um, indicates when comparing the FMP current framework to historical catches, it is more responsive to Chinook abundance and southern resident killer whale needs than past fishery regimes were. NIMS is still concerned about years of low abundance in North Falcon waters, which have coincided with poor Chinook survival and low southern resident killer whale viability. And NIMP supports a North Falcon abundance threshold based on multiple continuous years of low Chinook salmon abundance and poor mixed southern resident killer whale status. We also support management responses to low abundance conditions that would occur throughout the EEZ to consider the temporal and spatial needs of the whales based on the work group's findings. I believe that's my last slide. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Are there questions for Jeremy on the NIPS report? Uh, I am not seeing any hands. There we go. Chris Kern. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and Jeremy, thanks for the report. Um, understand the, the document itself was, was uh, pretty uh, substantial and uh, uh, appreciate uh, your your assistance here with the slideshow in, in helping us work through the report. Uh, on your last slide, the first real bullet or paragraph uh, sentence, I guess it is, um, I don't recall any slides that really talked about that particular um, item, the uh, current framework compared to historical. Could you maybe speak to that a little bit, or or if I missed a slide, maybe point me to it, but I think the report discusses it, but I didn't see a slide, so I wondered if you could give us a little uh, brief rundown on that item. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Kern, just for uh, verification. I heard you mentioned the um, historical framework, which is the first sentence on this slide. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. The, the comparison between current versus historical. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. And so, Mr. Kern, <clears throat> uh, there is a slide in this presentation where I briefly um, hit that topic. I believe it is slide seven, um, which uh, characterizes uh, yes, that slide. Uh, you can see table 4.1 on page 59 that indicates current FMP management provisions projected retrospectively. And so um, we do compare underneath table 3.4 in um, section 3 is the baseline. So these are the baseline abundances. And what we do evaluate in alternative one, 
I guess, to expound on, on the information that's listed in this particular slide. In alternative one, we do apply management provisions as, to the best of our ability um, retrospectively underneath the current uh, fishery management provisions. However, there are aspects to both Oregon and California management that we were unable to incorporate given uh, many of the representatives uh, from those states who were busy preparing for this council meeting in the short time period uh, we were able to prepare this report in. And so much of the information uh, in comparing those two uh, areas and uh, states' fisheries for alternative one are simply what occurred historically. And so uh, I would note that we do mention that briefly in the report, but I, I think I should highlight here that here for the council. So does that answer your question, Mr. Kern? Chris? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, it does, uh, Jeremy, thank you. Um, I, I think what I'm hearing and, and understand the caveat about the South of Falcon fisheries, um, but where the where possible, uh, which is the North of Falcon uh, area, you've just described the sections of the report that uh, NIMS was able to go back and reconstruct what fisheries would have looked like back uh, in those years under current uh, framework. And that, that is a place where we can look to see what the effect of, for instance, uh, uh, revised guidance on ESA limits for tulies or other stocks, as well as Pacific Salmon Treaty effects, uh, would be captured, correct? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kern. That is correct. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Joe Oatman, followed by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Jeremy, for the presentation that you just provided. Uh, I have a couple of comments as well as uh, two questions uh, in, in response to the presentation. So the first comment uh, that I have is that uh, when, when we look at the report uh, under alternative one uh, regarding the status quo, uh, it has a sentence that reads as follows. Salmon fisheries would also continue to be managed consistent with the Pacific Salmon Treaty and tribal fishing rights. Uh, regarding that sentence, uh, the tribe suggests adding this sentence to each alternative or adding language to each alternative that highlights tribal reserve fishing rights and implies the operation and management of tribal fishing will not change. Uh, the second comment uh, is with respect to given the public interest in this issue, uh, the tribe suggests NIMS clarify the document as follows. The document refers to non-treaty fisheries, but does not explain who is included in the non-treaty fishery or that non-treaty refers to non-Indian fishing. Uh, the Pacific Salmon Treaty is the only explicit mention of a treaty in the document that we can tell. So those are our two comments um, that we would uh, put forward um, for consideration. Uh, uh, the next uh, areas that I want to um, focus in on would be two questions that we would like to also have uh, addressed. So as the coastal tribes have stated in previous tribal testimonies, salmon and southern resident killer whales are of significant cultural and spiritual importance. There's interest in better understanding the long-term federal measures being considered to recover southern resident killer whales. If NIMPS adopts additional Chinook restrictions on non-treaty fisheries, uh, as the agency recommended in the NIMPS report, would it be part of a coordinated multi-agency approach to address the three primary southern resident killer whale threats, or would this be a standalone action by NIMPS? And then the second question 
is in Washington State, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, has walked back water quality standards. However, Section 3.1 does not acknowledge this action. This federal action has a negative impact act on the health and survival of salmon and southern resident killer whales. Does NIMPS have an official position on this and can a formal comment letter be expected? So with that, um, those are the two comments and the two questions uh, for NIMPS. Uh, and if there needs to be any uh, additional uh, reminders what those are, I can certainly do that. Thank you. Great, right, thanks, uh, Joe. Uh, so, uh, Jeremy, if you could respond to the questions that uh, Joe has had put forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to unpack that a bit, I understood the first question as um, would if NIFS adopts additional Chinook restrictions on untreated fisheries would it be part of the uh, multi-agency approach to address three uh, the three primary threats to southern resident killer whales or would it be a standalone action i um i would say it's part of the approach um however you know as as i think we've explained that each um action that comes before us through section seven um, goes through a section seven analysis and then um, the last question i think is outside the scope of the action which focuses on the impacts of the council fisheries um, but i believe if if possible i have a colleague um, within the protected resources division who may be on now uh, Teresa Mangelo, if there is anything she uh, wishes to add in order to respond to Mr. Oatman's uh, question, I would offer that opportunity. If that's yeah, I know we were trying to get Teresa connected. Teresa, are you there? Mr. Chair. Yes. Is that you, Teresa? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Please. Please uh, add your response. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Council. Yeah, I think um, this is a good question to raise. I think it's important to highlight um, that, you know, in order for Southern Resident Killer Whales to recover, we really do need to address, um, you know, all the threats that are facing the whales. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, contaminants and the accumulation in the whales, and we've talked about vessel impacts um, and noise um, uh, impacts, and then also prey availability. Um, where this particular fishery um, co uh, comes into play is as part of the prey availability and there's little vessel um, impact as well that we analyze in the, the ESA Section 7 consultation, um, which is what we focus on here. But within sort of this larger picture, um, we we do look at um, you know for example water quality. So we've had um, we've worked with several um, agencies um, and and the industry in Washington State for consultations on water quality to reduce wastewater um, uh, impacts. Uh, we've done the same in uh, California waters as well. There was a, a large wastewater um, permit that we worked with um, the industry um, to help start monitoring for contaminants to uh, reduce impacts. Um, off Oregon waters, we've looked at water quality, uh, the water quality standards. Um, for that consultation, it was a jeopardy for killer whales. Um, so we've been working with the um, EPA on those. Um, so all of these pieces of water quality that I'm mentioning um, will be considered in um, this current consult or in this current assessment, if you will. Um, we also have looked at, you know, vessel impacts um, across the Wales range. Uh, specifically, there's vessel regulations in the inland waters of Washington, um, both state and federal regulations, and those have 
now been um, sort of reassessed at this point, um, and there's discussion about if there's need to um, 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 sort of create further restrictions for those regulations. And there's also an, um, discussion on new permitting for you know, the commercial whale watching fleet that's in the inland waters. Um, there didn't used to be a permitting system, so that, that's in discussion with the state. And we're working very closely also with Canada um, to um, reduce the impact of the large uh, ships that come into the inland waters of Washington. Um, and then lastly, with the prey availability, we look at all the fisheries um, for consultations and, and look to see what their impacts are. Um, and then with like the uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty, there's some mitigation, as you're probably familiar with, um, that increases uh, hatchery production to sort of offset uh, some of the some of the fisheries, salmon fisheries in particular. So all of those components and all of the mitigation um, is important to consider when we're looking at this particular, the PFMC fisheries, but um, the only way to really recover these killer whales is to um, have a collaborative approach across um, the geographic range with multiple agencies. Um, and we very much look, look for um, partners uh, to do this because it really can't be done um, alone and with, by you know, one action or one agency. Um, let me know if I uh, missed anything. Oh, there was also a more recent um, an, um, project you may be um, interested in was the, in Puget Sound. There's a, um, a Jeopardy uh, biological opinion that occurred. Uh, for near water structure um, to sort of to help um, improve uh, local habitat. So that's also something that we were a part of that will be um, sort of part of the baseline of this of this action. Teresa, thanks so much for that broader broader view. Uh, Joe, does that uh, respond to your question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it does respond to the question. And we also note uh, that there were the uh, two comments that um, we would like uh, to address as we move forward. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Jeremy, uh, you know, and, and as Teresa just um, spoke to this, this uh, issue of prey bill and uh, the efforts that are being made through this um, forthcoming action and and um, um, in our analysis here I uh, I'm wondering if the any and, and Teresa made mention of the of the um, mitigation piece from the Pacific salmon treaty as it relates to increasing hatchery production. There's about 5.6 million that's been provided for that. Uh, we're, we're hoping that, that that will be repeated each and every year of the 10-year agreement. Um, but there was also an additional um, $13 million over the course of the next biennium in, this, in the Washington State budget that was provided for uh, increase hatchery production and when you look at those uh, both of those investments um, you know we're looking at something on the order of an additional four million fish uh, hatchery fish in Puget Sound there's about a little over three and a half million spring summer Chinook in the Columbia another two million tuis uh, a little under a million fall brights um, and I'm wondering if there's if there's any way or if um, NIMPS in any way uh, um, takes into consideration when they're looking at um, prey availability and the needs to make um, modifications in the way our fisheries are managed to respond to low abundance periods of that mitigation, those additional investments have been made in terms of trying to provide a greater prey base through the introduction of new uh, hatchery production. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
And is that directed at uh, myself or Teresa? Would you like to um, address that? I wasn't uh, trying to pick who any, either of you, whoever, either one that has thoughts about that question, welcome to respond. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Anderson. And so the hope would be that those mitigations, if if um, this underneath the preferred alternative, again, that um, I guess I'm speaking to a hypothetical here that the, a threshold approach would uh, speak to an abundance based management regime. And so the, the triggers would likely be less tripped in terms of uh, these types of mitigating factors contributing to higher abundances, um, as you described, uh, multiple stocks that would contribute towards north of Falcon, time step one, higher abundances, uh, which would there, uh, given that the Pacific Salmon Treaty mitigation funds have been consulted underneath um, a, a separate opinion, that those effects would be considered part of the baseline in this particular opinion. And so to um, address increased abundances, something that is now abundance-based would be helpful in, in trying to uh, ensure that those thresholds um, were at a level which you would have more fish off off the coast. Um, I'd offer the opportunity here if uh, my colleague would like to expand on anything that I may have missed. Teresa, do you have anything to add? Uh, you know, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Council. I think Jeremy um, said it nicely. Um, I, I don't have anything to add. Thanks. Thanks very much. Phil, does that answer your question? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, okay. Any further questions on the NIFS report? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, so I'm sure we'll come back, or I wouldn't be surprised if we came back to uh, Jeremy and Teresa uh, during our council discussion. But we have a few other things to do before then. Uh, we're gonna take a break now um, and then we'll uh, come to the gap report and then uh, public comment. So I've got the 953. Let's come back at uh, 1005 and we'll pick up with the gap report.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. It's uh, ten oh six, and um, if Sarah Nayani is available for the gap report, I would ask that uh, she go forward. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik, and good morning, Council Members. For the record, I'll be reading Agenda Item F2A, Supplemental Gap Report 1. The Gap has been tracking the Southern Resident Killer Whale consultation process for salmon fisheries and offers the following comments. The Gap appreciates the open and transparent process that NIMS and the Council have conducted through the Southern Resident Killer Whale work group and at Council meetings. The GAP encourages NIMS and the Council to continue this transparent process for future Southern Resident Killer Whale related actions and other ESA consultations. With respect to final action at this meeting, the GAP supports the SAS recommendation to adopt alternative 3.1.1 no action status quo fishery management plan implementation for the reasons outlined in their report as well as in our previous GAP report. That concludes the GAP report, and we would like to close by thanking the analysts and the work group for their hard work on this item over the past year and a half. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah, for your report, for your concise report. Are there any questions of Sarah on the GAP report? All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. This will now take us to public comment on this agenda item. Uh, as, as expected, there are a number of uh, public commenters here. Um, we will have uh, five minutes for individuals and 10 minutes for a group. Uh, I would ask, however, that if you, um, if your comment has previously been expressed, uh, you can simply indicate your agreement with that prior commenter rather than um, repeating the same public comment. So we would ask uh, that commenters do that to the extent that uh, a prior speaker has expressed their views. So we have 16 uh, public comments and I'm gonna call them in the order they are on the sign up page. First call on Brooke Dixon. And I would ask also, if your name appears on the list, if you've submitted a card, please raise your hand. It'll make it much easier for us to enable your microphone. So Brooke Dixon. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the council, good morning. My name good, is- Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Brooke Dixon. I am a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I would like to start by thanking you for your special consideration of the Southern Resident Killer Whales. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the action the Council is already taking uh, toward the preservation of this population. I recognize that a no action alternative does not exactly equate to no action done. However, I would urge that you consider taking additional steps to lead by example because this population is facing extinction and action does need to be taken to prevent that from happening. Um, almost exactly one year ago today, I had the pleasure of seeing J-Pod off Vancouver Island. Slick uh, is the matriarch of that pod. She popped up so close to our boat, I could smell her breath. At 48 years old, she has had an impressive six live births, of which only three remain alive today. One of her calves, Scarlet, was the target of a rescue mission in 2018 after she was observed to be severely emaciated. Sadly, these efforts proved ultimately futile. Uh, Slick's only grandson, Sonic, has also died, presumably of malnutrition. The reality is that we don't know what killed Sonic or Scarlet. Substantial additional research needs to be completed on other risk factors, mainly contaminants and noise pollution. Low Chinook abundance is the most tangible and researched answer that we have, but it is certainly not the only answer. Additionally, the risk assessment demonstrates that council area fisheries have a relatively small impact on the abundance of salmon in areas frequented by these individuals at this time. So regardless of the final action selected, whether it is no action or 3.1.2D, it will not sufficiently change the trajectory these orcas are on. It may, however, set a precedent for fisheries that do have a more statistically significant impact on prey abundance for these whales. 
and it would demonstrate your willingness to do your part, however statistically small that part may seem. It would not be difficult to use the data to absolve the Council of Responsibility to act on this matter, but with the lack of data we have on other risk factors, it stands to reason that it will be equally easy for other parties to absolve themselves of responsibility as well. And this population does not have time on their side. So I encourage you to consider leading by example today by taking additional action to preserve this population with the hope that we can ask that others follow suit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke. Are there any questions of Brooke Dixon on her public comment? Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Eva Ramey. And again, I ask if you've filled out a public comment card, please uh, use the raise hand feature if you're connected to um, Ring Central so that we can identify, we can, we can see you um, on the list. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Can you hear me all right? Absolutely, go ahead. Awesome. My name is Eva Ramey, and I'm a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I study marine biodiversity and conservation. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment on the range of alternatives and recommendations for the salmon fishery management plan impacts to southern resident killer whales this morning. I'd like to make three points. Firstly, I would like to start by suggesting another possible alternative for the council to consider. I suggest that instead of using the status of the Chinook salmon stocks to establish a baseline under which additional fisheries management measures would be triggered, I would encourage the council to consider the need for additional fisheries management measures based on the status of the southern resident killer whale population with regards to their overall body condition within a given year. This type of metric could be gathered using aerial photogrammetry data as outlined in the paper by Fernbank et al. 2018 titled Using Aerial Photogrammetry to Detect Changes in Body Condition of Endangered Southern Resident Killer Whales. So put simply, I'm suggesting that if the southern resident killer whales are below a set threshold of poor body condition, then set management guidelines to leave more salmon available for them. Secondly, I would like to address the importance of Chinook salmon to southern resident killer whales. And I think it is important to note that we are aware that there are currently multiple factors playing a role in their endangered status. And while lack of Chinook salmon is shown to be a factor, there is scientific debate among experts in the field as to which factors play the largest roles in their decline. And as the Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group points out, it is likely that the importance of Chinook salmon varies over time as these other less understood threats increase or decrease. And additionally, the science review panel for the Southern Resident Killer Whale suggested that, quote, caution is warranted in interpreting the correlative results as confirming a linear causal relationship between Chinook salmon abundance and southern resident killer whale vital rates. So while I'm sure that there may be some that suggest that action is still warranted despite this uncertainty, I would urge the council to please remember the purpose of such independent science reviews. And the purpose of the science should not be to try to prove that there is a causal relationship between Chinook salmon and southern resident killer whales, but rather to provide the best information possible and well-reasoned alternatives from which management decisions can be made. So if there is a clear causal relationship, then certainly let's act. And if not, then let's please focus on identifying the root causes first and then act on those. So with this in mind, I'd like the council to please consider justifying the need for additional fisheries management measures by tying it to a quantitative metric of overall body condition of the population of Southern resident killer whales and this strategy would also be entirely consistent with adaptive management guidelines with regards to the agencies administering the Endangered Species Act and the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And thirdly, I would also like to reinforce the importance of Recommendation 3.3 listed in the November 2020 Workgroup Report to improve the stock assessment analytic methods and develop an age-structured stock assessment for the SRFC stock using cohort reconstruction methods. Again, thank you for the opportunity to provide comment today. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramey. Are there any questions? Thank you once again. Uh, Dr. Deborah Giles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to comment today on this important matter. 
My name is Deborah Giles and I'm a killer whale biologist and science and research director at Wild Orca. I've been studying the southern resident killer whale since they were listed as endangered in 2005. Their population has since fallen precipitously from 88 to 74 individuals, with losses of prime age animals, including a number of breeding age males and females from all three pods, and other females who are losing their calves before or shortly after birth. I've been working with the University of Washington's Orca Scout program for over 11 years, an analysis of the samples we've collected from these whales show that 69% of detected pregnancies fail and that low availability of Chinook salmon appears to be a significant cause of these pregnancy failures. Our results point to the need for abundant Chinook salmon for the recovery of the southern resident killer whales. An insufficient supply of large, lipid-rich Pacific salmon, particularly Chinook, is the primary driver behind a number of these health issues and makes them more susceptible to other external factors such as pollution, noise, and disturbance from vessels. Put simply, without an adequate food supply, this population cannot survive. It is within this council's power today to make a decision that could change the fate of these endangered species over of this endangered species over the next decade. These whales, the original harvesters of sam of Chinook salmon, deserve a seat at the table and be allocated a portion of the fishery Chinook fishery. However, we recognize that such a proposition is not on the table here, nor is a moratorium. So in the spirit of compromise, we ask the Council and National Marine Fisheries Service to conclude that meaningful action is urgently warranted under the Endangered Species Act to prevent further jeopardy to this population and to select the most suitable threshold below which additional management measures must be taken to provide more Chinook for these whales. We have concerns that Alternative D is based on years when the whales were in decline but it is the only alternative from the work group we can support and only with the proviso that when the pre-season forecast falls at or below this threshold, the proposed critical habitat areas off Northern Oregon and Washington State are closed to non-treaty fishing, together with a postponed start to the commercial and recreational fishing season. Anything less would simply not constitute meaningful action as all the measures proposed by the work group are indistinguishable from the status quo. These National Marine Fisheries identified orca foraging hotspots on the outer coast are more critical now than ever, with these whales spending less time in the inland waters than ever in their chronicled history. If you do not seek to impose additional measures in these coastal waters today, then this unique community of whales is doomed to functional extinction with a population too fragile and too small to ever recover. We thank the council and work group for the work that you've put in over the last 18 months and for considering ways in which ocean Chinook fishing pressures contribute to the whale's decline. We look forward to this group's decision making a meaningful contribution to the health of the southern resident killer whales as recovery of such a top predator as these whales would be a benefit to all who depend on wild Pacific salmon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Giles. Are there questions of Dr. Giles? Thank you very much. Uh, Werner Wilson, followed by Thomas Ressa. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Werner Wilson, member of the Tulligan tribe in Bristol Bay, Alaska. It is famous for our Nushigak River Chinook runs that often offers the largest runs in the world of Chinook. I'm a salmon fisher and senior oceans campaigner for Friends of the Earth US, or FO. Friends of the Earth is an organization of over 2 million members and activists across all 50 states <clears throat> working to protect the environment and create a healthy and just world. But we care a lot about the reputation of the SRKW as well as the reputation of salmon fishermen across the West Coast. <clears throat> Thank you for the Council and the Ad Hoc Work Group for all of your diligent work on this very important issue. As with many Council processes, let me tell you that it's been a long time coming. In addition to the letter that I would first like to highlight, Friends of the Earth U.S. Members and Activists petition that got over 29,000 signatories from across the nation, urging the Council to take more proper action on this agenda item. 
Many of these members, I'm sure, eat West Coast salmon and would surely not want to adversely impact the food for SRKW. Our petition partly states that we believe the council can take even stronger action to adopt a proper alternative or set of alternatives. This can include a threshold or floor for low tunic salmon abundance that automatically triggers a pre-identified response. That said, along with the alternatives for immediate action, the council must commit to improving measures to monitor and manage salmon stocks for the benefit of Southern residents. Current data collection and analysis fail to ensure the fishery impacts do not jeopardize SRKW. In addition, we support four measures being adopted by the council. First, SRKW need immediate fishing mitigation measures to increase salmon prey. Second, the highest salmon abundance threshold could minimally protect Southern residents while the work group continues to improve its impacts analyses. Three, management measures must be triggered automatically. And four, the council and NIMS must improve monitoring and management of salmon stocks to benefit SRKW, not just once every 10 years or so. So uh, that was uh, from you know the, the letter from the conservation groups that you could find in your briefing packet. And the petition continues to state that now only 74 res Southern residents remain in the wild, as you know. Um, this is one of their lowest numbers in decades. And these goals by no are not being met and um, neither are the recovery goals of threatened Chinook prey. As you might know, there were no successful SR KW births from 2016-18. And we do support tribal treaty laws and recognize that these management measures will be subject to sovereign nation consultation and potentially modified letter to the needs of the tribes. To ensure protections for SRKW, thresholds should tr trigger automatic management actions. You can find the rest of the petition um, in your briefing book. Um, I think there's some good recommendations in there. Uh, beyond the petition, um, we are disappointed that the ad hoc working group didn't heed many of our conservation group's recommendations to forward to your council. The Pacific Council needs to more seriously analyze how the North Pacific Council, for example, and state of Alaska manages Chinook salmon fisheries off the coast of Western Alaska that allows the state to further understand specific watersheds where Chinook are going, unlike in the ocean troll fisheries in the lower 48 states. Overall, when I did a preliminary analysis of all salmon taken based on North Pacific and Pacific Fishery Management Council managed fisheries on both directed salmon catch and both commercial and sports fishing from the Gulf of Alaska to California, as well as bycatch and large salmon bycot fisheries, I believe I saw anywhere between at least 200,000 to 300,000 salmon. Chinook salmon are potentially being taken in these fisheries that would otherwise head to West Coast rivers important to SRKW in 2020 alone. And of course, not all of these fish would be, um, uh, as you know, returning to the rivers themselves. We all know that what happens out in the ocean, we're not, we're not understanding, completely understanding of that, but I think that's a figure. Um, and so I question, would consumers want to see that when these endangered SRKW are dying? This is with bycott salmon in the Gulf of Alaska, having in some ground fish trawl fisheries, accounting for upwards of 81% of salmon, Chinook salmon that would otherwise be heading toward non-Alaska West Coast rivers, important to SRKW, according to genetic testing by NOAA. I also want to point out that this past year, Chinook salmon populations off the coast of Alaska and in our rivers had dire run returns, very low, historically, despite our state not nearly having the problems with pollution, habitat destruction, or overfishing like in the West Coast. That's why it's important we take this precaut uh, precautionary approach on the lower 48 states fisheries, on Chinook especially, and that's why the no action alternative is unacceptable. We need to continue this work because we don't understand what's going on off you know, with their fisheries in Alaska, even though it's seen as one of the best managed fisheries in the world. 
So we encourage NIMPS uh, during the buyout process um, and the ESA to consider all of these relevant facts moving forward during this process. Otherwise, we believe it will not satisfy all the demands set forward by the outstanding lawsuit filed, I think it was uh, two years ago. So we believe we will continue to be, we need to continue to be working on this issue sporadically as needed in order to put quality control on these management measures that you will adopt today and take a proactive precautionary approach to help save orcas like Tahlequah's newborn calf that was just born this year. Thank you very much for consideration of these comments and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, Thomas Ressa followed by Sophia Ressler. Thomas Ressa. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you now, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the council for having me. My name is Thomas Ressa. I'm a graduate student at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography here in San Diego, California. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Southern Resident Killer Whales and hope the council founds my, finds my comment valuable in their decision-making process. Um, I support alternative 312D to take the most aggressive form of protection for the Chinook salmon and in turn the SRKW population that's directly affected by available prey numbers. I echo many of the sentiments of my peers and those that are speaking on behalf of the SRKW but want to focus on the concept of balance. A well-managed fishery will not only consider the anglers that have been on these waters for decades, but also the ecosystem that supports their livelihood. For years, anthropocentric impact has led to dwindling numbers of fish stock as well as top predator decline. This imbalance likely has unforeseen impacts on the ecosystem that we're only beginning to understand. We must consider this unknown, as well as continue to strengthen our management practices and rely on scientific data that shows a direct correlation between the decline in salmon numbers and the health of our top predators. In doing so, we will also be securing a future for generations of anglers in the bountiful waters of the Pacific Northwest. I'd like to use an example to drive home my point. <clears throat> Recently, a documentary titled Echoes in the Arctic highlighted the balance of the incredibly well-managed herring fishery in the fjords of Northern Norway and the killer whale population that's found there. Marine biologist and author Hans Strager stated, quote, this is home to likely the strongest and healthiest killer whale population in the world. This fishery is nicknamed the breadbasket of Norway because of its abundance, and the government in Norway has set an example for how to protect its precious resource. A recent victory blocked all oil and gas exploration in the Lofoten fjords for the foreseeable future, citing not only the threat to the orca population, but the herring fishery that has fed its country for centuries. Norway's government made this decision even with the opportunity for significant gains from the oil industry. When speaking on success of the herring fishery, National Geographic photographer and filmmaker Paul Nicklin stated, quote, this should not be an anomaly, it should be the norm. These ecosystems want to thrive. We just have to quit putting so much pressure on them. My hope is that this council will see an opportunity to not only protect the keystone species and Chinook salmon, but help balance an ecosystem that's seen a steady decline over the last decade. I understand anglers may see this as a strong sacrifice in the short term, but hope, hope the long-term impact or outlook, excuse me, will help instill a confidence in our leadership and ultimately support a healthy fishery for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ressler. Are there any questions from the council? All right, next we'll hear from Sophia Ressler. Please go ahead when you're ready. Good morning, can everybody hear me? Yes, please go ahead, we can hear you fine. Thank you, my name is Sophia Ressler and I'm a staff attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm delivering these comments today on behalf of our 1.7 million members and supporters and I would like to reiterate some of the items we highlighted in our written comments that were submitted along with other organizations to the council on November 6th. The center believes that the current suite of management alternatives being considered have some deficiencies that should be taken into account. And I'd like to touch on those before the council makes the final decision. 
I appreciate those who have already commented and the center is, is in agreement with many of the comments that have already been given. I will try to be succinct so as not to be too repetitive. Firstly, the council should adopt an alternative that sets a Chinook salmon abundance threshold. And when it is predicted that tr threshold will be met, that should trigger certain pre-identified responses. Of the current alternatives, the one that most closely exemplifies what I'm referencing is alternative 3.1.2D, but that alternative still must be strengthened in several respects. First, the abundance threshold should be more protective. And when thresholds are predict predicted to be met, that should automatically trigger closure of non-tribal fisheries and proposed critical habitat. Further, a vessel monitoring system should be required on commercial salmon fishing vessels as part of this alternative. This will allow data collection to better understand the overlap of commercial fisheries and southern resident foraging areas. The council should consider an alternative of closure for all non-tribal Pacific salmon fisheries. This is not necessarily meant to be an alternative that would be adopted on the ground, but would instead provide us with, a, with baseline information in which to compare other alternatives to. Next, NIMS should do further work to establish better monitoring and management of the salmon stocks to benefit the southern residents. This could include many things, which we have included in greater detail in our written comments, but for example, collection of stock-specific harvest information and disclosing incidental salmon mortality in other fisheries would allow the council to revisit management measures based on new information. We want to make sure that the council understands that selecting to continue with the status quo would be detrimental for the southern residents who are on the brink of extinction and need every possible chance to properly forage for their dwindling food supply. These necessary amendments to the Pacific Salmon Fisheries Management Plan will further trigger the preparation of a full environmental impact statement under the National Environmental Policy Act, and we think that's important to remember when making these decisions. Thank you for your time and your hard work on this issue and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, Ms. Ressler. Are there any questions of Ms. Ressler from around the table? I see one hand. Uh, Danny Evanson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Ressler, for that testimony. Um, heard a similar comment from both you and Mr. Wilson. I was struggling a little bit with my technology to get my hand up in time. But both of you requested that NIMS and the council should collect more and better stock specific harvest information on salmon fisheries. And I'm trying to understand where there is a deficiency in the stock specific harvest information that you're speaking of, because most of the fisheries on the seaboard are sampled at an incredibly high rate. So um, I'm wondering if you could be a little more specific on what type of data you're looking for that isn't already um, being collected. Thank you. Thanks for your question. And unfortunately, I think that I would have to get back to you. I haven't been leading on this process and maybe Mr. Wilson has a, um, has a, a better response for you, but I would have to double check with our staff scientists before um, providing that information. I wouldn't want to misstate anything. It's likely that there is also more information related to that topic in the comment letter that we submitted um, along with um, several other conservation groups. And I apologize thoroughly for not having an answer for you. Um, but I'm happy to happy to email out information once I confirm with um, those who have been uh, leading in my organization on this project. Thank you, Ms. Ressler. Any further questions? All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Ressler. Uh, next, uh, Alejandro Cano. Hello, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Good morning. We can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, thank you very much for opening this action to public comments. Uh, my name is Alejandro Cano. I'm a graduate student at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, I would like to also to thank you, the work group, for the report that is very thorough and complete, I think. Um, 
I'd like to echo some of the things that have been said today regarding the fact that um, stricter alternatives would have a hard impact on fisheries without really mitigating the decline of southern resident killer whale. I think that um, I think that is the general idea that I would like to bring here today. And regarding the whales, um, we are taking a, the straightforward action, which is fishery management, that doesn't fully address the problem. The Chinook salmon fishery is a well-established and regulated fishery. As the work as the work, work, work the work group report states, there is not enough scientific evidence that ensures that a reduction or closure of the fishery is going to have a direct impact on the whales. We know acoustic pollution, ocean pollution, as, and acidification are most probably the main drivers for whale population decline. We know orcas are particularly sensitive to PCB contamination. It builds up in their bodies. It contaminates the milk, disrupts fetal development. Of course, these issues are broader and more difficult to address. I would like to echo and support Teresa's comments regarding this, and I wanted to raise that concern today. If we want to minimize human impact to the southern resident killer whales, we will need to fully address the problem. It is really complicated at this stage to predict whale population trends based on one factor alone. Any unforeseen outcomes of the instant action based on instant gratifications can be more harmful than beneficial. After all, there is uh, people like fishermen livelihoods that depend on this fishery. I think it is the diversionary from the real issue to focus all the efforts in fishery management when scientific evidence is unable to really state a direct uh, impact on uh, killer whales derived from fishing activities. Um, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's the main um, concern that I wanted to raise here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kano. Are there questions from the council? Thank you again for your public comment. Next, we'll hear from Glenn Spain, followed by Janet Alderton. Mr. Spain. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Great. Um, in the interest of brevity, I sent in a summary of our testimony uh, this morning for uh, Chuck Tracy. I'd like to have that in the record. Um, I just want to note a few high points, and that is that the council has been working for many years as has a fishing industry to minify, minimize harvest impacts on the orcas. Uh, the abundances are up. The utilization rates are way down, as indicated in the NIMS report as well as in the uh, risk assessment. Harvest now takes only between 1.2% to 7.7% of the available Chinook in the ocean abundance, according to the risk assessment. The uh, highest rates of, of harvest are actually in California in areas that are designed and seasons that are designed to avoid orcas in areas that orcas much more rarely occur, as opposed to Puget Sound or Salish Sea areas. In other words, the science shows quite clearly that the impact of harvest is quite small and is decreasing over time. So I think we should acknowledge that the council process and the industry has already done a great deal and is continuing in an abundance of, an abundance of caution uh, along this process to minimize harvest impacts on uh, orca populations. The total Chinook prey abundance in the ocean is normally at least three times the amount required to meet all orca food needs at terminal areas, according to the risk assessment. The estimate was a 1.1 million adults, harvestable adults, at terminal sites in which the orcas feed uh, in uh, normal conditions, and that was considered to be quite a, an underestimate for a variety of reasons in the risk assessment. So. In the end, uh, we are trying to address a problem that is not a, a major problem. It's by no means a major driver of um, orca declines. There's also, according to the risk assessment, very little correlation between harvest and uh, orca uh, demographics. Uh, 
Only one out of 126 different regressions tested to find that correlation would uh, pass under the 5% um, significance rule. And of all of them, only 100, uh, only six uh, uh, were considered significant in statistical terms. Uh, that's 120 of 126 runs either found no correlation whatsoever or negative correlations. A clear indication that we are dealing with mostly statistical noise. Uh, the only exceptions to that were in the areas that are known high use areas in the Puget Sound and the Salish Seas. There is uh, every reason to look at those more closely, and there may be some uh, good scientific rationale to tighten the restrictions in those areas, but not elsewhere. I want to note that the uh, the, the, the uh, major finding of the risk assessment is that this is not a uh, linear relationship. There's a threshold relationship here. However, unfortunately, there's nothing in the science that clearly indicates what the appropriate ocean abundance threshold should be. In fact, the Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee noted in its uh, November, 19, uh, November 2019 supplemental report to the Council on this issue, quote, the SSC did not find the available information sufficient to quantitatively justify a threshold at which risk may be greater for SRKWs due to the effects of PFMC salmon fisheries, unquote. So given the enormous economic harm that could occur from the use of triggering uh, Chinook ocean abundance thresholds that are too high and have no scientific justification, we agree with the comments and recommendations of the Salmon Advisory Subpanel as previously presented and in their supplemental report uh, to the, this meeting. Uh, Again, that's an abundance of caution. We're doing our best, and we're doing what we can, but we are not, as the salmon harvesters, the main driver of the, the problems that the orcas have. I want to put this in a bigger picture, and that is the main driver is too few Chinook coming out of our river systems and our inland waterways. There are too many blockages, including dams, culvert issues that really need to be addressed, and we're way behind in Washington State on dealing with those, and a multitude of, uh, of impacts on salmon generally that have reduced their population by almost an order of magnitude uh, over the past several decades. The loss of inland spawning rearing habitat is by far the leading driver of lower ocean salmon abundance problems that we see today. And this is unfortunately not under control. It's still a pro progressive loss of habitat and a progressive strain, as we see by a number of ESA listings, on the productivity of our rivers and thus on not only orcas, but uh, on commercial fishery, um, uh, fishing communities as well. This is the problem that must be solved in the long run. What we're talking about here is, at most, highly precautionary, minimal impact uh, uh, changes that will not really solve the problem in the long run unless these long-term pressures that are driving salmon to extinction all across the landscape are addressed. This is where we uh, and the SAMA and, and the uh, ORCA um, uh, advocates need to uh, work together to deal with these inland habitat problems. And I'll leave it at there, and thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Spain. Are there any questions on this public comment? I'm not seeing any hands. Thanks again, Mr. Spain. And I would ask if, if my uh, summary of my testimony with all the appropriate footnotes would be uh, included in the record. Uh, anything that you submitted in writing in a timely manner was included, and since you spoke, I think uh, anything you provided in a timely manner uh, would also be included in the record. Good, thank you. Uh, Janet Alderton, uh, followed by Owen Begley Collier.
stand by a second here, Janet. We need to unmute you. Myself. Oh, there you go, Janet, you're, you're live now, so please go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. My name is Janet Alderton, and I have lived in the San Juan Islands since 2005. I am the current board president of the Friends of the San Juans. Our members care deeply about marine ecosystems and the southern resident killer whales. The geographical region that encompasses Chinook salmon habitat in the Northern Pacific Ocean is enormous. Chinook salmon that spawn in the rivers and streams of the Pacific Northwest spend important parts of their life cycle in the open ocean where the council managed fisheries operate. Unfortunately, I regularly find that there is a misconception that the salmon harvest from the open oceans does not impact the rates of return to their natal habitats but the data show otherwise, as is the health of the southern resident killer whales. Insufficient food is preventing the southern residents from raising healthy cows to grow the population. The best available science shows that lack of salmon is the biggest threat to these orcas. Immediate action is required to save them from extinction as ocean fisheries remove Chinook salmon vital to their survival of this endangered population. It is not just the absolute abundance of Chinook that is critical to the survival of the whales. Size matters. Southern resident killer whales need large Chinook salmon to thrive and grow their population. Increases in hatchery fish numbers will not address this issue in the short term. Commercial harvest preferentially removes these larger Chinook. I ask the council to please select alternative 3.1.2D as the threshold for taking action. And also please close two identified orca feeding hotspots of Northern, of Northern Oregon and Washington. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, Ms. Alterton. Are there questions? Ms. Alderton on her, I'm not seeing any. Thanks very much. Uh, Owen Beckley Collier followed by Joel Kawahara. Owen, I uh, see you're there, but do you have Mr. Chairman, I, uh, he's there, but he's uh, in, not in a mode where he's able to talk. So I would suggest we move ahead and then we'll circle back around to see if we can pick him up uh, at the end. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Mr. Tracy. All right, so we'll hear from Joel Kawahara, followed by Ben and Uh Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead, Joel. Uh, Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Joel Kawahara. I'm a salmon troller from Quilson, Washington, and I want to thank the council uh, for this opportunity to address you. Uh, first of all, let me... Hey, Joel, your, your audio is fading. Could you get back to where you were when you first started in terms of volume? Um, yeah, I'm hunched over the phone as closely as I can get now. Marcus is okay, Mr. Chairman. Is, is this okay, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, just do your best. Uh, I want to make sure we hear everything. Yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to address the testimony of the Coastal Trollers Association. First of all, regarding the uh, low abundance threshold for uh, triggering actions on the fishery, uh, we would like to amend that to... Uh, adopting a single year for the threshold rather than a geometric mean uh, for reasons that the SAS report explained. And secondly, we would like to ad adopt the position of the SAS report for the uh, value of the threshold, the 957,300, whatever, uh, for time step one 
abundance. Uh, again, for the reasons that the SAS uh, made clear, and uh, the reasons for these changes are that in discussions at the SAS, it became apparent they were uh, uh, actually both better for the Southern resident killer whale and for uh, the fisheries groups. Uh, number two, I would like to address uh, option 3.1.4, which would be the uh, uh, stacking of penalties using Mr. Smith's hockey analogy. Uh, we are definitely not in favor of multiple actions. Uh, for reasons I'll go into a little bit later, but that's a no. Number three, I would like to expand on the Cape Flattery Control Zone issue. Uh, Mr. Addix gave a pretty good explanation, as did Mr. Ryan earlier. Um, continuing on that, if we look at what Canada has done for the Swisher Banks, which is the northern half of the mouth of the Straits of Juan de Fuca. They have put significant restrictions on fisheries and ship traffic in that area in an effort to promote the conservation of southern resident killer whales. The uh, Pacific Fisheries Management Council and the uh, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary are decades ahead of Canada in their conservation efforts here. Uh, as Mr. Addicts pointed out, for 20 years, the Cape Flattery Control Zone has been closed to non-treaty troll fisheries, which includes not just the Swiftshire Bank area, but also a portion of uh, critical area habitat number one down to uh, 4810 North. Secondly, the National Marine, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary has established what they call an area to be avoided. Uh, <clears throat> which keeps large ocean ships greater than um, 1,600 gross tons seaward of the coast uh, and seaward of most of uh, critical area habitat number two from uh, 48 degrees north to the Canadian border. So uh, it, that addresses both the noise issue and the fisheries issue in this area. That leads me to say that for the area north of Falcon, significant actions have already been undertaken, granted in the small part of the uh, north of Falcon fisheries area, but in a very vital and important part of the uh, critical habitat for southern resident killer whales, as pretty much all the studies have shown. Uh, therefore, I don't think multiple actions are necessary when the fishery, excuse me, when the abundance is below whatever threshold is adopted for a time step one trigger. Uh, number four, this is important. It is important to me to point out that when there are restrictions on the ocean fishery, there can be uh, fish left on the table, if you will, that sometimes get um, absorbed in other fisheries, either in the Salish Sea or in the Columbia River. I understand, uh, see, I want to make clear, this does not pertain to treaty fisheries. But for non-treaty fisheries, I think it would be um, ethically, ethically um, important that non-treaty fisheries do not absorb the, uh, do not absorb the uncaught fish from the non-treaty fisheries in the ocean as they pass towards the spawning grounds. And I submit to both National Marine Fisheries Service and to Washington and Oregon Departments of Fish and Wildlife that those fish should be shepherded at least to escapement or uh, uh, to escapement rather than absorbed in any fisheries downstream of or post uh, ocean fisheries. Finally, recommendations for further research. It occurs to me that multiple people are talking about the number of Chinook being consumed by southern resident killer whales, but not the quality of the Chinook, although some people are talking about fat four or five-year-old fish. Uh, some of the indicators for 
quality of uh, Chinook can come from both the coho populations and the uh, marine su survival indices for uh, Chinook. And it would be interesting in the future to do studies correlating those, um, those metrics to southern resident killer whale uh, health metrics. In, uh, importantly, marine survival index tells you how much food the uh, Chinook are getting, and that kind of correlates into how lipid rich individual Chinook are. Um, which, which is what people are pointing out that uh, southern resident killer whales need. And finally, of course, one catfish and not mention sea lions. The population of sea lions famously has gone up enormously. And for, I guess, my peers, I would like that to be addressed or considered in future actions. That concludes my testimony. I'd be glad to try to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kalahar. Are there any questions from the council? I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, next, uh, Ben Enticknap, who I believe has a presentation. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, Thank you, council members. Good morning. I appreciate this opportunity to provide public comment. Uh, my name is Ben Enticknap, and I'm representing Oceana. Uh, so some of these comments will be similar to uh, my presentation in September. Not a lot has changed, so uh, just please be patient with me. I think it's important to uh, make these points as you consider final action here for the ocean salmon fisheries and southern resident killer whales. We do have a, a comment letter in the briefing book, as well as a uh, letter signed by over 13,500 supporters from a, across the United States that uh, support what we're asking you to do here today. Next slide, please. So as you know, Southern resident killer whales um, are endangered. Their population has declined significantly, almost 25% since 1995, or about 1% per year. Dr. Robert Lacey, who published a study uh, of a population viability assessment in 2017, up recently updated that, and this is now in your public comment as a, uh, an attachment to the Wild Fish Conservancy uh, comment uh, letter. So you have this uh, full statement from Dr. Lacey. And he's now estimating a 59% probability that the population will become functionally extinct uh, within 100 years under current conditions. And that includes, those current conditions include current average levels of Chinook uh, being the primary um, limiting factor to orca recovery. Next slide. And we know that there's a, a strong body of science out there linking uh, the health of killer whales to the abundance of Chinook salmon. This is just one paper here that I'm referencing. And uh, your working group had also found a statistically significant relationship between SRKW survival and abundance north of Falcon. Next slide. And Dr. Giles referenced this study here, finding that up to 69% of all detectable pregnancies between 2008 and 2014 of southern resident killer whales were unsuccessful, and that the low availability of Chinook appears to be the important uh, stressor. Uh, these animals become become very stressed. Um, you know, they're both practically starving to death, and it results in increased uh, rates of miscarriages. Next slide. But we also know what the solution is. The solution is we need to have more Chinook in the water, uh, we need to recover Chinook populations. Uh, you know, it, it is not uncertain what the benefits are of more Chinook. And this is also in the attachment from Dr. Lacey that a 35% increase in Chinook is what is needed to begin to uh, achieve Southern resident killer whale recovery goals of a 2.3% population growth, growth rate. The orcas need more Chinook and, and they, they need it now. Next slide. Which brings us here today to the action before you, because we do know that the ocean Chinook 
fisheries operating off the West Coast are um, harvesting many of the same fish that are the prey for the southern southern resident killer whales. And as uh, Barry Tom pointed out in a letter to you, that any activities that affect the abundance of Chinook salmon available to the killer whales have the potential to impact their survival and population growth of these whales, and that includes fisheries. Uh, it, we recognize that fisheries are not the um, only stressor uh, and impact on uh, Chinook abundance, but is one of them, and it's the one that you're responsible for managing. And so we're asking you to take uh, responsibility under your jurisdiction to make sure that there's enough Chinook for the orcas. Next slide. So to our recommendations, uh, we recommend uh, the adoption of the threshold of 3.1.2D, or about 1.1 million Chinook. And this is uh, based on the highest ab abundance in the 1990s, uh, which was an overall time that was very poor for Chinook salmon abundance, uh, as well as um, it was a very poor time for southern resident killer whales. Uh, and we think that this is the, the, the best alternative that you have before you. The 966 is there in the yellow dotted line. That's uh, the current NIMS guidance for the mean of the seven years. I think the only other alternative we could possibly consider here would be the max of the lowest seven years, which would be just over a, a million Chinook. And if those, you know, that mean of, uh, of those seven years were, were poor for uh, killer whales, which they were, then we should be taking the max and, and not, the, not the average of those levels. Next slide. Uh, to our uh, recommendation of what happens once that threshold is reached, we support closing the proposed critical habitat areas one and two north of Cape Mears, shown here in this map, uh, to directed Chinook fishing. And I just want to be clear that um, under this alternative, you could st one could still catch Chinook west of these areas or south of these areas or in, uh, in the river systems and the estuaries uh, or uh, target coho. Um, as long as that there's an overall, um, the, the Chinook mortality bycatch is monitored. So we think this is the most biologically based approach that's the, uh, that would be significant for southern resident orcas. Next slide. And that's based uh, on um, observations, uh, acoustic monitoring, and tagging data showing that this area is a high-use foraging area for southern resident killer whales. All three pods, JKL pods, are found in this area, and they're found in this area year-round. It's not only in the spring that they're uh, that they're using this area. They've been um, observed out here um, all year round. And what they're doing when they're out here is they're foraging for Chinook uh, that are bound for West Coast uh, river systems, including the Columbia and as far south as the Central Valley. Uh, next slide. Now, we do have some real concerns of some of the other alternatives that are before you. Uh, we really feel that they do not go far enough. And to illustrate that, I've uh, made this map here for you to consider of option 3A, which would be the Columbia River control zone plus the expansion there, uh, the expansion shown in green, and option 3B, the Grays Harbor control zone. These two areas com uh, combined make a about 0.3% of the proposed critical habitat north of Cape Mears. These are very small actions, and some of these other ones, like you know, delaying the start date of the fishery by by a month, you know, we we see these as just really small steps. When in fact, what we need are some really you know big, important actions to to help recover orcas. Next slide. We do support option 1A, which would limit the Chinook quotas north of Cape Falcon uh, in the, the non-treaty fishery, uh, not to exceed the regression analysis estimate. And so what I've shown here is I've added this red line, which would be the threshold that we're recommending, 3.1.2D. So when abundance is to the left of that, uh, the, the non-treaty quota would be limited to uh, at or below that um, black line represented in the regression analysis. Next slide. And finally, uh, I see it's another recommendation three. This should be recommendation four is to uh, re require VMS or AI AIS or even solar data loggers on all commercial ocean salmon fishing vessels and collect refined spatial data on the uh, ocean salmon wreck fisheries. 
uh, you know, we've noticed in this process, we've had more information on where the orcas are than where the fishery is. Um, the map here I have uh, is the only thing I could find on the location, the more refined locations of, of the fisheries from a, a, a West Coast uh, genetic stock identification project from 2010. Uh, but it makes it awfully hard to talk about time and area closures or delayed fishing starts or, uh, you, you know, when we don't actually know where the fishery is operating. And we think that this would be a, a reasonable measure that NIMS could implement to uh, help better elucidate the overlap between uh, the, the fishery and uh, critical habitat and foraging areas for the orcas. Uh, that concludes our recommendations. We urge you to take bold action here. Time is running out uh, for these orcas, and it, it's just so important that you're building in precautionary measures. And I'm and I'm sorry. I did have one more thing I wanted to say is is that we also recognize that that Cape Flattery area is significant, and uh, that should be um, included in the fishery management plan as an orca and a salmon conservation measure. Uh, going forward, uh, as it is, it's it's very hard to even know that that exists, um, uh, and that should be highlighted and uh, made a, a long-term measure for orcas and salmon. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Antignat, for your presentation. Are there any questions? Thanks again, Ben. I will next hear from Elise Hansen, followed by Cindy Hansen. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, good morning. Uh, a little more volume would be great, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your time for hearing these comments. My name is Elise Hansen, and I'm a student studying public policy with a focus on environmental and natural resource policy. And I urge you to choose alternative 3.1.2.D, of Chinook abundance thresholds. I'll keep my comments short as much of uh, what I've wanted to say has already been stated. Um, I would just like to add that the plight of the southern resident orca is like a canary in the coal mine. Their decline is problematic on its own, but is also indicative of larger problems in their ecosystem. There are many threats facing these orca, and while increasing Chinook salmon prey availability alone will not be a panacea for the orca, a higher threshold can act as an important buffer for both orca and salmon in the event of stochastic events like the blob or other poor ocean conditions. The emphasis on uncertainty in the reports should, in my mind, trigger a more conservative salmon management strategy, erring on the side of caution rather than justifying business as usual. I urge the Council to consider how to best manage Chinook salmon throughout their whole ecosystem to be resilient in the face of future poor ocean conditions and to ultimately avoid an alternate stable state ecosystem bereft of salmon eating orca. Thank you so much for your time. Cindy Hansen, followed by Terry Wright. Cindy, I'm trying to unmute you, but I'm not successful. Can we get some technical help in unmuting Cindy? There, there you. Um, let's work on that. In the meantime, uh, Terry Wright, uh, I don't see that you have audio enabled. And I see Ryan Johnson's hand is up. I also don't see audio enabled there. Um, there, Ryan, what, Ryan, why don't you go ahead and we'll come back to these other uh, co public commenters once we get their uh, uh, audio enabled. Go ahead, Ryan. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Ryan Johnson. I'm the Vice President of the Washington Trollers Association. 
The Washington Trollers Association supports the SAS statement, and I might just add a few um, high points from the report. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Washington Trollers Association feels that continued weak stock management through FMP, PST, ESA is the best path forward, as this method leaves nearly 1.1 million adults unharvested and returning to terminal areas. Um, WTA um, thanks the council and work group for pointing out the other factors influence, influencing SRKW health. And we agree that the burden of recovering SRKW not be, or we would ask it should not be placed solely on the fishing communities. Um, WTA would like to point out that fisheries removals have been decreasing over the years in the evaluated time series and any potential benefit to SRKW health are difficult to quantify. Um, if the council chooses to take an action and adopt a trigger, WTA would prefer a low threshold abundance trigger of 957,330 Chinook. This is an average of 94 through 96 in consecutive years, which coincides with a decrease in SRKW health. <clears throat> and it is important because it encompasses a suite of low abundance years that helps evaluate against the lag survival rate of SRKWs. At this level of abundance, the WTA would prefer some of the responses listed in alternative two, including um, 1A, 2A, 3A, 3B um, in the north of Falcon area, as well as laid out in the SAS report south of Falcon to provide measures uh, coastwide to provide benefit to the SRKW. SRK, uh, sorry. WTA opposes the implementation of response 4A, 4B, and 5C, the delay of start dates. These responses close time and area up to 30% of our available season in the traditional year. And this time and area is uh, very important to the fleet to have favorable access to market conditions in the spring. Salmon quotas will already be very small, likely at these level of abundances, and being able to remove some Chinook. Um, earlier could help fishing businesses survive another year and hope for increased abundance the following year. WTA does not support the running two-year geometric mean to calculate this threshold. Instead, we favor a single year time step one abundance and believe it is best in terms of response timing for the SRKWs as well as the fleet. Um, The uh, <clears throat> Washington Trollers Association will continue to be advocates and stewards of Chinook salmon throughout their range. And we will look forward to working with other stakeholders involved with the SRKW to work at the state and federal levels to produce more hatchery salmon under ESA and try to bolster Chinook abundances by the 35% or more estimated to be needed to improve the health of SRKWs. <clears throat> WTA would like to take this opportunity to ask and offer any assistance possible to the council um, to support habitat recovery work, increased predator management, and hatchery production to support SRKW forage base. Um, I thank the council for this open and transparent process and for taking my testimony today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Are there any questions of Ryan? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Let me see here. I think that, um, except for the folks with technical difficulties, I think that concludes uh, public comment. At least I'm not seeing anything else on the screen here. Mr. Chairman, I believe Cindy Hansen is ready to go. Okay, and I just want to uh, note for uh, those of you who have signed up and have not yet been able to speak, and those who may want to speak on future agenda items, uh, per the instructions on the council website, you must sign in through the Ring Central app in order for us to enable your audio for public comment. So, uh, Cindy Hansen, please go ahead.
Um, why don't I think uh, Cindy's trying to log back in? Maybe we could go to Terry. Okay, Terry, are you with us? I am. Can you hear oh, me? Great. Thanks. Welcome. Thank uh, you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Greetings and thank you for the opportunity to provide oral comment. I have submitted a written comment as well, but today I would like to simply speak my heart. I am a faith-based individual and believe that all life was created by a power wiser than humans. All life was given this beautiful planet we call home. I do not believe that humans were given the right to degrade habitats and hasten the mass extinctions we see occurring, which are the result of human activity. And I'm perplexed at what could possibly motivate us when we look at the best available science to continue and contribute to allowing the Southern residents to starve to death in their native waters. We know that the Southern residents are a DPS that evolved over thousands of years to eat Chinook salmon. Scientific estimates show that up to 80% of their diet is made up of Chinook. Yet we deny them access to their food by degrading habitat, including building dams and other fish passage barriers that are the cause of their preferred prey being endangered and or threatened. We have polluted their waters, both with toxins and noise. We have captured these animals and put them on display in marine parks, separating their families. Imagine the outrage if we did this to a DPS of the human population. I recognize that finding solutions to this horrific mess is not easy. So I would ask each of the council members to ask of themselves a simple question. Are we doing everything we can to ensure the survival of the Southern residents? Based on the base scientific data, the answer is a resounding no. The charts do not show upward trends in the population of the southern residents, nor in their preferred prey, Chinook salmon. If Chinook salmon were abundant, they would be delisted and southern residents would not be starving. This council is not ready to adopt a final preferred alternative because you have not come up with viable solutions for the southern residents. Your recommendations support the fishing industry and as such are short-sighted. Managing the southern residents and runs of Chinook salmon on the brink of extinction will not serve the fishing industry for much longer. I urge you to seek better solutions before the Southern residents and the Chinook are extinct. While alternative 3.1.2.D is the best option the council has provided, it is based on data from years before the Southern residents were listed as endangered. Therefore, I urge you to allocate a quota of salmon for the Southern residents and that you close Chinook fishing in critical habitat areas one and two every season that the preseason forecast is below the threshold. It is estimated that the Southern residents need over 270,000 Chinook per year just to maintain their current status of just 74 members total. If we want them to recover to their historical levels of 200 members, they will need in excess of 50, 540,000 Chinook. We need not do this forever, but it buys orcas time as we work, work to recover habitat that restores Chinook salmon. I do not make this recommendation lightly because it will also cause harm to the fishing industry, which has suffered almost as much as the Southern residents due to the habitat degradation that has caused the listing of salmon stocks on the ESA. Therefore, the fishing industry needs to be compensated fairly every time the fishing season is closed until such time as salmon are rebounding and the Southern residents population is consistently trending upward. I understand that the members of this council did not cause this problem, but rather inherited a quagmire caused by years of human ignorance and a lack of understanding of the natural world. Unfortunately, we have operated on the premise for too long of humans being outside of nature. It is time to change this mindset to find both solutions by the southern residents, which now they depend on on all species. And I would caution all of us that we do not study these workers into extinction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Terry, for your public comment. Are there any questions of Terry? Thank you, Ms. Wright. Uh, thank I you. think I think we have Cindy Hansen with us now. Um, if someone can unmute her. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you go, Cindy. Yes. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. Sure. All right. My name is Cindy Hansen, and I'm the education coordinator for the nonprofit Orkin Network. And I'm speaking on behalf of our staff, board of directors, and volunteers today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment. 
we have long advocated for the southern resident orcas to be allocated a salmon quota in north of falcon proceedings and we appreciate your efforts to assess the effects of ocean salmon fisheries on this highly endangered population while considering all stakeholders in particular, we thank those members of the work group who put the needs of the tribes and the Southern Resident Orcas first during these deliberations. As I'm sure you're all aware, Southern Resident Orcas are continuing to decline despite their listing with the endangered species list since 2005. The population is currently at a precarious 74 individuals. While there are numerous threats leading to this decline, lack of salmon is widely recognized as the biggest limiting factor in their recovery. And this has led to decrease in presence in their summer feeding areas, an increase in stress hormones, and a miscarriage rate of almost 70%, as you have heard from multiple speakers today. Uh, data from NOAA shows that southern resident orcas use the coastal habitat year round and continue to target Chinook salmon as their preferred prey. And photogrammetry analysis shows a decline in body condition between the months of October and May when they're primarily feeding off the coast, which underscores the fact that they're not finding sufficient prey in coastal waters. We support the alternative to establish a threshold for pre-fishing Chinook salmon abundance, below which management actions would be triggered, while alternative 3.1.2D would yield the highest result in available salmon, we believe that it is not sufficient. The threshold is based on maximum abundance from the late 1990s, which was a time period of steep decline in the southern resident orca population that eventually led to their endangered status. In order for this alternative to be meaningful and support survival and growth of the population, we recommend setting the threshold higher than the maximum of the mid-1990s. We also support strong and bold management actions here as part of a comprehensive effort to ensure the southern resident orcas will have the salmon they need in order to prevent their extinction. Orca Network supports tribal treaty rights and we agree that any management action should apply to non-tribal fisheries. We recognize that the outcome of this process could result in decreases to non-tribal commercial and recreational fisheries. And for that reason, we support compensation to the fishing industry when management actions are triggered. We hope that if we all work together towards salmon recovery efforts, there will someday be enough available for commercial and recreational fisheries, for tribes, and for a healthy, thriving southern resident orca population. Thank you. Thank you very much for your public comment. Are there questions of Ms. Hansen? Uh, I'm not seeing any. And I think that leaves one last public commenter, Owen Begley Collier. All right. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, please go ahead. All right. Uh, my name is Owen Begley Collier, and I'm a 15-year-old sophomore at Roosevelt High School, Seattle, Washington. I've wanted to study the Southern residents since first grade, but by the time I graduate college, it could be too late to save them. We are starving the Southern residents to death. According to leading killer whale scientist Ken Balcom, the point of no return for these animals is in less than five years, yet we have failed to take any sort of decisive action to save them. The status quo is not working. We have destroyed and restricted access to spawning habitat in the greatest salmon rivers and overfished the stocks they rely on, all while allocating them zero salmon. The best science shows us that a shortage of Chinook salmon is the main reason for their decline. So I'm asking that the council today consider the urgency of the situation these whales are in. I support, at the very least, alternative D. I would also like to point out the fact that the transients are thriving with the same problems of noise and toxins, but are doing fine with the surplus of marine mammals as their food. Small incremental victories are not the answer. Hatcheries are not the answer. We need more wild salmon in the water for these whales, and this is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of their recovery. Please do the right thing and manage these fisheries to protect the critical habitat, the places uh, on the Oregon and Washington coast where these amazing creatures forage to survive. We are out of time, and I don't want to watch an extinction. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you very much, Mr. Beckley Collier. Let me see if there are any questions from around the council. Uh, I am not seeing any, but thank you very much for your public comment. Uh, and uh, double check for me, uh, Mr. Tracy, I think we're, we have now completed public comment. That's correct. 
Okay. So that takes us to council action. So um, uh, unless there's a, uh, a request for a break or something, we will, we will simply get started with council action. So I will look for some, a brave soul to get us started with uh, our discussion here and our action. Okay. Brett Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I thought I would start this uh, council action by uh, suggesting um, that we attack these, uh, the components of the work group recommendations around and, and, and uh, considerations around thresholds and management actions and the uh, other recommendations relative to um, escapement or conservation objectives and uh, age structure assessment of Sacramento River Fall Chinook separately. Um, I uh, so anyway, I offer that for council's consideration on a, on a way to proceed here um, with uh, two separate um, topics. Uh, thanks for that, Brett. And I think that that's an appropriate way for us to proceed. Um, and we can take those in either order, uh, mostly in the interest of trying to move this agenda item forward. So I would, I would welcome, you know, some discussion or motion. I don't think we're ready for a motion. I think we need to discuss this. We received uh, some very thoughtful comments from the public as well as uh, from the advisory bodies and uh, NIMS has provided us with a wealth of, of information as well. So Well, I appreciated Brett raising his hand and making that suggestion. Um, Chris Kern. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, somebody's, I guess somebody's got to say something. Um, <laughs> um, I guess a couple of thoughts I had during testimony, maybe one on the order of a question that I could uh, um, maybe ask Noah to uh, give us some feedback on um, just as we kind of think this through. A uh, number of folks have um, testified that uh, science showing the lack of prey being a primary uh, factor as, a, as opposed to the, the other main factors. Um, recognizing that's a, probably a difficult question. What I recall hearing through the work group is we're really not sure if one is primary over the other, and that's not to discount the importance of prey availability at all. But I wonder if Noah could comment on that a little bit uh, at this point. Uh, Jeremy or Teresa, do you want to respond to Chris? Ryan Wolf does. Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chan. Thanks, Chris, for the question. I mean, I, I don't think we have stated anywhere that one threat is primary over the other. I mean, I think we've been pretty clear that all um, threats are important. Uh, of course, from an ESA perspective, right, we, we analyze proposed actions individually uh, as they cross the range of threats, and so some maybe focus more on one threat than the other. Uh, but it also, as we've stated in general, um, 
the DPS for southern resident killer whales is endangered and declining, and, and, and the same stressors can affect them more given the status than even if they were healthier. So uh, these are all points that I think we've made, but um, again, uh, it's not to, they're in concert to the others, and so that's why we look at all threats. We're not saying one is primary over the other. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan, for that answer. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I guess I just have some overarching uh, thoughts to, to express. Um, I think the first is that I think everybody that, that has been a part of this process uh, that we've been through in the work group and and the council and uh, all the members of the public and the, whether you're you're um, from the environmental conservation community perspective, whether you're engaged in one of the fisheries that's under scrutiny here. I think everyone is extremely concerned about the status of the southern resident killer whale population. And I think, um, and, and there, are, there are probably varying degrees to that, um, but fundamentally, I believe that we are largely united around the concern that we have for this population uh, and to try and find some solutions that are within our reach that can help this population be, turn the corner and begin to grow. And um, we, I think we all, well, um, we all, I think we all recognize that um, we're going to need some help from Mother Nature here. Um, there are things that are within our ability to do, uh, and there are, um, but at the, I think at the end of the day, we're, we're going to need some help. And when I say that, I mean, Probably in particular, we're going to need some help with ocean environmental conditions, survival rates for our salmon. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of change in the growth rates, maturation rates, um, size at age. Um, the, the status of the Chinook population looks a lot different today than it did 50 years ago. And some of that is within, you know, some of those things we can influence probably around the margins and there's some things that we can. But I guess my first premise and my first point is that I think there is universal concern around southern resident killer whale. I also think there's universal concern around the status of our Chinook stocks. And we're interested, and and those are, in many ways, inextricably linked. I guess I would express some disappointment that we are. It seems to me that that the that the people engaged in the, in the fishing industry, the council, and the environmental community remain apart. As far probably farther apart than I, uh, that I, than I had hoped. Um, I'm not surprised that there's some differences of opinion about what the appropriate response from a fishery management perspective is, um, but we're farther apart than, than I had hoped. Um, and in particular, given uh, what I thought was a pretty, remarkable and thorough consideration of all the factors that went into the work group's discussions, 
um, we had some really talented analysts that helped were were members of the work group and or supported the work group. And I think um, and I'm and I'm proud uh, of of that group and of all the people that supported it and of all the efforts and the degree to which they really uh, tried to lift, you know, lift the rug up and take a good hard look at the data and try to identify things that we could do from a fishery management perspective that would contribute to the rebuilding of Southern Resident Killer Whale. Um, and there will be differences of opinion uh, when we're through with this and we take our action as to whether it was bold or not, or to the degree that it was bold or not, or whether some people think we just nibbled around the edges and didn't really do much. But I think the the um, alternative, in particular, the alternatives and in, in, um, that NIMPS put forward as part of their um, analysis and presentation that they gave us today. Um, uh, and I'm primarily focusing on alternative two. Um, I thought were were well well thought out. Um, I think some of the key uh, decision points about whether or not, for example, a bias adjustment is warranted or not, and the subsequent analysis that demonstrated that I think we were at like 1.08. And that from my perspective, such an adjustment uh, uh, shouldn't be included in our final decision. Um, we don't make such adjustments in uh, when considering other ESA issues. Um, there is a very low sample size, but, but more importantly, the ongoing and continuing efforts that our modelers do both in within the Pacific Council, within the co-management, the tribal and state communities, as well as within the U.S. Canada uh, Chinook Technical Committee, um, our model evaluation group, we're constantly looking for ways to improve our models. And I think not, you know, there isn't. Um, we will continue to do that. And I, uh, frankly, I think of in recent years, like within the last five. There's been an increase in the scrutiny that's been given to our models and adjustments that have been made to try to ensure that we're getting the most accurate forecast um, that we can. I think the choice of, I think including a threshold is a very, very important component. Um, uh, and I think um, recognizing, and those of you who have been a part of our fishery management regime over the um, decades this council has been involved, but in particular since the listing of Ch the number of Chinook salmon populations in in the Columbia River in the late 80s, the, the other listings of Chinook salmon uh, originating in Puget Sound in the late 90s. Uh, the response that management that we did in, in responding to the really low abundance of particularly Chinook salmon in the 90s, uh, up to and, and including a complete closure north of Cape Falcon in 1994, really demonstrates the commitment that this council and the states and the federal government and the tribes have had to salmon conservation. And so this idea of imposing a threshold when we're at these low levels, it even goes beyond what we what we have demonstrated that we that we do and how we step up to the plate when we have really small quotas uh, is a significant step. And um, the linear regressions that were developed in terms of how we go about ensuring that we 
if we do have quotas set and under those set of circumstances that there are set at levels that don't increase exploitation rates over and above what we have done in the past when presented with with those um, challenges. I think the willingness of the of the salmon industry to step up in places like um, whether or not we're going to use an average uh, to potentially um, not have to take an action when we're below that threshold. They said no. They said we're we're ready to step up, and and when we fall below that threshold, um, we're gonna we're gonna consider those on a on a year by year basis, on a single year basis. And I I think that's uh, the appropriate thing for us to do. As I mentioned in, I think in some earlier comments today about, or in questions about, you know, there's a number of other things that are going on um, that have happened that are real um, that aren't necessarily a part of this action. Um, but, and I know some people scoff at hatchery production. Uh, I'm not one of those. Um, I think we need to do it smart uh, and to do it in such a way that it doesn't adversely affect our wild populations. But we have some significant additions to hatchery production as a result of some uh, decisions made within the state of Washington's legislative process as well as within the uh, Pacific Standard Commission process and responding to the biological opinion associated with that agreement. Uh, that are going to add some prey bait, um here in the near term. Uh, there's also some very important mitigation pieces from a habitat perspective that have, that has come out of the biological opinion associated with the Pacific Salmon Commission and the treaty, the renegotiation of that treaty. There's about $10.3 million a year um, that's real that is being put toward um, uh, Habitat issues in Puget Sound with some of our really chronically depressed stocks, like Nooksack, like Stillaguamish, like Dungeness. That are additional important things that are happening that will benefit both the salmon populations in the future as well as southern resident killer whale. So um, I will end my um, my observations here. Um, not wanting to be too long-winded, but I again am, am gratified that we're taking this seriously. I'm gratified by the what I think is an overwhelming consensus around the concern of southern resident killer whales. I'm gratified with the process that the council has used and the degree to which uh, the the work group and the anal analysts that assisted that work group have done to bring us to this point. I think with a set of measures that we can be proud of uh, and improve upon probably and learn from over time. Um, and uh, so I, I look forward uh, to the motions that will be made and hope that they are uh, being made and contain some of the elements that I identified as uh, being important from my perspective. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Virgil Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'll try to, Phil, I really appreciate your comments. I, I think they point to a direction. As from my stand, your, on, your audio is uh, coming and going. Okay, let me try to see if this works okay. Are you still getting me? Yeah, you're loud and clear right now. Okay, uh, my internet has been fading in and out, but uh, we'll see if I can get this done. I'll, I'll make it real short. I don't believe I can support the status quo, um, but I'm at a point where I don't know what is needed. I think Phil's wisdom on this was well stated, but I certainly would look for the leadership of the coastal states to put a motion forward that is responsive to our needs to do something different. Um, certainly, 
uh, I appreciate the massive amount of work that's been done on the data end to give us the the variations and the options to look at. Uh, but I would like to see a motion that looks at some of the components that Phil put forward uh, so that we have um, responsiveness to the needs of of the southern killer whales, as well as the needs we have for our Chinook salmon. Um, with that said, I am frustrated by the I, I, I'm frustrated by the comments that are made that we need to do more for our Chinook salmon, the primary forage. At the same time, knowing through questions I've asked in the past and comments that have been made that some entities out there are not responsive to the hatchery programs that can give immediate increases to the needs of populations of Chinook that would be able to allow us to meet both human and orca needs out there. With that said, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Virgil, for your comments. Further discussion? Mr. Kern. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just a few things. Um, I agree with much of what uh, Mr. Anderson and Mr. Moore were, were speaking to. Um, I do, um, well, backing up a little bit, I, I think one thing that became very clear, um, I mean, those of us in the salmon management world had a pretty good picture of it um, to start with. Uh, being the um, progression over time of the fishery management um, process through the council. And in particular, uh, the, the data that we've seen multiple times now that show the decreasing percentage of, of fish being taken in, uh, uh, from the fisheries, and in particular being taken north of Falcon. Um, it's no doubt over time uh, that fishery area has uh, seen substantial reductions in Chinook catch relative to even, uh, not just because of changes in abundance, but even relative to a given level of abundance, uh, so to speak. Um, so I, I appreciate that we've talked about that a lot and seen it analyzed at least a few times in a few different ways. Um, I share the um, perspective that I think everybody around this table uh, shares uh, high concern for both the killer whale population and the Chinook populations across the coast. Uh, again, differences in a, of opinion in how you address those things are obviously going to occur, so that's not surprising. Uh, I've had uh, I, a few folks that testified today and in the past. Uh, some of them I know for a fact have been uh, pretty strongly engaged in other recovery uh, Chinook recovery discussion processes. I won't name uh, names, but I could count several in our list of testimony that I know have been involved and more than that that I suspect have been involved. Uh, for those who aren't or haven't been, I think it is very important if you, if you do feel as strongly about this as I believe you do, um, look into those. Um, there is a lot going on. Um, and a lot of the comments about the status of, of Chinook uh, and the need for recovery are um, something I would, I would agree with um, very strongly, um, that the recovery of those populations is critical, um, and that has been the case for some time. Um, related to Mr. Anderson's comments about hatcheries, I, I think I, I largely agree. Um, hatcheries, while, while I would not support a notion that they're the panacea to this issue by any stretch, um, where they can be done and be done well, and be done in a way that's consistent with wild fish recovery and productivity as well. Um, I think that's a tool. Where they can't meet those standards, I don't think that is the tool. And I don't think anybody in our process has suggested otherwise. Um, I do uh, share concern that while I think um, the management regime we have been using is um, far more responsive uh, to annual abundance in particular, uh, and leaving more fish in the ocean than it would have uh, 
uh, done uh, 20, 30 years ago under similar circumstances. I am interested in discussing the threshold um, approach for potential additional actions. If nothing else, um, as it relates to sort of being a, a backstop, so to speak, as we've actually heard some folks refer to, um, that, you know, hopefully we can, we can hope that we don't get to whatever those thresholds are, in which case uh, that would be a great, a better condition for both the whales and the fisheries. Um, but I think it is worth discussing what would happen if we did. Um, and I think that jives with quite a bit of the testimony we've heard over the last year and a half or so. Um, not quite ready to to throw out any any uh, preference for what that might be, but uh, I just don't know another way um, to uh, to um, um, sort of tie an action in other than a threshold. Uh, so uh, a bit wandering there. Just uh, wanted to give a few thoughts, kind of keep the ball rolling here. Uh, that's all for now. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, this journey for me started in the governor's task force, I don't know, three years ago and maybe four now. And, and then, then this as a SAS chair and then kind of an outsider when I got appointed to the council looking, looking in and participating. And first of all, I want to thank everyone for their hard work and participation. And, and it, it, it truly has been a, uh, I think a, a really you know, transparent and forward process uh, with everybody involved. And, I, and I'd also like to thank the testimony today, um, the heartfelt testimony and, you know, the high school sophomore and, and uh, you know, that all resonates. But I, I think the thing is, is uh, the fishing community is not trying to shirk their responsibilities you know, whatever responsibly they, they can contribute the, um, they're not, nobody's trying to say not in my backyard. We're, we've all come to the table, you know, with science based information to try to make the best decision where, where we can help the orcas and, and still, you know, maintain some coastal stability in our fishing communities. And, and I think that's important. I think it's important also to, to know that, you know, I'd like to snap my fingers and bring out, bring back every wild fish that was ever gone because of a straightening out a river or putting a culvert in or, or whatever, putting housing developments over, but, but that's not going to happen. And, and I think I would hope through this process um, that the Enviro community would see that we're, we're willing to roll up our sleeves and, and fix habitat and bring back wild fish where we can, but that's not gonna happen overnight. What can happen relatively overnight is what's going on with hatchery production. Um, you know, might be a 20 year, might be a, might be a shorter term fix, but it, it's gotta be, it's, I would hope at some point in time, um, you know, the communities would come together and, and both support one another on that. Uh, I get to work with a bunch of good guys out in the coast that that certainly do not want to see the last orca whale. They want to see them robust and and thrive just like just like anyone else. So, um, you know how how we do this. I, I don't think we're too far apart, and I think some good things have come out of this process. I I think that um, uh, you know I I, I heard the. I, I heard the environmental community, and I and I res respect what you say and and what you've done and all the work you you have done. Um, but but I think there is a chance on some of this stuff to, uh, for a better word, reach across the aisle and, and partner up and support things together, at least for some short term gains. And, uh, and and maybe that first step is is some some hatchery production that will continue either a little bit where we can put it like, like, you know, Chris Kern said, we don't want to put other, the wild fish at risk, but we do have room in other places to produce salmon and, and uh, we should work on those. But, but this is a big piece of a puzzle. I mean, everybody just read the Na Navy, Navy paper. Uh, we've got, you know, we've got all kinds of environmental issues. We've got noise, we've got sound, we got, you know, uh, whales, trying to chase food that normally would be considered a cheeseburger. And by the time they get them, it's a celery stick. 
um, because they have to go so far away to get them. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we can work on together. I think this is just one piece, and I, I think um, this council will certainly do the right thing and taking that step forward on our piece, and and uh, maybe we can team up on a few other the pieces of this puzzle and get it put back together for the Orca Wales and and our coastal communities. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all. Uh, thank you, Butch. Uh, Danny Evanson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, that Alaska agrees with a lot of the comments that have been made so far, particularly by Mr. Anderson, Mr. Moore. And I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, like Mr. Anderson said, we all care about killer whales. But I'd like to talk a little bit about status quo as it relates to Chinook abundance. Chinook abundance, Chinook, Chinook salmon is a resource that we all share on, on the seaboard. It's why we have a Pacific Salmon Treaty. And it's our action that we have before us today. And when we talk about status quo, I want to point out that the status quo for Chinook abundance has changed. When we began renegotiating the Pacific Salmon Treaty about five years ago, we recognized there was a need to have more fish in the water to support killer whales. And the science was a little vague at that time, but we rolled up our sleeves and we negotiated a deal wherein Alaska took uh, a harvest share reduction by seven and a half percent. We had harvest share reductions um, in the West Coast Vancouver Island fishery, uh, offshore fishery, which is an area where killer whales are present. And we had tighter controls on all the inside fisheries. In addition to that, as Mr. Anderson pointed out, we're also producing more fish um, and restoring habitat with annual funding under the treaty. And both of those things, um, the harvest reductions are contributing to more fish in, those wa in the water or the killer whales. And the hatchery production is going to contribute in the next couple of years to a, a much higher number of fish, we hope, to support the killer whale. So it's a shared responsibility and it's something that's multifaceted that we've all been working together on. And it's been an impressive amount of work that's come forward through the, the killer whale work group, all the states getting together, Canada, um, and, um, you know, with support from um, all the other engaged and affected stakeholders. And, um, I guess that's all I had to comment on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Danny. Uh, further discussion. Brett Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll try to be brief here. Uh, I and the state of California certainly um, share concern for the status of ESA listed species, both Chinook and uh, marine mammals, including Southern resident killer whales. Um, that is the foundation by which I think we all come together as resource managers is our concern for uh, conservation and um, also sustainable fisheries. Uh, such that uh, we can balance the needs of the resources and our stakeholders um, for the benefit of all. Uh, I think one thing that has been interesting about the work group and the process that we've gone through is there's been some foundational pieces that we were very easily able to demonstrate, um, beginning with the decline of southern resident killer whale. There's no disputing the fact that uh, that decline is persistent and and concerning. Um, we've also been able to demonstrate that uh, overall salmon abundance has increased over the time series that we looked at. We've been able to demonstrate that the fraction of that abundance over time that is harvested has decreased uh, over that same time series. Um, and we've been able to demonstrate that despite those changes in abundance and harvest, 
the southern resident killer whale population continues to decline. Um, Mr. Anderson spoke about uh, the fact that we are, aren't as close together on what is needed here. And when I say we, I mean uh, the sort of polar opposites of um, stakeholder involvement around this process being those that are largely concerned about southern resident killer whale or those that are largely concerned about harvest opportunity. Uh, I think we've largely been able to come to a, a real clear and, and, and obvious compromise is because of the one thing we haven't been able to demonstrate, uh, at least quantitatively, and that is a benefit to southern resident killer whale by foregoing some fraction of harvest uh, or changing Chinook abundance uh, in the ocean via changing the way fisheries are structured, all the way down to uh, not having fisheries at all. Um, so all of that considered, uh, it, the work group did take uh, another path forward, uh, an alternative form of logic, if you will, in looking at these thresholds or backstops and basing them upon some historical information relative to salmon abundance and whale demographics, given that that is something that we can also demonstrate uh, under certain scenarios. Uh, salmon abundance is X and killer whales are doing Y. And we tried to tie together those periods where uh, their, the correlations made some sense for establishing thresholds. So uh, in summary, I, I want to voice our support for choosing among the threshold values um, that others have voiced support for around this table so far in this council discussion. Um, and I will, uh, again, I, as Mr. Kern stated, I don't have a, a number that I think is correct, but would suggest that perhaps some middle ground here is appropriate given the spectrum of thresholds that we've been uh, offered to choose from. Thank you. All right, thanks for that, Brett. Is there further, further discussion? Kyle Attix. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at some point, I will have a, a motion to put forward, and I'll save most of my comments to speaking to that motion. Um, just wanted to say a couple things. I mean, we, we know that the bigger goal here is re rebuilding wild salmon stocks, and you know that's kind of outside the scope of the action we're taking today, but I think all of the, the state and federal agencies are, are working towards that goal. I heard a question earlier in the week during the SAS meeting um, kind of wanting to know what's going on with things like whale watching. I wanted people to be um, aware that WDFW is involved in a rulemaking process around um, commercial whale watching licenses and um, looking to find a way to enable sustainable whale watching while reducing the impacts of vessel noise and disturbance so that whales can effectively forage, rest, and socialize. So a lot of things going on on a lot of fronts. Um, to try to help the Southern resident killer whales. Um, appreciated all the comments from other council members. Um, Mr. Moore said that he did, he can't support the status quo and I'm intending to put forward something that is not the status quo. Um, also appreciated all of Mr. Anderson's comments, but um, particularly the, the document that NIMPS put forward, which took sort of the laundry list of things the work group came up with and I thought did a good job of pulling them into sort of three discrete alternatives that were a little easier to understand than the, the list the work group um, put forward. So appreciate that. Um, and again, I'll, I will have a motion when the time's appropriate. It'll, it will speak to the sort of first of the two-part discussion Mr. Cormos suggested that we would have. Um, so happy to bring that forward at the appropriate time. Uh, thanks very much, Kyle. I think uh, we're coming up on a lunch break here. Uh, and I certainly would want to hold off on the motion until after the lunch break. Uh, but uh, I don't want to prematurely 
uh, close off discussion. So let's just see if there's anyone who has uh, a comment or a discussion point before we break for lunch. And I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very brief. I, I'll speak more, I think, when we get to discussion on a motion, but I think this might be the appropriate time just to echo um, my sincere appreciation to the work group, to the advisory bodies and council in engaging in this process in good faith and, uh, and all of the very constructive discussions um, the challenging conversations that we've had, the diverse opinions, but, but I believe a highly collaborative process um, resulted, uh, and I look forward to the discussion on the motion, but I, I really wanted to thank everyone involved, as well as those that have given public testimony, not just today, but throughout the process. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Ryan. Okay, unless I see a hand pop up, um, We'll take a break and we'll come back at 105. And at that time, we'll see if there's any uh, further discussion. Uh, and if not, uh, perhaps uh, Kyle will entertain us with that motion he alluded to. So we'll see you all back here at uh, 105.
Well, it is 105. We'll get started in a moment here. All right, welcome back. Uh, we still find ourselves on agenda item F2, Southern Resident Killer Whale ESA consultation, final action. And we've had a uh, fair amount of uh, discussion following some very good public comment, as well as uh, reports from NIMPS, uh, the SAS on the gap. So uh, I know that Kyle mentioned that he had a motion, but before I call on Kyle, I want to see if there's any further discussion to be had amongst the council members. Well, Kyle, I'm not seeing any hands, so if uh, let me call on you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I believe Sandra does have my motion that she should be able to bring up on the screen. And she does. So I move that the council adopt the following measures from agenda item F2A, Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group Reports 1 and 2, November 2020, as the final preferred alternative for amendment of the Salmon Fishery Management Plan. Establish a threshold for annual pre-fishing pre Chinook salmon abundance in the area north of Cape Falcon, below which management actions will be triggered. Alternative 312C, the threshold is based on the arithmetic mean of the seven lowest years of abundance in the data series considered by the Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group and its risk, risk assessment, 1994 through 96, 98 through 2000, and 2007. This value is 966,000 using current models, but as noted, this value is subject to change if Ram or Shelton et al. models are recalibrated. The methodology for determining the value will remain the same if the models are recalibrated. When a year's preseason abundance projection for the area north of Cape Falcon in FRAM time step one falls below the established threshold, the following management actions will be implemented through the annual management measures for that year, as described in agenda item F2A, Southern Resident Killer Whale Work Group Report 2, November 2020. Alternative 312E, option 1A, reduce quotas for non-treaty fisheries north of Falcon to not exceed the value generated by regression analysis of historic time step one Chinook abundance and non-treaty Chinook quotas. Alternative 312E, option 2A, no more than 50% of the commercial troll Chinook salmon quota will be assigned to the spring, May, June period. Alternative 312E, option 3A, close the expanded area of the Columbia River control zone as described to salmon retention from the start of non-treaty ocean salmon fisheries until June 15th. Alternative 312E, option 3B, close the Grays Harbor control zone to salmon retention from the start of non-treaty ocean salmon fisheries until June 15th. Alternative 312E, option 5A, delay the start of the commercial troll fishery between Cape Falcon and the Oregon-California border until April 1st. Alternative 312E, option 5B, close the Oregon waters of the Klamath Management Zone to commercial and recreational salmon fisheries from October 1 through March 31 of the following year. Option 312E, option 6A, close commercial and recreational salmon fisheries in the Monterey Management Area from October 1 through March 31 of the following year. Alternative 312E, option 6B, beginning October 1 through March 31 of the following year, close commercial and recreational fisheries in the California waters of the KMZ. Alternative 312E, option 6C, increase the duration of the Klamath Control Zone area expansion be beginning September 1 through March 31 of the following year. All right, uh, Kyle, is the language on the screen uh, com consistent with the motion? It is. Okay, and I will look for a second. Is 
seconded by Brett Cormos. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And obviously it's a lengthy motion, so my comments will take a few minutes. Um, first, just thanks to the work group for all of their efforts, particularly the staff that labored to produce the new modeling tool, the combination of the Fram and Shelton models, and the subsequent analysis that were critical to our progress. The work group struggled through our looks at relationships between Chinook abundance and southern resident killer whale population parameters. The results of the analyses weren't striking, but pointed at abundances north of Falcon as the most meaningful to consider. So that's where the, the work group focused. As we considered those north of Falcon abundances, the work group also struggled with if and how to define a threshold for action and couldn't identify a strong biological basis for a threshold. Eventually, we settled on a range from no threshold to the threshold based on the maximum abundance from a series of years in the 90s. The threshold I've included in the motion is in the high range of values considered by the work group and is based on the same method used in the 2020 NIMPS guidance. We heard some suggestions for alternative methods for calculation of a threshold and testimony today, most of which would result in values in the same range, just slightly more or less conservative than this value, but with no stronger quantifiable biological justification. Uh, my motion sticks to the value that was in the slate of options from the work group reports. The work group spent significant time and effort to narrow alternatives to those specific values that were included in the report and put out for public comment. So I didn't see a strong reason to propose a value slightly adjusted from those original alternatives. The motion includes a provision to limit quotas to ensure that we will not increase harvest in North of Falcon fisheries above what occurred in past in responses to low Chinook abundance years. It includes a provision to limit troll quota during the spring season north of Falcon when southern resident killer whales are more likely to be in the area. It includes control zone closures off Grays Harbor and the Columbia River during the spring season when southern resident killer whales are more likely to be in the area and includes the expanded area off the Columbia River. I'll note again that the largest control zone closure in Washington, the Cape Flattery controls zone closure to non-treaty troll fisheries will continue and likely provides the benefit to southern resident killer whales and as WDFW representative to the council I'll confirm that the intent will be to move the control zone closures for state waters forward through state rulemaking processes in years when closures are required by this action. It includes a delay in the troll fishery off Oregon until April 1 and includes closures in the Oregon and California KMC and Monterey management area throughout the fall and winter season. Uh, the motion uses single year values rather than a multi-year geometric mean for assessing status relative to the threshold. That seems like it's the most responsive appro approach and will prevent avoiding implementation of fishery management measures due to a previous high year abundance that might influence the mean. The motion does not include any tiered response. All of the specified actions are to be implemented if that year's preseason abundance falls below the threshold. The motion does not include a forecast adjustment. I believe that the work undertaken since September eliminates the concern that there's a potentially large bias in the forecast and agree with NOAA's explanation in their report for why application of an adjustment is not needed. I do support continued assessment of forecast performance in the future to ensure that forecast bias is not affecting the intended application of the threshold and resulting measures. The motion does not include work group recommendations two and three on Klamath or Sacramento Fall Chinook. I assume that additional council discussion would occur on those, um, as Mr. Cormos mentioned, as sort of a separate issue, and how to best move those forward will um, receive some further discussion. Finally, the motion's phrased as picking an alternative for amendment of the FMP, but not spe is not specific to how or where to insert it in the FMP. My assumption here is that this will provide some latitude for the executive director and council staff to work with the council and NIMP staff on inserting and finalizing the changes for transmittal. So just to wrap up, thanks again to all the work group members and others who participated in, in this process over the past year and a half, up into including the public comments and statements we heard today. I think the process has positioned the council to be able to take this important action today, and I believe that this motion represents a package of meaningful fishery management responses for council fisheries that will specifically benefit southern resident killer whales in years of low Chinook abundance, in addition to the many restrictions that are already in place to respond directly to salmon population needs. Okay, thanks, Kyle, for that comprehensive motion and your and your thoughtful comments. Um, let me uh, see if there are any 
questions for you on your motion uh, or a discussion on the motion. Brett Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to offer here for council consideration that similar to what Mr. Addix said about state water fisheries in uh, the state of Washington, inherent to this motion is a commitment from the state of California to maintain uh, river mouth control zones in our state water fisheries uh, for specific streams on the North Coast. Thanks, Brett. Chris Kern. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just uh, similarly uh, indicate that should this motion pass, uh, Oregon would take uh, necessary rulemaking in years uh, affected uh, relative to the Columbia Control Zone extension. Thank you, Chris. Further uh, discussion on the motion? Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Carl, for the motion um, uh, and for all, all, all that you said speaking to your motion. <clears throat> um, I also want to know, my uh, comments based on what we heard under discussion, um, I do want to point out from, from NIMP's perspective, uh, we I'm very supportive of those of those comments that were made, and, and NIMS does believe that council fisheries are adequately responsive to changes in Chinook abundance for killer whales in, in most years. Um, I do want to acknowledge that well, North of Falcon fisheries are of greatest importance to killer whales for forage and overlap, but we do uh, note that they have a low impact on the on the forage base in general. And that reductions in prey base from council fisheries have de decreased substantially since the 90s. Uh, Chinook abundance has also increased in North of Alcorn waters since then, and council management for Chinook salmon has become more constraining, including limits to protect ESA listed salmon stocks. And for the majority of years when Chinook abundance was low, the fisheries responded and reduced harvest. So I do want to acknowledge that and appreciate all the comments along those lines. Uh, as we've noted um, in our report and previously, we are, we are concerned about concurrent years of low abundance in north of Falcon waters that have coincided with poor Chinook survival and low killer whale, southern resident killer whale viability, uh, in that we would support an, an, an abundance threshold that incorporates consecutive years of low abundance and a mix of southern resident killer whale status. Uh, and that's proposed here in this motion. This alternative does that. It's based on the seven years with lowest Chinook abundance. It has a mix of killer whale status with two relatively good status years and the, and, and the remaining low abundance years had fair or poor killer whale status. Regarding the management actions, NIMS also supports the responses that are proposed here, which uh, focuses on, on the North Falcon area for non-treaty fisheries, uh, which the work group analysis found the strongest links between Chinook abundance and killer whale de demographics there, uh, consistent with the observational spatial and diet data. Uh, in addition, in years when abundance is below the threshold, it also includes implementation of management responses throughout the EEZ, both North and South of Falcon, uh, which meets the killer whales needs to have access to fish throughout or, and across their range, and it also contains responses that reduce fishery overlap with times and areas where and when southern resident killer whales are most likely to occur. So, so for all of those reasons uh, that I noted, uh, NIMS will be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Further discussion, discussion on Mr. Addick's motion? Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will be supporting this motion. It, uh, it satisfies my feeling of responsibility toward the uh, Southern region killer whales, uh, the orcas, uh, that I feel is, as uh, thoughtful human beings, we have to consider our, our fellow animals on this planet and the richness, richness that they provide to us uh, in our experience and for our children in the future. And also, uh, it does consider strongly the needs of the dependent communities that are dependent on um, the fisheries themselves 
And, and I want to point out one thing that I've seen missing so far is the responsibility for this council to provide food security for the nation, especially in this time of COVID and uh, restricted communication and transport. So all these items, uh, I think, uh, are, are dealt with, even though the food security thing was not mentioned. And I, uh, I favor it, and I really appreciate Mr. Attic's uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zim. Any further discussion on this motion? Not seeing any hands, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thanks very much, Kyle, for the motion. Uh, Mr. We, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, just real yes. quick, I, I thought I saw Joe Oatman uh, attempting to speak and uh, has given the volume of his uh, uh, sound system earlier. I just want to make sure that he was um, heard. heard. <laughs> so Joe, could you repeat your, were you a yay or an A or an abstain on that motion? A yay. Thank you. Anything else, Chuck? No, thanks. We're good. Okay. All right. So we have some additional business on this um, agenda item that uh, Brett Cormos referred to. Brett? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, as I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, the recommendations that came from the work group weren't limited to uh, thresholds and management actions um, in the face of low salmon abundance, but there were also some recommendations that were specific to uh, stocks in California and specific to the conservation or management objectives for those target stocks in uh, Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook. There was also a recommendation um, for reevaluation of, excuse me, not reevaluation, but uh, for um, the development of a age structured assessment approach for Sacramento River Fall Chinook. Um, and I have a, a number of comments that I'd like to make about those recommendations for council consideration. Uh, to begin with, um, I, in the state of California, support and certainly are looking for acknowledgement from the council for support of these uh, recommendations as a priority for this council. And uh, we are interested in the feasibility uh, for the council to support that technical work going forward. Uh, I'll start by, uh, well, first of all, the reasons for, for the support and really the purpose and need behind those recommendations um, are that those, those, those improvements, those adjustments to our management uh, approach and uh, our management targets uh, should, um, in theory, improve how sustainably we're able to manage the fishery, uh, and that should provide a benefit to the stocks themselves, as well as our stakeholders, but also uh, it should it conceivably help improve prey availability for southern resident killer whale and allow us to better understand the effects our fishery may be having on southern resident killer whale uh, um, related to those specific stocks. Um, I want to point out that uh, there are a number of items sort of wrapped into those recommendations that may or may not be obvious uh, to all that are looking at them. Um, that are really uh, interrelated, um, inextricably linked, if you will. And 
that is that any adjustment to uh, an escapement objective um, is going to require subsequent changes to the harvest control rules that we use to manage those stocks. Um, and in the case of the Sacramento River Fall Chinook, uh, any adjustment to the escapement objective should uh, in all likelihood be driven by uh, the development of an age structured uh, assessment and stock recruitment analysis that would go along with that. So there is a significant amount of work involved uh, in a number of facets of our FMP and our management approach that would require attention and potential adjustment should the council take that work up at some point in time. Um, given the fact that that is not trivial and really a, a substantial process uh, that would require a very significant amount of time and a commitment of resources from multiple agencies, um, I think it's important for us to think about a few things as, as it relates to the council's capacity to um, do that work and maybe more importantly, uh, choose a time at which or choose to take action on those things at this time, at this meeting in November of 2020. Um, first and foremost, uh, I think we need to be cognizant of the current and perhaps future ad hoc work groups that we are, uh, like I said, currently engaged in or maybe anticipating uh, the formation of in the future um, because they they really preclude setting a start date for something of you know this uh, for for the substantive work that would re, it, that it would require to to make these adjustments to conservation objectives and and develop an age structured approach. Um, I will remind the council that. Uh, very recently, there was a, dis a discussion on promoting American seafood competitiveness and economic growth, and the council's discussion at that time uh, landed on the, this work as being important, um, but not likely to happen soon due to workload and staffing limitations. Um, furthermore, CDFW... Uh, we'll need some time for our own internal discussion and planning before choosing uh, a date or a point in time to start these processes. Um, staffing and funding to support uh, these annual um, assessments uh, are not currently in place and will require some planning. Um, it is one thing to develop uh, uh, age structure assessment tool or uh, new conservation objectives, but it is another altogether to develop the infrastructure necessary to generate inland coded wire tag uh, data um, results, uh, reporting to RMIS um, and age specific escapement estimates such that they can support that that management scheme or that management approach. Um, one other limitation to, to being able to uh, foresee a, a point, at, point in time at which we might start this work is that the dam removal for Klamath River Fall Chinook uh, has yet to occur. And um, it is inherent to Reevaluation of the conservation objective for that particular stock, uh, meaning changes to that number are predicated by the removal of the dam and subsequent recolonization of the habitat upstream for a number of years before we can actually uh, uh, do any sort of useful assessment and, and make an adjustment there. Um, but like I said at the beginning of this statement, we are supportive of, of making these, um, doing this technical work and perhaps making the necessary adjustments to our fisheries management process um, and are 
you know, certainly don't want to lose sight of this priority or these goals uh, as time goes by and we move past this point where we're looking at these recommendations for the purposes of southern resident killer whales. Um, and given all of that, I uh, have a few suggestions um, and or reminders for the council and, and our stakeholders as places where we might um, keep this concept alive or continue to uh, keep it on the radar, if you will, um, such that we don't forget to move it forward when the time is right, it's feasible to do, and it's appropriate. Um, first, I'll point out that at least for Sacramento River Fall Chinook escapement objectives and the age structure approach, um, these are things that have uh, been in our research and data needs document for years and years and years. Um, and lest we don't forget that those are in there, um, they are there for a good reason. Um, and like I said before, uh, prior to thinking about this in terms of southern resident killer whales, these tools and these changes are things we've acknowledged as potentially useful just for the purposes of sustainable fisheries management. Um, they have shown up in our rebuilding plans too, um, more than once. Uh, but all of that said, I, I would ask the council, in addition to keeping this as a priority moving forward and making a verbal commitment here um, to do so, perhaps we can also put this in a parking lot or uh, sort of a standing agenda item to consider for future workload planning so that some number of years from now when the time is right and uh, we have the 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 tools that we need and the, the, the staffing and the funding and everything that's going to need to align in order to facilitate such an outcome um, so that it's there and ready and waiting uh, and, and the public can see and acknowledge that the council's intent is to move this these processes forward for the benefit of fisheries management, if not southern resident killer whales as well. So I will stop there. I know that was a mouthful and maybe somewhat convoluted, but um, I, I, I know I and I think others uh, at the table here may be looking for some consensus uh, acknowledgement of that as a council goal uh, going down the road. Thanks for that, Brett. Chris Kern. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, to be brief, I, I agree with Mr. Cormos uh, on the importance of this, but also on the timeliness issues. Um, to that point, my recollection is that we actually have already, well, I'm trying to think about appropriate and productive ways to keep it front and center for when it is ready to be worked on, as well as trying to think of ways to um, speed that process up and, and make it ready sooner. Um, but in the interest of thinking about how to keep it active, typically we have done things like assign these things out to work group, but my recollection and Mr. Cormos can probably confirm or deny this for me was that we actually already have tasked it out in the past, um, to the SDT to sort of scope out, so to speak, what, um, some of the main parameters would need to be in order to move in this direction. So I don't view that as a potentially viable option at this point, having, uh, assume that we've already done that. Uh, could I just ask for a confirmation that my recollection is correct on that? It, Brett? it is, Mr. Kern. You are correct. We do have a scoping document that the STT provided at our request. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I guess it does leave me with the question of, and I don't have the answer, uh, of how do we um, keep this on the radar as well as giving it some appropriate level of certainty um, that, it, that it's on our task list, so to speak. Thankfully, Chuck Tracy has raised his hand. Chuck? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Brett, for uh, that well thought out, um, your well thought out remarks. Um, and uh, so uh, there's a lot, lot I have to agree with there. Uh, the, you know, the status of our uh, ability to staff um, ad hoc committees uh, such as 
Killer Whale work group, and now we're involved in the Salt Coho work group, and those sorts of things. Just, you know, from a, I just think from a personnel standpoint, um, put us off a while. And then obviously there's the, you know, the uh, whole data uh, issue and the, and the dam removal issue that, that further delay things, uh, or the likelihood of us getting to this anytime real soon. Um, I think the research and data needs, is, I think that's a good point. And I would uh, remind the council that we are revising our research and data needs process. We're, we're in the process of developing a database, uh, similar to the way North Pacific keeps track of things. Um, there's an informational report uh, under in this agenda, in this uh, November council meeting, uh, that's kind of got the progress to date on it. Uh, so some of the things that are, uh, on the horizon for the council in that regard are um, how do we set priorities uh, in that uh, new research and data needs world. <clears throat> um, so I think there's some opportunities there for the council to, uh, you know, to provide some input into the, uh, the people that are working on this in terms of, you know, how we identify priorities, if there's a timing uh, issue that needs to be included in that. Uh, so I think there, I think that's one way. I also expect, you know, part of the problem with the research and data needs, the way we've been doing it is it, it occurs once every five years. And uh, so that seems like kind of a long time to be, uh, you know, if, if you're going to wait that long to think about, you know, what's next, that probably doesn't really um, fit our needs very well either. So our thoughts are that with this new uh, database, that we could do that more often every uh, couple of years, say, or uh, something like that. Uh, that again is something the council will be um, asked to weigh in on over the course, hopefully, of the next year uh, as we finalize this research and data needs process. So, so I think that is a good. Um, I think that's a, a good and appropriate place to keep track of it. And, and again, I think there's some opportunities to improve how we've done things in the past. Uh, with regard to research and data needs, so I, I would definitely um, would definitely encourage that. As far as just sort of you know on the radar screen, um, you know typically how we've uh, done some of these long-term things, and, and I'll just use this as an example the standardized uh, bycatch methodology review. Uh, we kind of that's been hanging around since uh, 2017, and we're finally getting around to it at this council meeting. <clears throat> So, and what, you know, essentially what we've done with that and with other other things uh, is to just kind of put a shaded cell in the most distant uh, um, meeting for the year at a glance, and then kind of just keep pushing it out. Uh, just just as, as we get closer, we just push it out. And so that kind of keeps it there on the radar screen um, and it keeps the you know, keeps the council thinking about it. So that's something we can do. I know there's some, there's also some, you know, uh, people that don't really uh, like that that well uh, to see things that they know that we're not going to do for a long time, but there it is, or why haven't we gotten to that? And that's been there for years. So, you know, there, there's a little bit of pushback on that. Um, and I understand that too. So, uh, but, but I guess just in terms of without inventing a new system, that would be, uh, you know, what we could do um, the way we are now. You know, to go beyond that, um, you know, you're you're kind of talking about a, uh, some sort of, you know, a, maybe a strategic plan or some other uh, mechanism to, uh, to, I, to identify certain um, priorities that the council might have for its various FMPs. Uh, that would take, you know, it would take some additional um, effort to develop something like that, and not to say that it, it couldn't be done or that we haven't thought about it in, in other FMPs as well. But um, I guess so those, those are my uh, my initial thoughts on on uh, Mr. Cormos's suggestions. Brett, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Tracy. Um, aside from the strategic planning exercise that you mentioned, which I'm certainly not opposed to or for doing at this point in time. 
all of the other items that you ticked off were uh, consistent with my suggestion. So thank you. That's really how I was proposing to move forward. I appreciate that. Thank you, Brett. Chris Kern. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. This this is, um, I agree with that approach. It seems like um, understanding the hesitancy of the shaded cell approach, I, I do think it's probably the most obvious answer to the question. Um, I just want to throw this out as a thought that is not necessarily um, has to be tied to this, but I'm I'm thinking back to um, the first day of council when we saw the Habitat Committee report, which had at the very end uh, of its uh, report had the red light, green light um, uh, set of data, I believe, for Sacramento at this point. Um, those are at a very high level at the moment, uh, and I don't intend to try to dig into the weeds of it right now, but it does kind of uh, jump out to me that potentially uh, some of those metrics could be uh, potentially useful in looking at some of the issues we're talking about with Sacramento and Klamath uh, moving forward. So um, understanding we're probably going to be talking about those at a later time when the Klamath uh, section of that same work is done. Um, so I don't necessarily uh, suggest we tie those at this point, but it is another thing that I think could, could, uh, bear on on these issues, um, specifically digging into uh, rather than qualitative um, sort of expectations of what those metrics might look like, um, potentially starting to dig into some quantitative assessments that might uh, help, um, particularly on things like recruitment and marine survival. Uh, anyway, just throw that out there. It, it can wait, but uh, just the thought I was having as we were talking about this, I thought maybe it would be worth mentioning. Thank you, Chris. Further hands? So we have in the uh, work group report, recommendation two and three, which is what uh, Brett Cormos was referring to. And I think what I've heard from Brett is, uh, and I've not heard any, any dissension, that we wanna keep these things visible in some way so that as resources become available and other things align, such as the dams coming down and sufficient data being collected, that the council will return to these recommendations in the future. Is that, is that uh, consistent? Does anyone disagree with that summary? Thank goodness no hands go up. So, um, Brett, I, I think that, that that is the sense of the council that we will return to these um, as time and resources become available. Brett? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That, that, that's satisfactory for me and hopefully for others at the table as well. All right, thanks for bringing those forward. Uh, let me see if, are there any other recommendations, uh, from the floor or any other discussion from the floor on this agenda item? I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, Mr. Berner, have we completed our work here? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The council has identified a final preferred alternative with a threshold of annual pre-fishing Chinook abundance in the area north of Falcon. It's based on an arithmetic mean of the seventh lowest years. Uh, that value is currently at 966,000 using uh, current models, but uh, with the understanding that if, if that understanding changes or the models are recalibrated, uh, that value would also be changed without FMP amendment. Uh, and then in any single year, if the abundance falls below that threshold, the council has adopted a suite of management responses, all of which uh, would be triggered. Um, and then regarding the, your second piece of action there, the other recommendations, I think you just summarized that well, that these, uh, we got council guidance that those remain a high priority, but perhaps the timing's not ripe right now and we will keep those on our radar screen for future work. So yes, I believe that does. And I would re be remiss without also mentioning it's unfortunate that uh, Robin Elke wasn't 
able to join us here for this. She's put a lot of work uh, in the last couple of years on this, and uh, I'm sure she would be proud to see this one finished. So thank you very much. All right, Mike. Well, don't go away because we're going to start now on agenda item F3, uh, the Song Coho ESA consultation. So do you have an overview for us there? I do. Just let me... Uh change pages here for just a moment. I'll be with you there in just a sec. Agenda item F3. Southern Oregon, Northern California, Coast Coho Endangered Species Act consultation update. Consistent with the stipulated agreement and a motion stay reached between the Hoopa Valley Tribe and the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, National Marine Fisheries Service provided the council a proposal which included a terms of reference which you adopted uh, that specifies a process to develop a harvest control rule uh, for these stocks for council consideration. Uh, we started this process in the spring. Uh, in, the, in response, the council formed an ad hoc work group to take on this task. Uh, the work group has met a couple of times over the summer and fall uh, and is prepared to give you an update uh, here at this meeting on terms of progress, uh, both from the technical side and in terms of a suite of potential alternatives for your consideration. We are kind of early in that process. What we've been looking at here is uh, an update for, again from the work group. They, in your briefing materials, there was a brief summary of uh, what they'd done at the time of the briefing book and what they intended to submit supplementally. Uh, they did indeed submit a supplemental report, which is a sort of a first look at uh, the, the technical issues involved in developing a harvest control rule for this stock in terms of uh, what stocks are involved, what the data for those stocks might be, um, what a forecasting methodology might look like for some of these stocks if needed. Uh, there's a suite of control rules for initial consideration uh, and the like. Mr. Dr. O'Farrell uh, will be uh, providing you a presentation that goes through all of that. So not to steal his thunder, but he's uh, they, he can bring you up to speed on, on where the work group stands on, on that technical work. Um, this actually is on a timeline. Uh, we expect that at this meeting, we'll get an initial look at what the work group is thinking in terms of uh, a risk assessment and harvest control rules, like I mentioned. Uh, we're scheduled at this meeting to discuss the development of a range of alternatives, but perhaps not get to a final adoption of a range of alternatives. We've got that teed up, I believe, for your April meeting next spring. Uh, and then per the uh, court, rulings, uh, we have uh, preliminary and final council action scheduled for uh, late 2021. So, uh, I mean, similar to the last action, this would, inv if the council goes ahead and adopts a new control rule for this uh, suite of stocks, this would ultimately result in a, an amendment to the salmon fishery management plan. In your review materials, like I mentioned, the work group has uh, two reports. Uh, progress report one was in your briefing book. Uh, the supplemental work group report two is a more fleshed out version of what they mentioned they were planning to bring forward. Uh, attachment one is simply the terms of reference and timeline that you adopted back in the spring. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, Dr. O'Farrell is prepared to run you through uh, primarily the information in their second report to bring you up to speed. And we have a supplemental report from the Salmon Advisory sub-panel that I believe uh, Chair Richard Heap of the of the panel is uh, going to provide when we get to that point. Uh, so council action here again is to get an update from the work group uh, on the develop and to consider uh, what they've done so far in terms of uh, preliminary technical work and the, the beginning of the formulation of a, a risk assessment to evaluate uh, a suite of uh, initially proposed control rules that's in their report and get your feedback on further development of those uh, so that we could take another look in the spring uh, for adoption of a range of alternatives. So. Uh, that's my overview, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Mike. Are there any questions of Mike on his overview? And if not, I will go to Dr. O'Farrell to provide, um, I know there's a presentation, as well as any other anything else he has on the work group report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Hope you can hear me okay. When I was listening to the situation summary, uh, Mr. Berner, a little bit of problem with the audio. I don't know if, if that's on my side or not. Uh, we'll do our best here. Um, well, carry on. Okay, thank you. Um, 
is it uh, the pleasure of the council for me to begin with the presentation, the uh, suite of uh, PowerPoint slides submitted? There we go. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, talk a little bit about um, the process that the work group has uh, gone through over the past several months after its inception and um, what we have um, going on here in the future to um, bring this uh, um, to some sort of completion. Um, the work group was established by the council in April 2020. Uh, the terms of reference were adopted in the, the next council meeting in June 2020. And the work group itself has held meetings in June, August, and October. And for uh, the briefing this council meeting, we've, as, as was mentioned just previously, we have submitted a prior and a supplemental work group report number two. And I'm going to uh, speak mostly to the supplemental work report work group review, but um, also refer back to the progress report at some point. I'm sorry, next slide. And I just, uh, uh, next slide also. Okay. Um, just to um, center ourselves here, this is a summarization of the purpose and need uh, for this work group. Uh, develop a proposed harvest control rule for the Sanko ESU, and that would abundance while not impeding the rip. Sonk Coho, harvest control rules in the form of fixed per tier exploitation rates, control rules which exploitation. Hey, Mike, your audio is um, cutting out pretty significantly. Fishery components and marine fisheries only affecting Sonk Coho as appropriate given potential data limitations and feasibility. Number four, evaluate feasibility of the ESU, uh, marine and freshwater environmental, and other relevant and supported by the available data. Next slide, please. So, from the terms of reference, the tasks for uh, the work group. For meeting were to prepare a document with a range of alternatives, recommendation, and draft board for the vice chair to present work group report to the council at the November council. And where what have we done? Um, well, in work group report number two, we've described the status of the ESU, available data and description trees, uh, preliminary assessment of the abundance forecast, the feasibility of making a forecast. We've uh, developed a preliminary range of control rules. We've made a preliminary assessment of a subset of control rules. And we've developed a supplemental work group report. Um, and really should be thought of as an illustration of methods as opposed to a, uh, you know, methods or um, results that could be used uh, to uh, inform council decisions at this point. Uh, I will say, looking back to the progress report, the, uh, the work group did um, for the briefing book, it says here that the information, while preliminary, should be sufficient for the council to provide additional direction if necessary. And while, of course, um, the work group would take any uh, any advice that the count or direction that the council might give us, um, we don't think that the uh, the science is yet for making inferences to, to the effects on fisheries or the populations within the ESU uh, given the current suite of control rules. And I think that will become clear as I move through the uh, slides here. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So um, this is this table here on the left-hand side is a, uh, uh, is a, Collation of all the populations and diversity strata within the Sonk ESU, Coho ESU. 
And yet all of these uh, populations do not have data or adequate data uh, to be included in um, the work uh, the work of this work group. And so um, going through a pro selection process, the work group has uh, settled on uh, six components uh, that have sufficient data uh, to inform our analyses. Uh, this includes rogue, which is a, a aggregate of three populations for the interior rogue river, um, bogus Creek, Shasta River, and Scott River, uh, the upper uh, basin, Turney River, uh, which is, is comprises, uh, it's an aggregate also like the rogue that has three different populations in it and uh, Freshwater Creek, which is part of the Humboldt Bay Tributaries population. Uh, these, uh, this selection of uh, different populations and aggregates spans a good portion of the ESU, it omits um, the far southern end of the ESU, and that primarily has to do with data availability, data richness. Um, so many of these places like the Eel River, Mill River, and so forth, um, the data are just not, uh, we don't have a long enough time series or uh, the data warrant of a form that we could uh, use in this analysis. So, uh, so we've collated these data and this is just a graphical description of, uh, or depiction, escapement trends for Sant Coho, um, color coded by um, the source of escapement of values. Uh, this includes the uh, hatcheries and the Trinity River, uh, Klamath River, and uh, the Rogue River as well. In general, we see a decline um, in the 20 or so years in this uh, time series. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I'm getting ahead of this. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this that I was just speaking of with the trend in plus the hatchery populations. Okay, next slide. I assume Dr. O'Farrell is speaking. Hey, uh, Mike, we're, yes. we're, we're losing a lot of your audio. Can you start over on the slide? Sure. Um, let's try again here. Um, on this slide, um, I'm trying to depict uh, what the fisheries that impact, uh, the, what are the fisheries that impact Song Coho? Uh, we have ocean fisheries uh, that the council is familiar with. Uh, the impacts in ocean fisheries are largely incidental. Um, for instance, uh, there's no retention of coho allowed in California fisheries. There are also tribal fisheries in the uh, Klamath and Trinity Basins. There are mark selective sport fisheries in the Rogue Basin. And as I just mentioned, there's no coho retention allowed in California fisheries, although there is some illegal or mistaken harvest of coho um, in both the ocean and fresh water. Next slide, please. The work group has come up with a, um, a suite of controls, uh, initial control evaluate um, using the risk analysis uh, model that I'll be speaking about shortly. Um, I'm going to just walk through the, these control rules. The control rules one through seven are depicted on this slide. They're all in the form of constant impact rate or exploitation rate control rules. Uh, control rule one is a, uh, a total allowable ER of zero. This is just used as a reference to see how populations would respond in the absence of fisheries. Alternative two, uh, or control rule two, is a total ER cap of 7%. Three is an ER cap of 13%. And control rule four is a total ER cap of 26%. And in this case, total ER, uh, ocean and freshwater fisheries. Moving down to control rule five, 
Draw five. only of ocean exploitation rate. So control rule five is an ocean exploitation rate cap of 7%. Control rule six is a ocean exploitation rate cap of 13%. And this is the status quo um, management strategy for song. Or song, song. <laughs> song. And control rule seven is a ocean exploitation rate cap of 26%. Okay, um, control rules eight through 12 are abundance-based control rules. Um, they all have similar form each other uh, to each other. Maybe just to start the discussion, I'll just point out if we look at control rule eight and not worry too much about details, but just the, the shape of the line uh, depicting the control rule. Um, we have at the highest level of abundance a cap to the uh, to the exploitation rate to the total exploitation rate in this case. At some level of abundance, that um, exploitation rate is to a constant impact rate in the middle that flat middle section there. That would uh, be the exploitation rate that is a moderate levels of abundance defined as the middle 50% of past abundances in uh, base flow data. And um, that exploitation rate at low abundance ramps down from uh, that middle exploitation rate down to zero as abundance decreases. Sorry, I see it. I see a note that my, my uh, audio is going I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do about that. I've been tuning in all day and, and trying to, and it's been most good right now. Uh, the, the only suggestion would be to use your phone for audio rather than your computer, but that may uh, entail a, a brief delay. Okay. Uh, I uh, I can do that. I can call in. Yeah, I think this is pretty important and, and, and losing the audio. So do you know how to switch your audio from computer to phone? I think I can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. In the lower, um, in the lower uh, left corner next to the microphone, there's an up arrow and there's a, on the menu there, you can switch to phone audio. We'll stand by for a few minutes while you do that. Okay. Why don't we just take Thank a, a five-minute break here, come back at 2.08 um, and uh, with Mike on phone audio.
Hi, this is uh, Mike. Can I get a uh, check on the, my sound this time? Hey, Mike, Chris Clinch, we can hear you loud and clear now. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks, Mike. We'll get started in a minute here as soon as the uh, clock hits 208. Sounds good. All right, it's 2.08, so if we can bring um, the presentation back up and Dr. O'Farrell can continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Apologies again for my uh, audio troubles on over here. Um, I'm going to return to uh, this slide we're on right here with the preliminary control rules 8 through 12. Um, again, on the on the top, uh, we have control rule eight, and uh, I, I will. I'm just going to restate briefly um, what I ended, uh, finished, was starting to finish talking about before um, we took a little break there, uh, and that is the general form of these control rules that you find on this page. This stair step sort of uh, form. Uh, if I'm looking at uh, control rule eight, the top left. Uh, 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 box there, but you can see is there are two constant in exploitation rates, um, a high one at 25% and a medium one at 15%. Um, these are the, at the high level, that is a maximum allowable exploitation rate at high abundance. Um, that gets reduced down to a uh, moderate exploitation rate at a moderate level abundance, which uh, in this case is defined as the middle 50% of all past abundances for the particular component of the ESU. And then below that, um, below that, uh, for the lower 25% of the abundance uh, levels seen in the past, the exploitation rate um, gets ramped down um, from 15% to zero. So that's the general form of the control rules um, on this page here. Um, uh, for control rule eight, uh, that's depicted in the four uh, cells on the very top of this slide here. We have separate control rules for the rogue aggregate, the Klamath aggregate, which uh, includes uh, the bogus Scott and Shasta, the Trinity aggregate, and uh, Freshwater Creek. And uh, for uh, this control rule to be met, each of the uh, different components of the control rule uh, would have to have exploitation rates that um, lie at or below uh, what's specified for that particular um, component. Control rule nine is in the, in the middle row of, uh, from the, of this slide. It's the same as control rule eight with the exception of there is a Klamath Trinity aggregate. So essentially the Klamath aggregate and the Trinity aggregate are added together. And this would uh, approximate what we do for Klamath River Falls Chinook right now, where um, the Klamath and Trinity Rivers are um, are not managed separately. We have a Klamath River Falls Chinook stock that um, is is the sum of uh, returns to the, the entire Klamath Basin, including the Trinity River. Moving down to the bottom left-hand corner, uh, control rule 10. 
This is a fully aggregated abundance based control rule where um, the total ER is based on the total abundance of the Rogue, Klamath, Trinity, and Freshwater uh, Creek uh, aggregate. Control rule 11 is identical to control rule 10, with the exception of the fact that uh, control rule 10 is, is specified in terms of a total exploitation rate, while control rule 11 is specified only on the basis of an ocean exploitation rate. And finally, um, control rule 12, that doesn't exist yet. Um, we are keeping a placeholder here for develop potential development of a matrix-based control rule like we have for um, Oregon Coast Natural Coho. Next slide, please. This table uh, just summarizes the attributes of these control rules that I just described. Um, again, um, we have uh, constant exploitation rate control rules and uh, abundance-based control rules, N-based, meaning abundance-based, and a placeholder for the matrix-based uh, control rule. Uh, we have different levels of components that contribute to um, harvest controls with these suite of control rules. Uh, we have different types of exploitation rates uh, specified, both ocean and freshwater. And um, on the right-hand side here, this table, we show the um, range of exploitation rates um, allowable under these different control rules. Next slide. To evaluate these control rules with regard to the effect on fisheries and the effect on um, the salt coho ESU, uh, we are uh, putting together a risk assessment model. Uh, the risk assessment model uh, that we are um, working with right now is likely familiar to some council members. Um, this is the same approach that has been used for other uh, um, working groups uh, associated with forming new uh, control rules for Tuvalu Chinook and uh, Lower Columbia River Natural uh, Coho, um, at least the same basic uh, um, machinery of, of the model. In this case, um, this, this model is a form of a population viability analysis. It's uh, simulating a population forward in time. Um, there's a stochastic stock recruitment uh, relationship that is underpinning the population dynamics here. Um, we're taking into account um, uh, fisheries and um, uh, hatcheries and all sorts of other components into uh, the simulation approach that will allow us to ultimately um, make some inference about how control rules would contribute to either conservation or decline of um, populations within the ESU and what the effect on fisheries would be relative to status quo. The model uh, is run several times and we're able to get um, uh, uh, results that are um, that reflect averages or certain percentiles of um, different runs. And I think that'll be, become a little bit clearer um, with the next slide, which I would like to move on to now, if that's okay. All right. The key components of this uh, model, some of the key compo components are productivity and capacity of the populations for which we have data. Um, on the left-hand side, the figure on the left-hand side here is a depiction of uh, three um, generic uh, stock recruitment relationships, uh, Beverton Holt stock recruitment relationships. And uh, one, but the green or top line there would be a population that has higher productivity and higher capacity versus uh, the blue line on the bottom has, is a population that has low productivity, relatively speaking, and, uh, and lower capacity. Another important feature of um, the, this risk assessment modeling uh, that will be built into the process is a um, depensation. Uh, for a typical uh, 
Everton Holt stock recruit relationship, as the number of spawners goes down, the productivity in terms of recruits per spawner goes up. However, um, in case in cases where the populations are very small, there may be uh, Pali effects where uh, productivity decreases at low abundance, perhaps because um, fish can't find mates or other reasons. And so this is directly um, um, modeled uh, or incorporated into the modeling so that with depensation, what we see is a, 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 at low, a very low abundance as the recruits uh, per spawner the productivity decreases. Next slide. And this is a, these are some extremely preliminary results um, based on uh, uh, early model runs for the uh, for constant uh, exploitation rate control rules. And so um, we have a uh, some of the populations from within that I had spoken to before: Bogus Creek, Trinity River, Scott River, Rogue River, and Freshwater Creek. Um, and in addition, we have here three generic populations, A, B, and C. And on the x-axis of this, of this uh, plot, we have fixed exploitation rates. And then um, on the y-axis, we have risk, 100-year 100, 100 risk. And in this case, we're, um, the risk uh, is defined as fall, the abundance falling below a um, a a threshold level. And um, what we can see here is that some of these populations um, show relatively or very high levels of risk under even low fishing mortality rates, um, while others um, are, are more resilient under different um, fishing rates. Um, the, at, at, some, at some point, at, you know, as you ramp up the fishing mortality rate, the risk is going to go up. And, uh, and we see that in all of these cases here. Um, but uh, the response uh, differs between the populations and uh, uh, both the populations that we have data on and then these generic populations that we've included for um, uh, for some contrast. And I will just I just want to say that these results are extremely um, uh, preliminary. Uh, there's still work to be done on estimating the uh, productivity and capacity for the populations uh, in the Sonk ESU and further uh, work on the model. But this is just an illustration of the type of results that um, we can obtain um, using this risk assessment approach. Next slide. So to summarize, um, the work group has uh, assembled and checked data. That, that took a, a fair amount of time. Um, the data wasn't in a centralized location um, and all ready to go when the work group was formed. And so there was a pretty large um, investment of time and effort um, by work group members to pull all this together. Um, the work group has put together an initial suite of control rules. And uh, there has been a very preliminary risk assessment uh, model uh, parameter parameterized and um, some early runs have been made. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, a uh, similar approach has been used for other salmon stocks um, that the council is familiar with. Uh, the risk assessment has not been applied to all control rules yet. It hasn't uh, been implemented for the abundance-based control rules at this time. And we anticipate that there's going to be substantial changes to the results with more work. Um, and again, uh, what I'm presenting here today uh, should be thought of as an illustration of the approach and, and not um, uh, something to base decisions on at this point. Um, I do want to note that progress has been slow due to, due to a variety of factors. Um, I think that uh, we're all struggling with uh, working in the, the COVID state, and uh, that certainly has affected things. That, and in addition, we've had some trouble with the fires in Oregon and California. And, uh, directly or indirectly affected um, many of the work group members. Next slide. This is my last slide. Um, we, we do want to outline some next steps um, 
our next meeting, the work group uh, meets next in, uh, Jan on January 5th of, I sh that should be 2021 there instead of 2020. Um, and uh, leading up to that meeting, uh, we're gonna review council guidance, whatever council guidance we get here, revise the range of alternative control rules as appropriate. Uh, we're gonna continue looking into uh, the feasibility of forecasting abundance and continued development of the risk assessment model and application to each of the control rules. In the spring of 2021 um, and the April council meeting, the work group uh, will be reviewing the preliminary results with advisory bodies and the council, uh, considering revisions or additions to harvest control rules. And um, the council is slated to adopt a range of alternatives as a preliminary preferred alternative as appropriate, I believe, at the April council meeting. Uh, for the summer and fall of 2021, uh, and to revise alternatives, uh, given council guidance and update the risk assessment, uh, continue to solicit input from the salmon advisory sub panel and stakeholders. Uh, September council meeting, uh, provide a progress update if needed, and uh, we're slated for final action in November of 2021. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, try to answer any questions the council might have. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, questions of Mike on his presentation on the progress of the work group. Chris Kern. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a couple of questions, if I could, um, for Dr. O'Farrell. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for the presentation and for the work group uh, efforts. I know it's been quite a bit of work so far um, and uh, understand why uh, some of it's delayed. Um, I recall back in the lower Columbia Coho process, which was very similar to this uh, from a modeling perspective, um, and really kind of across the board for coho uh, is a very broad statement. It seems, you know, we typically envision those populations as being highly environmentally driven, not entirely, of course, but, but a big component of it. Um, and so one of the things I recall that we used in that process was some proxy for survival uh, um, could be done in with conceivably with environmental variables instead of uh, necessarily a, a, a fish centric metric, which I think in the Columbia we used uh, jack return uh, rate as a proxy of survival, but conceivably um, much like the OCN forecast, uh, Oregon coast forecast, we could potentially incorporate environmental variables. The one sort of hang up with that is potentially the size of the data sets that we're trying to fit that to. Um, has the work group talked about those kinds of approaches either as uh, they could go in a couple places, they could either be a forecast tool or they could actually be a tool for sort of uh, helping set actual exploitation rates uh, in and of themselves in some way. Has the work group talked about that sort of approach and uh, kind of um, written it off or kept it on the list or anything in between? Uh, thank you, Mr. Kern. Uh, the work group has talked about it in very general terms. Um, I would say that uh, you know the, the efforts have been on just getting the population data together and seeing what we can do with that. Um, we do have the placeholder control rule um, for the you know, the matrix based control rule twelve that um, we are keeping as a placeholder there because it is something we do want to confront and see if there there is potential for um, including environmental variables or um, metrics of survival into the control rule. Um, but I would say that uh, we haven't been able to have substantial discussions about that uh, at this point. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Can I follow up with the second question? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Mike, if you could go to, uh, or, if, or if whoever's running the slideshow could go to slide 13. And I, first I'll say I totally recognize that this is a very preliminarily, uh, very preliminary figure. So I'm not, not looking for discussion of the results, but uh, you mentioned uh, briefly what the risk criteria itself was. Um, and it's uh, sort of the frequency that the population falls below a certain threshold. Um, and I don't need to know what the threshold numerically is because they're different, going to be different for each population. But can you remind me, is that um, falling below the threshold for some number of cons consecutive years? And is that a, a generation, uh, like three years? Metric? Yes. Uh, I, well, I don't want to mistakenly answer this. And I, because uh, I don't, I don't have real high confidence of uh, my answer, but I believe it is a, it is a generational value. It's a three-year value that is, um, that is used, and it's a proportion of simulations, at which uh, the, uh, we that threshold is crossed. Okay, thank you. I, I think the important part of my question was really, it's not a single-year metric. Uh, it's some numbers of years, so specificity on which was probably uh, secondary. I do think as a as a comment, um, I think this aspect is something that uh, the council is going to have to um, be able to wrestle with pretty well uh, in terms of assessing what different alternatives do from a risk standpoint. So um, as we move forward, um, you know, focusing on some description on that is probably going to be uh, necessary at some point, not today, of course, but uh, down the road. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. That was all I really had. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks very much, Susan Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Farrell, for the um, presentation. I found it very helpful, and I, you know, echo Chris's um, compliments to the work group and the, all the work that it's been able to achieve. Um, given the challenges of the not only the data itself, but also the um, working conditions sort of over the last several months. That's not exactly what we had in mind when we put together the terms of reference in the schedule. So I appreciate all the help that, you know, all the work that people had done with everything else going on in their lives and the agencies willing to uh, invest the time of their staff and put forward some real talent in tackling a really difficult issue here. Um, I did have a question on, I think it's slide 10. It's a table that has the different control rules with the exploitation rates associated with them. Um, could you just briefly um, discuss or describe how the uh, exploitation rates were chosen? Or th is this sort of a beginning place for the analysis and the intent is to refine it further with results? Or do these rates have another meaning? Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Bishop. Uh, the, this, these are very uh, preliminary. The, these uh, exploitation rates that were chosen here, there's one part of it that is the, well, for some of them, they do represent or they're, they're meant to approximate the status quo, a 13% ocean ER, and an exploration of what essentially what doubling and halving of that um, exploitation rate might mean for the population. So that's the that first what a, a set of control rules that go between, uh, you know, 7% to 13% to 26%. Um, the other uh, control rules, uh, there's no particular biological um, underpinnings in the values uh, selected uh, for the exploitation rates. Uh, these are meant as a starting point uh, for analysis. We didn't have enough time or the, the data were not really informative enough in the time we had uh, to decide, you know, whether there's biological basis for particular exploitation rates within the control rules. Not that that may not um, be uh, something we can do down the road, but um, that wasn't part of the consideration in crafting these preliminary control rules. Does that answer your question, Susan? Yes, that was very helpful. Thank you very much. 
All right, uh, further questions of Dr. O'Farrell. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands, any further hands, but I'm sure you'll stay close by if we, as we move into council discussion. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, I think we'll next hear from Richard Heap, the new chair of the SAS. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Uh, for the record, Richard Heap of the SAS. I'll be reading from agenda item F3A, the supplemental SAS report one, salmon advisory subpanel report on the Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Co Endangered Species Act consultation. The salmon advisory subpanel appreciates the work of the Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Coho work group and the progress report from Dr. Michael O'Farrell. Although impacts to Sonk Coho are largely incidental in ocean fisheries due to the retention prohibition in California, and marks left selective fisheries elsewhere, the SAS, SAS notes that impacts to these stocks are often a driver of ocean fishery management, particularly in the Klamath management zone. The SAS is encouraged by the initial development of technical tools and proposed harvest control rules, but feels that it is too early in the progress to begin assessing the alternative harvest policies. The SAS plans to stay engaged and look forward to providing stakeholder perspectives as the forecasting and risk assessment methods mature and the projected stock recovery and fishery impacts are better understood. That concludes our report. Thanks very much, Richard. Are there any questions of Richard? I'm not seeing any. Congratulations on your elevation to chair. Thank you. I was going to make a comment about the past chair, but I'll decline at this time. Uh, that completes, uh, as I see it, all of our report. And uh, I do not see any submissions for oral public comment. So, and I'm sure if I'm wrong about that, someone will correct me. So that takes us to council action, which is to consider this update and uh, I guess develop a range of alternatives or provide further recommendations to the work group. So uh, I will look to see who wants to get us started. It seems like a lot of work has been done, but there's still a fair amount of work to be done. And the work group has done its best, but obviously uh, life and events have interceded. Chris Kern. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'll take a shot at getting getting going here. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of work has been done. Again, appreciate all that. Uh, I had a kind of a short list of things that I thought I would throw out for potential consideration of, of future rec, you know, recommendations for what's next. The, the first being um, that I'm um, personally not um, in a place of trying to talk about narrowing any of these alternatives at the moment. Uh, they're very preliminary, as Dr. O'Farrell said. So I think the best thing from my perspective is let the work group continue to work through those um, and populate um, the models. Um, as they proceed, um, I would recommend uh, that they that the work group. Uh, it sounds like they will or or are, um, but spend some time looking into potential environmental variables. Um, I don't think the ones we used for the other models are probably appropriate because they're starting to get pretty geographically diverse from the populations we're talking about. So I wouldn't assume they would go the same direction. Specifically, we use a lot of Columbia data. Uh, for that other model. Uh, I'm not sure that's workable for this population. It could be, um, but I presume it's probably something else. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, try to guess at what those variables might look like. Um, but I think uh, some discussion of them, it may be that, as I tried to mention, um, we may not be able to find a good fit given sort of the base data for the populations that we're looking for. Uh, even if there is a, an underlying relationship, finding it could be difficult, but uh, some 
uh, evaluation of that and some discussion for the council to be able to see at some point uh, so that we can at least get a, a sense of what the limitations are there and, and whether it was workable or not. Um, and then um, another thing that I was thinking of as we talk about um, sort of the technical aspects of running the models, um, and I'm not really sure how this could be addressed. I, I think it would probably come in as sort of a management uncertainty sort of assessment during the modeling, but uh, we look at a 13% control rule, for instance, just as an example. Um, and the fact is that we have routinely come in well under that for the ocean fishery component. So um, when we model at a 13, we're actually modeling something that's more conservative uh, from a risk response than what current practice has been. Um, of course, that range varies from year to year as well. So we don't have a static um, half of that rate or other fraction of that rate to look at. So just throw that out there for the work group to consider. They probably already are, but um, some range around a target rate uh, to help us get our, our heads around what that means uh, seems useful. And as I mentioned before, the last one uh, would be um, looking to uh, see how the work group could probably, or, or could help define and describe what we're actually measuring as risk uh, and give the council some input on, on sort of how to think about that parameter um, will be helpful down the road, not needed today because uh, we're not there. But um, at some point, that that is something that I have found useful in the past. I think it would be good to put that on the radar. So, and that's all I had. Hey, Chris, thanks very much for the suggested guidance. It's very helpful. Further discussion or suggestions? Brett Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I really just have a couple of comments to this point. Um, but before I get to those, uh, I I also want to commend the work group for the progress that they've made thus far. Uh, this is an extraordinarily challenging uh, time to be embarking on such a meaty and substantial um, work group process this this particular one is uh going to require an immense amount of work if if all of the control rules that have been pro proposed thus far um are to ultimately be uh evaluated um so kudos to everyone who's contributed to that effort and gotten us as far as we have in the face of COVID and uh, evacuations and constantly having to move um, due to their homes being destroyed or made it uninhabitable. So um, that's, that's commendable. Um, as I said, just a few seconds ago, this, this, particular work group has a has a a huge uh task in front of them that they've only really scratched the surface of to this point um any of those abundance based control rules are going to require uh a forecasting tool for this ESU um which is no small thing uh, certainly not trivial whatsoever um and I do note that uh, we have a, a meeting scheduled for January for this work group, and they're scheduled to come back uh, and report to the council in April. Um, it's not complete and total overlay with the management cycle, given I'm, I'm not seeing anything on the proposed March agenda for the SOC work group. Um, but given the, the circumstances, some of the challenges we have in front of us for this management cycle, given uh, impacts from COVID-19 and, and data ga gaps that will ultimately um, manifest themselves through our uh, fishery management models. Um, I am expressing some concern about workload here, uh, particularly during the spring while we're trying to accomplish our uh, routine management um, goals, which are not trivial either. It's 
um, a very difficult and arduous process in a normal year, um, let alone given the circumstances we're faced with now. Um, and the target of November for a completion date, given the fact that we're behind um, and these other challenges will persist, um, is uh, commendable, but uh, perhaps something we should acknowledge may not be achieved. Um, however, I know the work group and, and everyone involved will do their best. Um, I, I also just note that uh, right now I'm not seeing anything planned for the June or the September council meetings uh, where the work group will be coming um, to report to the council or meeting during a council uh, scheduled council meeting as well. Um, so we have preliminary preferred scheduled for April, which is very, very, very soon to get that far. And then final preferred scheduled for November. Uh, so we may need to um, uh, make some adjust adjustments to the timeline here as we get further along um, and the challenges that we're facing and the workload that the council has to shoulder, um, including most of the staff uh, or many of the staff on this work group as those things uh, begin to um, prove out and ultimately uh, limit or not the progress of the work group as we move forward. One other comment that I wanted to make um, regarding the abundance-based control rules and in particular control, control rule eight and control rule nine, um, the department through the work group process has already expressed some concern for those particular control rules. They, uh, by design, um, are uh, multifaceted, meaning they have individual control rules for individual subpopulations or uh, aggregates in the case of the Klamath Trinity and Control Rule 9. Um, and that puts a tremendous amount of uh, stress and uh, commitment on the individual surveys that are providing those data uh, should we ever get to uh, an abundance-based approach and, and true evaluation or use of, excuse me, not, not necessarily evaluation, but eventual use or implementation of those control rules. Uh, most of those surveys are surveys that occur in the state of California. And as has been a theme, as of late, our resources are finite. Uh, we are, um, you know, already committed to a substantial amount of monitoring, evaluation, and assessment work to support uh, ocean fisheries management um, and ESA consultation or implementation of, of rules. Um, and adding this to the plate may be untenable. And I, th I think that we should take those concerns seriously. The department will continue to voice those concerns. Those surveys, while they do have a long, long enough time series of uh, actual escapement data as opposed to red surveys or something of that ilk, while they do have that, um, they have never had a management application before. Uh, they are not guaranteed to continue to go on um, year in and year out. Uh, there are current obligations that the state needs to fulfill and will prioritize. Um, and last, coho escapement and the the timing of of of, of these surveys um, is going to be extremely difficult relative to the the timeliness of the management cycle and and the inputs that are going to be required for that process uh, it it these these fish are spawning in the late fall and early winter um, these data may not even be available or being just barely available uh, under perfect uh, circumstances an ideal scenario 
when, uh, for example, the Klamath River technical team is sitting down to put together the the age specific escapement estimates that ultimately plug into the KOHM. Um, and so that's under ideal conditions. These data, these surveys have never been required to provide their estimates or generate data on that kind of a schedule. And uh, the expectation here will, you know, if we take those control rules seriously and ultimately move them forward for implementation, the expectation will be that those, those data are possible uh, and can or will be provided uh, under that time frame. And that's, that's a substantial leap um, in the eyes of my department at this point in time. Uh, so that, that summarizes my comments and my concerns to this point around those data uh, and those specific abundance-based control rules. Like I said before, you, we will continue to make these comments, um, continue to make sure people are cognizant of, what, of and aware of uh, these practical considerations and really um, probable limitations to those uh, management strategies. So thank you and uh, appreciate the opportunity to comment. Uh, thank you, Brett, for your comments and questions. Further discussion, guidance on this agenda item? Um, I know that we're behind on this, um, and we have some dates set forth on a timeline it's it's not clear to me how fixed the timeline is uh, is there someone from the work group who can um respond to that question uh i know that everyone's going to do their best to to get this done on the existing timeline but given as, as brett cormos pointed out given that we are behind and given that we're coming up on uh, a rather an especially difficult routine season setting process, I'm not sure we have the bandwidth to get caught up. We might even fall further behind, I don't know. Can someone help me out here? Perhaps not. Chuck. Susan is right. Uh, Susan? Susan Bishop? Susan, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, but I see your hand is up. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. For some reason, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, yeah. So, uh, Chair Gromick, are you asking sort of what are we committed to doing under the current work plan in terms of timeline, where we're required to do versus where we may have flexibility? Yeah, basically, you know, there is a, a there is an existing timeline, and uh, I know that there is also a there has been litigation. So I guess I'm trying to find out where we have some flexibility and where we do not. I'll, well, I can take a, a run at some of it, and others may have um, have something to add to it. Um, and I think Chuck's weighing in here would also be important. Uh, with regard to the timelines associated with the stipulated agreement and stay of the case, um, the three timelines that are in that uh, agreement were the um, uh, process description by NIMS last April, the adoption of the uh, workgroup process and formulation in June by the council, um, and then we're required to, or the council itself is required to 
uh, complete a, the control rule work by next November 2021. Uh, and then after that, NIMS, there's some uh, deadlines with regard to what NIMS has to do with that information. Um, but there are no timelines um, out within those sideboards that are part of the stipulated agreement. We do have a schedule, I think as Mike alluded, Dr. Farrell alluded to, uh, within the terms of reference that the council adopted um, that have the, the uh, work group meetings laid out, what tasks are accomplished at each of those meetings and then when, when we would report back to the council. Uh, and that's where the, the range of alternatives in March and preferred preliminary preferred alternative in April uh, come from. But those are not part of the those are not contained in the stipulated agreement itself. Um, so part of the question is, is given the council adoption of those terms of reference, maybe Chuck could help out in terms of what flexibility exists within that. Does that help? Yeah, that helped a lot. Thank you very much. Chuck. Sure, thanks, Susan. Yeah, that was helpful. Um, just, you know, um, Right now, maybe I should probably turn this over to Mike, but <laughs> but he'll he'll correct me if I'm wrong. But you know, um, what's laid out on the year at a glance uh, does have um, <clears throat> the uh, next step being a range of alternatives slash PPA in April, and then final action in November, both shaded, uh, which you know means uh, they could move around some. <clears throat> although I think it sounds pretty unlikely that um, we'd be able to extend beyond. November for final action. But in terms of, you know, <clears throat> if it's necessary to move the range of alternatives out, uh, we can certainly uh, do that um, to June uh, or September. And if we need to have, <clears throat> you know, an additional update, as I believe the work group recommended, uh, perhaps in September, um, uh, we could do that. Uh, we could split up range of alternatives and preliminary preferred. Uh, so all all of that's still uh, certainly on the table. Um, you know, I, I suspect the schedule especially this way largely to be uh, uh, your audio is uh, problematic. Chuck? Yep. Okay, let me plug okay. in something else. I'm not hearing it, Chuck. I'll get right back to you okay. in a second. All right, great. Didn't hear that part. <laughs> let me uh, let me switch here. Okay, can you hear me now? A bit better. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, you guys, you, yeah, you're breaking out. Well, Okay. Well, let's give that a go. Okay. Hopefully, you can hear me. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, well, I guess the bottom line is uh, we, we can move out uh, or add additional meetings between April and uh, September uh, in order to com accommodate those interim steps before final action in November. Uh, I think we probably avoided June and September because that's the time when most of the industry folks are fishing and it's uh, difficult for them to uh, uh, weigh in on uh, alternatives and uh, do that sort of thing, but uh, but we've done that in the past, and I'm sure we can do it again. Um, 
So I, I think we can build in some uh, some time to accommodate whatever steps uh, need to occur uh, prior to November. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Brent, did you have your hand up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I did, but uh, changed my mind, so thank you. Okay, very good. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. I think our, our goal, our task right now is to provide guidance because the work group will be meeting in January. We received some guidance from Chris Kern, thank you. And um, I'd like to see uh, if there's any further guidance. And if not, I'm gonna to turn to Mike Berner to uh, try to summarize where we are. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, like as you mentioned, we got some guidance from Mr. Kern and Mr. Cormos. Um, the work group scheduled to meet again in early January. Uh, I pr propose we see what comes out of that at the March meeting. Perhaps we could uh, have a discussion under future meeting planning as to what we do about April, whether we schedule that as more of another check-in, sort of like this one, and, and plan for either June or September uh, as another uh, touch base on this, as Mr. Tracy mentioned. But um, I, I don't think we have any further business on this that's required. Just in, if there's any other guidance, I'm sure the work group would be all ears. Otherwise, uh, I think they're set to proceed into the new year with this task. All right. Thanks for that, Mike. Is there anything further on this agenda item? Uh, I'm not seeing any hands. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mike Berner. Thank you. Um, so that concludes agenda item F3. It concludes salmon for this November council meeting. Uh, our next, uh, we'll next move into Pacific halibut. That will be uh, Brett Pettinger's, uh, we'll have the gavel for that. But we'll take a 10 minute break first. And we'll come back at 310. So we'll see you all there. We'll hand the gavel off to Brad and he'll get us back on schedule, right, Brad? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Melissa Haltuck, this is Chris. Want to do a mic check real quick? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Excellent. All right, go ahead and do a hand raise real quick. Make sure that works. Yeah. I will change no settings between now and Wednesday. Fantastic. Uh, let me find myself. Okay, do you see me? Yep, and then click it again to lower it. Perfect. We're good to go. Lovely. I will join you via this computer on Wednesday unless I hear otherwise. Fantastic. Have a good day. Thank you. You too.
All right, it's 310. We'll get started here in, a, in just a moment. All right. Let me hand the virtual gavel over to Brad Pettinger to get us going on agenda item E3. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Gorolnik, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Brett, uh, we're running a little behind here, so uh, you want to get us started on E3? I sure can. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'll make it quick. Just looking at agenda items, E3 situation summary. Just reviewing that real quickly here. Uh, the Directed Fishery has been obviously a discussion uh, between the IPHC and the, man and the Council over the past few years and changing management. We took action last week uh, to do that, final action to transfer management. And as part of the transition plan, the council agreed to utilize this uh, September, November cat sharing plan revision process to continue to solicit stakeholder input. We have adopted for public review two preliminary recommendations in the briefing book there. Uh, number one, the 10 hour periods and two, the 58 hour periods with some sub options regarding Monday through Wednesday openers or Tuesday through Thursday openers. We figured we'd take some action again here and forward our IPHC uh, for the recommendations here from the council to the IPHC for consideration as they have their interim meetings and their annual meetings November and January. So, so uh, we also had a discussion back in September, as you know, about the bycatch of yellow eye rockfish in this fishery for uh, the, the year of 2019 data. There was some concern over that, of course. The council asked National Marine Fisheries Service to provide a little bit of report on the that bycatch from that fishery and to give any thoughts on that. So looking at the council action we have here to adopt the final recommendations to the International Pacific Halibut Commission for the 2021 directed fishery season structure. So we're focused on those periods of time that we want to recommend. So in the briefing book, we do have that NEMS report that summarizes the bycatch from the uh, previous years, observed bycatch and and some data in that table helps provide some context about observer rates and things like that. I would look to probably Frank Lockhart uh, to give a summary of that or take questions on that. We do have a WDFW report in the book. We have a supplemental IPHC report, which I can summarize. We have a supplemental SAS, GAP, and EC report. We also have four public comments in the, in, uh, the briefing book as well. So that's the overview of the information that's here. Uh, I can take some questions on that overview. If not, then I think we could turn to the NIMS report and then move to the IPHC report and then the state reports as such. Okay, thank you, Brett. Um, so NIMS report, uh, Frank, uh, well, anything to, to add here? Um, yeah, um, just first of all, mic check, can you hear me? Um, absolutely. Yep. Uh, excellent. Okay. So I'm not going to read the NIMS report. It's there in in your uh, uh, briefing book, agenda item E3A, NIMS report one. But I would like to say a, a couple of additional things just as a way of further background and how we got to that report. So uh, as um, Brett um, read, the uh, uh, there was a request to provide more information on um, the yellow eye rockfish uh, catch uh, for this meeting. And uh, so since then, NIM staff from uh, West Coast Region and Northwest Fishery Science Center staff have uh, examined the uh, available data. We were somewhat constrained in what we could say by confidentiality pr provisions, but um, just wanted to give you kind of the background uh, on this report. So. Um, all we have in the way of final data right now is from the 2019, uh, 18, and 17 uh, fisheries. Uh, 2020 data is not uh, available yet and won't be for a while. Um, 
And so that's what we looked at. And looking at the hall level observer, observer data did not reveal a clear explanation for the difference in yellow eye bycatch between um, 2019 and the prior two years. So, um, you know, the, the table shows that there were a higher number of participants, but also a higher catch limit. Uh, the percent observer coverage varied across the three years with the highest percent of observer coverage having the lowest estimate, estimated uh, yellow eye bycatch. And uh, just kind of overall, the raw data did not just seem to show any particular location or depth having a higher bycatch than others. And, and yellow eye catch was observed on all three of the 2019 openers. Um, some vessels that caught yellow eye in 2019 had observer coverage in past years and did not catch uh, yellow eye. Um, so uh, I can't really go into a whole lot more detail there, but we've looked at the data uh, and we don't see a trend that would um, call for an immediate action by, by the council at this time. And um, so uh, we were because of the time and the confidentiality concerns, we weren't really uh, able to put together a more thorough analysis. Um, and uh, so there really, in conclusion, there really wasn't enough data to draw any conclusion. So that, um, you know, at the um, end of our report, we make a recommendation um, or we conclude that we can go ahead and uh, wait until next year and uh and bring in the 2020 data more completely and then the council can um explore whether or not to take action based on that so um at, that concludes uh, my, my comments and so i can take questions on my comments but also if there's any questions on the report i believe uh Catherine blair is on and can answer those as well so that's it uh mr vice chairman um, thank you, Frank. Um, questions for Frank? Okay, uh, seeing none, um, go back to Brett and uh, for the uh, condensed IPHC uh, report. Brett? Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Just turning my attention to agenda item E3A, the supplemental IPHC report. We put this in the briefing book. It's one small section. I just want to point people to that down in the, on the first page in the section of discussion, there is no change is recommended for IPHC regulatory area 2A for 2021. So that at this point, the IPHC is, is not uh, going to change directions. At this point, they stick with the 58 hour period openers as we had conducted in 2020. So that's the only uh, point I wanted to make for that attachment. Oh, okay. Thank you, Brett. Um, questions for Brett? Oh, Phil Anderson. Phil? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> thanks, Brett. I think it's important to point out that what the, that this is, the, the IPHC Secretariat, the staff is not proposing any changes. This, this does not mean that the Commission has considered the matter uh, and made any recommendation, and I think there's a there's a, a significant distinction between the two that I wanted to bring to the attention of the council. Okay, thank you, Phil, for that uh, clarification. So, um, any other questions or comments? Okay, with that, we'll go to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife report, and that'll be um, uh, Heather Hall. Heather. Thanks, Vice Chair. Um, I'll just summarize uh, the WDFW report um, that we submitted under this agenda item. Um, it basically reflects the input we heard from our stakeholders at uh, two different um, meetings, public meetings that we held, one in August and then one again in October um, to go over the range of alternatives that the council adopted in September. Um, one of the things that we mentioned in, in September that we talked about a little bit again um, at our our October meeting was the um, 
flagging the low landing limits, especially in the beginning of the season as a, as a concern for our um, Washington participants. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, we also talked a little bit about um, the idea of allowing split deliveries um, so that uh, fishermen can um, sell to multiple buyers. And we uh, had the benefit of having Captain Chadwick at that meeting and explain that um, the rule that requires continuous offloading really just requires that all the fish um, are landed at the same time. But under the rule, they can still split their load um, using a uh, a fish ticket for the halibut that's sold at the cannery and then a separate transportation ticket that would allow them to sell um, directly from the boat or for other reasons. So um, that explanation was really helpful for um, our stakeholders. In terms of recommendations for a fishing period, um, again, uh, we, as we heard in September, um, interest in avoiding a fishing period that starts on Monday. Uh, and so the preference was for a fishing period that begins at 8 a.m. on Tuesday. And um, we talked a lot about um, some of the issues that we heard relative to uh, constraints that buyers might have if we if we did a fishing period that ran from Tuesday through Thursday. So maintaining the 58 hour period and uh, we'd heard from one of our buyers that that would create some difficulties um, in terms of getting um, halibut to the market. And so through that discussion, we ended up with a recommendation in our report for a two-day, 34-hour fishing period, again, starting on Tuesday, but ending at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Um, and this, this recommendation also aligned with what we had heard from the enforcement consultants report and um, our fishermen had, had talked a little bit about um, how beneficial um, the full three days was. I wanna say here too that um, the, the most important thing we heard at the, at the two meetings was really the beginning of the period starting on Tuesday and there was while we ended up with the recommendation in the report for a two-day fishing period, there was less, um, you know, folks didn't have any problem with the three-day fishing period, uh, but just thought that they would be all right with a two-day fishing period if it provided um, the enforcement consultants a, a little bit better ability to monitor the fishery and resolve the, um, the buyer concern. And then, um, Finally, you know, as we talked about a little bit before, there was um, just general input to that IPHC uh, that suggested there might be a way to improve the way that landing limits are established so that, um, you know, when folks request a license for the directed fishery, it's somehow based on um, folks that actually participate um, in the fishery rather than just the number that request a license. So that's the summary of our report and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Heather. Um, questions for Heather. Okay. Well, seeing none, um, thank you, Heather. We'll go to uh, Megan Mueller uh, and the SES report. Uh, Megan? Thank you very much. This afternoon, I will be, I'm Megan Waters, uh, Mueller Waters something, it, I'm both. Um, I'll read agenda item E3A, the supplemental SAS report one, salmon advisory sub panel report on non-Indian commercial directed fishery regulations for 2021. The SAS was provided with an overview of the area 2A non-Indian commercial directed Pacific halibut fishery, the directed fishery structure options for 2021 by Mr. Brett Whitehoff. The SAS supports the current regulations with the Monday through Wednesday 58 hour fishery period and the International Pacific Halibut Commission recommendation of no change as presented in E3A supplemental IPHC report one. 
The longer duration, 58-hour directed fishery created a safer environment and greater entry opportunities for smaller vessels, as well as opportunities to find productive fishing grounds relative to the 10-hour fishing period. Confusion over days and landing limits has been worked out because the fishery has adjusted to the updated structure. Thank you. That concludes the SAS report. Thank you, Megan. Uh, questions for Megan on the SAS report? Okay. Seeing none, and uh, I'll get your uh, your last name uh, right next time, Megan. So thank you. Okay. Um, next up is um, the GAP report, and I believe uh, Harrison Ibach. Harrison? Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Harrison Ibach. Reading agenda item E3A, Supplemental GAP Report. The Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on Non-Indian Commercial Directed Fishery Regulations for 2021. The Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel received an over, overview of the 2021 Pacific Halibut Catch Sharing Plan from Mr. Brett Wyadoff, Pacific Fishery Management Council staff, and offers the following comments and suggestions. The GAP also reviewed the reports from the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, the International Pacific Alba Commission, Supplemental Report 1, and the SAM Advisory Subpanel, and offers the following comments. Consistent with our agenda item 1I3A September statement on this issue, we support the option 2 as listed in the situation summary, a 58-hour season instead of a 10-hour season, and sub-option 2, Tuesday to Thursday openings. The 58-hour season offers more flexibility and safety for the fleet. Additionally, as we suggested in our September 2020 report, the Tuesday to Thursday openers would allow for more flexibility in purchasing ice and supplying fresh halibut to weekend markets. The GAP considered the question of potential gear conflicts when the recreational all-depth halibut openings on Thursdays overlap with the commercial openings. Changing the all-depth halibut days for the sport fleet would disrupt the custom fishing periods, but both sport and commercial fishermen agreed the overlapping day may not be an issue and suggest trying it in 2021. The states could provide some advance notice to both sectors to remain cognizant of the potential for both fleets to be fishing in the same general area. Lastly, the GAP also continues to support the proposal for split deliveries or split loads as identified in our September statement. Regarding the NIMS report on yellow eye, the GAP is very concerned that yellow eye bycatch in the halibut fishery could lead to constraints in the targeted halibut fishery and other ground fish fisheries if left unchecked. More timely information for this fishery is necessary. Waiting a year for data essentially means no data is available to inform the subsequent year's halibut fishery. If yellow eye bycatch is tracking high, no in-season management measures can be taken to mitigate bycatch. Yellow eye has been a constraining species for both sport and commercial fisheries since it was originally listed as overfished, and we are on track to reach the target date of 2029. To risk this success, we have gained through years of sacrifice is conscionable. The GAP would like to see more timely reports of yellow eye bycatch during the year so management measures can be taken if needed. Understanding where the yellow eye is being caught, whether deeper than 100 fathoms or shallower than 30 fathoms, is crucial. Members of the GAP suggested that fishermen include the amount of yellow eye bycatch in the comments box section of the ETIX when the halibut is landed. That could provide a simple way to estimate yellow eye bycatch in season. This may be a situation in which the rebuilding paradox, interaction with yellow eye rockfish, is increasing as the stock biomass also increases, leaves us in a position of management uncertainty. That level of uncertainty will decrease as we obtain more solid data and the fishery transitions to NIMS management. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Um, questions for Harrison? Marcy Remco, Marcy? Thank you, Harrison. Uh, regarding the suggestion that maybe fishers can include the amount of yellow eye bycatch in the comments box section of the etix. Um, did you discuss this at all with nymphs? And if so, um, was your intent that this be a voluntary measure uh, or a measure that nymphs might uh, establish by a regulation? 
Um, thank you, Marcy, for the question. Um, initially, it was discussed as a potential voluntary measure, um, but then discussion further led into it potentially could be something that um, IPHC or um, the council, um, once they take over, or NIMPS, for example, when they take over the fishery could potentially um, create a law to make it mandatory. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Vice Chair, if I may, just a quick follow-up. Please. Did, did NIMPS, Harrison, uh, thank you. Um, did NIMS provide you any feedback on um, by when um, they might be able to accomplish this or what mechanism um, they would recommend? I'm sorry, Marcy. <clears throat> I was incomplete with my first uh, answer to your question. Um, I would say no, we have not gotten direct feedback from NIMS um, regarding this, uh, this idea. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Harrison. Uh, next up is the uh, EC report uh, with Greg Bush. Greg? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be reading the agenda item E3A, Supplemental EC Report 1. And my name is Greg Bush. I'm the chair of the EC with NOAA Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement. And I'll be reading the Enforcement Consultant Report on Non-Indian Commercial Directed Fishery Regulations for 2021. The Enforcement Consultants have reviewed the material with agenda item E3, Non-Indian Commercial Directed Fishery Regulations for 2021, and have the following comments. The EC submitted statements in November 2019 and again in 2020 regarding regulations pertaining to the non-Indian commercial directed fishery and again requests the council consider the following. The EC recommends the fishery consist of no longer than two day openers in order to provide dedicated enforcement effort, such as 34 hour opener with proposed start of 0800 hours in the first day and end time at the second day at 1800 hours. During a recent public meeting noted in E3A Supplemental Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Report 1, November 2020, stakeholders expressed support for a two-day openers. The public support comes from being able to take ice on a Monday and fish Tuesday and Wednesday. This allows time to return to port, offload Wednesday night or Thursday to get the fish to market. It's important to reiterate that if a three-day sequence of openers, 58 hours, is permanently selected, Enforcement of the fishery will include random patrols and spot checks versus a dedicated enforcement effort like in the past years. Enforcement resource constraints prevent a pulse operation any longer than two days, which is of concern to this high value fishery. In regard to when fishery should begin, the EC supports starting the non-Indian commercial directed fishery for area 2A no earlier than the fourth Monday in June each year to limit overlap with the recreational fishery. The EC previously commented on split loads and would like to reiterate our comment from November 2019, agenda item F3, continuous offload. The EC strongly supports retaining the single continuous offload requirement. Multiple offload locations facilitate skirting the regulations and makes it challenging to track landing limits. Pacific halibut is the only species that requires a single continuous offload due to the individual value per fish of the species. The EC also would like to clarify that with a continuous offload requirement, fish can still be sold to multiple buyers, such as retail over the side sales. The halibut just needs to be offloaded at one location and all halibut weighed and reported on state fish tickets. The EC would also like to reiterate comments from November 2019 Agenda item F3 as follows. Length class, the EC recommends requiring the licensed length of a vessel to be the official length on the vessel's U.S. Coast Guard Certificate of Documentation or state certificate of number. Due to vessel size driving trip limits in the non-tribal non directed commercial fishery, there is a significant incentive for vessels to stretch up to the next 
length class using already established lengths from the U.S. Coast Guard and state regulations simplifies the process for enforcement and industry. Vessel monitoring systems, the EC recommends adding a requirement for vessels participating in any commercial halibut sector to carry BMS. This will facilitate enforcement, particularly given the shift to a longer non-Indian directed fishery and inability to otherwise determine the level of effort. Logs, the EC recommends removing the log exemption for Indian or for incidental Pacific halibut fishing during the salmon troll season. 72 hour preseason closure and hold inspection. The EC recommends retaining the 72 hour preseason closure and hold inspections. And finally, for seabird avoidance measures, the EC observed confusion amongst the fleet this past summer as to when the regulations required them to deploy seabird avoidance gear. The EC recommends that seabird avoidance gear be a requirement when participating in non Indian directed commercial area 2A halibut fishery regardless of whether a vessel retains ground fish. That concludes my statement. Take any questions. Thank you, Greg. Um, questions for Greg on the EC statement? Okay, oh, Mar uh, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, on the recommendations that you reiterate from your November, 2019 report. So this would be the um, length class and using the UCG Coast Guard document, um, the VMS uh, recommendation, the log uh, recommendation, um, seabird avoidance measures. I'm just curious, this report indicates that you wanna reiterate these comments. Um, that to me indicates that you had an EC discussion on these items um, that was part of your uh, meeting this week. And I'm just wondering um, what um, discussion has ensued within National Marine Fisheries Service about how we take up any of these items and in what time frame um and how we make some progress on some of these uh looking forward um has NIFS had any discussions along those lines or did the ec discuss that this time through the chair thank you mr yuremko um we did not discuss specifically um regarding how NIFS could implement this during this meeting However, during prior EC meetings, we, we decided that we wanted to include these future items for consideration to, or I should say, to keep them in our report for consideration at the time when the council and NIMS takes over management of the fishery. And we look at reconsidering what regulations that we want to put in place permanently under the council um, process. So these are areas that we would like to see considered for future implementation and within the uh, regulatory process as we develop halibut regulations and take over management of the fishery. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions for Mark? Okay, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Greg, sorry, <laughs> thank you, Greg. Okay, um, seeing, uh, that concludes um, the reports, and uh, I believe we have zero public comment cards. So um, that will take us into uh, council action and discussion. Um, anybody want to get us started here? Um, Marcy Rimko, Marcy. Yeah, I, I guess I'd like to start with a little bit of discussion first, if, if that's all right. Please. Um, Great, okay. Um, just wanna follow up with the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, not so much on the report specifically, but on some um, additional discussions that um, we've had uh, with them regarding the yellow eye bycatch situation. Um, 
I guess my first question for NIMFS uh, would be, um, what is your response to the recommendation in the GAP report um, surrounding uh, a requirement that uh, yellow eye bycatch be recorded on an e-ticket uh, in the notes section? Is that viable from your standpoint at this at this time? Thank you. And, and that question is directed at uh, Frank. Uh, yes, thank you. Frank, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, thanks, Mr. Vice Chairman, and thanks, uh, Marcy. Um, um, well, I, I think uh, uh, right now there's no requirement um, for that in regulation. Uh, I think, you know, it could be something that would be added by a regulation. Um, but I, I think, uh, right, so I suppose it's viable if the council wants to do it and wants to take the time to kind of move on that. We haven't, we haven't really uh, um, begun to look at this uh, at, um, prior to this discussion. Uh, so, um, but it does um, occur to me, since this is on a landing ticket, I'm wondering if the states could potentially do this quicker than we could do it through the council process. Um, if it was really important, you know, if it was deemed to be an important uh, requirement. Um, uh, so I, you know, I don't know. It's, I guess it's, uh, you know, it's certainly something that could be done if the council wanted to pursue it, but I don't think it can just be done by us deciding that it's, you know, a good idea and, and making it a requirement. It would take a regulatory process, I think, regardless of one sort or another. Uh, Martin? Yes, thank you, if I may. Please. Thanks. Um, okay, so um, following up on some of the sidebar conversation, Frank, that you and I were able to have um, since September, which I, I very much appreciate you taking the time to communicate with us about viable options and what um, might be available to us now. Uh, in preparation for the 2021 fishing season, um, acknowledging the NIMS recommendation that we collect another year of data before we evaluate um, potential management. Um, this discussion is about data collection, and not about management for 2021. Um, one of the things we talked about uh, last week uh, was an idea that came forward during a California delegation discussion, uh, which um, would be uh, rather than consider a requirement to record yellow eye uh, bycatch and discard on a fish ticket, what about um, a requirement that that information be recorded on the IPHC logbook. Um, were you able to investigate whether or not that is a viable um, path forward uh, at this time, recognizing that at this meeting today, we are making recommendations that the council will transmit to the IPHC regarding management of the 2A directed fishery and uh, my understanding is it's their regulations that establish the logbook requirement and what's uh, required to be recorded on the log. So um, I'm just wondering if you can provide us any more information on whether that is a viable path forward here and now. Frank? Um, I was not able to do any more research and I'm, I'm kind of looking to my chat screen to see if any of the staff were able to do that and answer that but um i'm not seeing any so um i guess i get i'm, I'm not sure if that's a viable path okay okay thank you frank um anyone else uh maggie summers maggie Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, I guess I'd like to follow up on the 
issue of uh, observer data um, with a, a question to Frank, if I may. Um, I'd like to just understand a, a little bit more if you have the information and are able to provide it on um, uh, w whether there is any opportunity, I guess, to change how the observer data is handling and, and providing information on yellow eye bycatch so that there, we are able to see that information earlier than uh, what you described, given that it is such a priority. And it seems like you know the data has been collected, so I understand it would be a change to the existing uh, protocols and timeframes for error checking, entering, processing, et cetera. Uh, but that seems like it might be doable from my perspective. So I'd like to understand more from you, please. Uh, if, if I may, Mr. Vice Chairman, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, uh, thank you, Maggie, for the question. And um, you have sort of read our minds. We have had some very preliminary discussions about that. Uh, with the observer program, um, it, it potentially like kind of a two prong thing. First of all, maybe expanding. Um, all of this is preliminary, by the way. Okay, so take everything I, I say with a grain of salt. We still haven't had the complete discussions here, but if we can explore uh, ways of perhaps getting the information into the system more quickly, I, I, we will look into that. I just can't, I don't. I don't think I can answer completely right now or definitively right now what we can actually do with regards to observer data. This observer data is used to expand for the whole fleet. So it's crucial that we don't <laughs> let out information that, um, you know, can, can potentially be, um, you know, um, misinterpreted. And so that's why the observer program is very cautious on how they present their observer data. That's why it takes a while. It's got to go through all that quality control. Uh, and plus, you know, the, the, the analysis on how to expand that. So it's, um, we're willing to explore that. And, you know, I think a council recommendation that we do so would, would, could be a good thing. Uh, but I can't commit certainly us, the region, and, and uh, even more so the center on uh, doing um, some specific thing. But it is something that we've already started to look into. Thank you very much. Okay. Further questions, comments, discussion? Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just make a comment, I guess, and maybe a question, but I, this this was really concerning to me. I mean, it just seems to me that the entire groundfish sector and non-groundfish sector were all dancing on pens on yellow eye bycatch, and particularly counting on this rebuilding uh, schedule. We kind of you know uh, relying on, and when I when I saw the that number seven point four two tons, I was going, wow, that's like not normal. And and then I uh, was listening to the gap and that, that word normal came up again. We normally don't have the data till the, you know, to that time limit, the fall of 2021. And I started thinking that uh, we potentially here <laughs> could go through an entire season, 2020, and not understand the actual bycatch and I compare that to other sectors where we do have data quicker than that to indicate what the issue is and it doesn't seem like this has anything you know the 7.42 tons and normal don't don't necessarily clash in the same sentence there's nothing normal about that it doesn't appear to be normal but if it's true and we go to a 58 hour season like we did in 2020 and we don't know 2021 until the season's over, we could be in a world of hurt here. And I just think uh, we should be taking extraordinary efforts to at least find indications of whether or not um, 2020 is similar to 2019 or is it like 2018? And it seems like that, that data should be somehow available to get indications anyhow to get that observer data. 
I know in other in the Whiting fleet, for instance, the C State gets that data almost the same time NEMS does. And I know it, it needs to be refined, needs to be debriefed and all that, but it gives you indications of what's going on. And it's it's helped us. Uh, when I looked at that number, I you know, I the thought that came to my mind is we've had emergency <laughs> council meetings for less than that. So I um, you know, for in in degrees of of seriousness here. So anyhow, that's my thoughts. And I just was wondering from uh, for maybe a possible question, is there a way to get at least some preliminary indications before we embark on a 2021 season, not knowing what happened on 20, uh, 2020. So that's, that's it. I stopped there. Thank you, Bob. Was that a question for, uh, for Frank? Yeah, if, he, if if it is, I mean, if you would, you know, could take a stab at it, that'd be great. Okay, Frank. Well, I'll uh, I'll take a stab at it, um, but it's not. It's going to be similar to my answer uh, to Maggie. Um, again, uh, you know, you guys are reading our minds, um, and uh, this is one of the things that we've had some preliminary conversations about. Uh, obviously, you know, we have the same concerns that you guys do. Yellow Eye, um, you know, Marcy referenced uh, some conversations. You know, every time I hear Yellow Eye, uh, I get a little twitch in my eye um, because of past experience. So uh, it is, you know, when I first heard about this, I had the same concerns that everybody is expressing uh, on this uh, call and also uh, in the gap. And so um, we are looking in to that and uh and by that i mean bob's idea of trying to get more timely information or at least uh, at least being able for nymphs to um perhaps internally monitor and if there's any worrisome signs uh, we could potentially figure out a way um to report on that rather than waiting until the end of the year you know yellow eye we don't want to go back to a situation where yellow eye um, is, um, you know, has the potential of exceeding its ACL. So again, I hate to say it, but we're looking into that. I don't have any final, uh, things that I can say right now, but we're definitely looking into it. Thank you. Okay. Further, uh, further comment. All right. Um, Frank, if I could, um, deal with the yellow eye um, issue. Is it would it be fair to say that um, would it be fair to say that um, the uh, observer, uh, YIPS observer, uh, visionary, whatever it is, um, has looked at, has the numbers, the rough numbers, albeit confidential, and that. Um, would it be fair to say that the um, if if the numbers were of triple what they were <laughs> in from last year's in 2019 that uh, NITS would be concerned and maybe doing a little more a little more proactive on this? It seems to me that um, or they would they potentially reflect a nor normal bycatch of yellow eye um, because it seems to me that uh, as Bob just mentioned a uh, a uh, length of the season uh, by by triple, you could do a lot of damage pretty quick if uh, those numbers would hold up. Um, I'm uh, well. While I'm waiting for the three little dots to stop blinking um, on my chat screen, uh, I will say that yes, if if this if the yellow eye catches were such that when there was a, a huge conservation issue or was going to shut down a significant portion of the fleet, that would have been something that the observer program would have brought to our attention. Um, and again, um, the, um, uh, I think the way to approach this is that we are, um, looking, looking into this and, uh, we, um, if, if there's a way that we can kind of release kind of some numbers, you know, you know, just, well, I don't even want to say that. I mean, we're looking into what we can say about this, but if it was such that, the, the landings were going to certainly exceed the ACL or have huge impacts on other fisheries. Uh, we we would uh, we would be more proactive on that. So I think I'll just have to leave it there. 
Okay, thank you. All right, further discussion? Or may I dare ask for a motion? Tough crowd this afternoon. Um, aha, Marcy. All right, I guess I'll kick this off here. Um, I'm going to tackle one part of it. Um, thank you. I guess, uh, Sandra, I believe you have the language uh, of a motion, CDFW motion that I provided you. Thank you. I move that the council recommend that IPHC require participants in the area 2A directed commercial fishery record on the IPHC fishery logbook the number of yellow eye rockfish caught and discarded on a haul or trip. The council shall also request that IPHC share that information with NIMS each year prior to the start of each November PFMC meeting. Next paragraph. Recognizing there are existing in-season processes and numerous coordination activities already undertaken by NIMFs, IPHC, tribes, and the states to track halibut catch in-season against the respective 2A fishery quotas, I also move the Council direct NIMFs to provide information on yellow eye bycatch witnessed by observers in the directed commercial halibut fishery to collaborating two-way agencies in season, following each directed commercial fishery period open opener. Also, direct NIMS to include this information in its report on fishery progress that is supplied to the council each September. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Does the um, language on the screen accurately reflect your motion? Yes, it does. Thank you. You have a second, and I see Bob Dooley. Thank you, Bob. Okay, Marcy, please uh, speak to your motion. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, I appreciate this discussion. And Frank, I appreciate um, you uh, feeling our, um, our interests here and are looking at solutions internally. And um, I just wanna make sure that um, we leave no mistake as to what um, our intentions are um, I think we're all feeling like uh, we need to do better with reporting in 2021. Um, and if there's something that we can do now to make sure that we get better reports in 2021, um, I for one um, want to make sure that we take that action um, clearly here today. Um, I realize that um, the current uh, one-year lag in WITGOP, um, that's, you know, we're not going to get in-season bycatch estimates, but I believe there is information that we can get that will help us all feel better that this fishery um, is maintaining um, itself within the specifications and accountability measures that we've set up for yellow eye um, and that they will not be exceeded. Um, I'm just feeling like there's a big need to improve transparency. Um, while I appreciate uh, NIMS's need to protect confidentiality and the challenges surrounding small data sets, uh, patchy distributions, low coverage numbers, um, not a lot of coverage um, out of, well, coverage out of multiple ports, but, you know, not too many occurrences, not too many observers out of, uh, you know, in a single port. There are all kinds of confidentiality concerns and um, summarizing the data um, is a very um, critical um, legal need that uh, your agency um, must ensure is done properly. I completely appreciate that. 
Um, originally, when I first contacted NIMS, I was asking all of the same questions I think the GAP did about can't you stratify these occurrences by depth? Can't you tell me if there were areas that were hot spots? Um, is there anything you can tell me? Um, and really, the answer was we can't tell you anything more than what we told you in the report. And um, I, I appreciate that, um, but I guess if that's going to be the case, then what is it that I can do to at least make sure that we get something in a more timely manner? Um, I heard uh, Frank say that uh, his staff didn't have time to pursue the questions surrounding the IPHC logbook and the viability of implementing um, a requirement through the IPHC regs to report yellow eye. Um, all I can say is that I feel like I need to try. I need to ask um, our council to act to make a recommendation to IPHC. Doesn't mean the IPHC is gonna accept it, um, but I feel like um, I need to, un you know, un turn over that stone and, and try. Um, similarly, I've heard a, a, you know, a commitment from NIMPS to look at options with regard to more timely um, submission of observer data to us, but there was, you know, no commitment that could be made here today. So, um, again, I feel like what we can do is ask and say that um, this information really is critical to our, um, to some of the fundamentals of the council process and the negotiations that we have all took part in over the years to live within our means on yellow eye and to share um, and hold our fisheries all to very restrictive uh, limits that um, are down to the 0.1 metric ton. Um, I, you know, I've been um, listening to a lot of discussion on this topic from our stakeholders um, since the September meeting and a lot of, a lot of questions, a lot of what is it that we can do um, because this is so foundational um, to everything that we do um, in our ground fish management. Um, I think the gap really knocked it out of the park in their comment that um, really the the issue that the ACL was not exceeded in 2019, that's not the point. The point is that we all share in the goal to keep our rebuilding on track. And T-Target is what T-Target is because of the hard work and the sacrifices that have been made around the council table these last two decades. And to risk the success uh, having that we've gained uh, through these years of sacrifice really is unconscionable. So I realize there's not a lot we can do in terms of actively um, recommending changes to the fishery structure or depth or any of those types of things this year. That's not, that's not in the cards. Um, but I do feel like there are two things that we can do now to increase the reporting, uh, the likelihood of getting timely reports uh, in 2021 um, that will um, ease our um, conscience a little bit and um, put us um, feeling a little more comfortable about the performance of the fishery uh, in 2021. Thank you. Uh, Frank Lockhart, Frank. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, the uh, um, it, Marcy actually answered most of my questions that I had uh, in her um, um, speaking to her motion. But um, I, I guess what I would just say is that I, I think the, the motion is making loud and clear, as well as some of the, the discussion prior to this. Uh, but it's loud and clear that the council is very interested in exploring ways to. Uh, collect appropriate information as well as potentially have that information be available in a more timely manner. 
Um, and I think we understand that. So the, 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 uh, uh, the motion certainly gets at that. Um, I, I will say that like I, um, discussed, um, before there are some confidentiality concerns and we also want to be very cautious about any numbers we put out that are preliminary that could potentially be misinterpreted. Um, and so while I understand the motion and am supportive of the general direction of the motion, I think this is going to require more discussion internally between us and the Science Center uh, before we potentially have a path forward on this. So not really a question, just a comment on the motion. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, Heather Hall, Heather? Thanks, Vice Chair. Um, this is a question for Marcy. Um, and first, Marcy, I, I appreciate your um, effort to, to try to find a, a way to get some more information. And I um, definitely appreciate your comments on relative to the hard work that, that everyone has done for every fishing sector um, when it comes to yellow eye rockfish. Um, but, but my question is um, actually more simple. And I noticed that in the, um, the first paragraph where um, we're asking that IPHC um, record in the logbook, but that the council will request that the IPHC share that with NIMPS prior to the start of the November council meeting. But then relative to the observer data, we're asking for um, the way this is written that it would be the information would be provided um, in September, and I'm just curious of why those two deadlines are different. Marcy, sure. Um, thank you, um, Heather, for the question uh, through the vice chair um, regarding the IPHC fishery logbook data. Um, Again, this would be a recommendation from the council to IPHC that it require this on their logbook. Um, that would mean that IPHC would then um, own that record and there would be issues surrounding data sharing that I'm presuming NIMS and IPHC probably work through anyway, but I wouldn't want to presume um, that the information could be made available to NIMS um, any sooner than um, November. Um, I, I honestly just picked November because I felt like that information that or that would be the last point in time that our council would be able to consider the information um, based on the new schedule that we've adopted with regard to making recommendations for management of the directed fishery. Um, now that we've set up the September, November schedule, um, November is the absolute last time that, you know, information entering our discussions would be of value. So um, that was why um, that was selected. Um, with regard to the second paragraph and the reporting that um, takes place from NIMS um, in our materials for the September briefing book, there's always an update that NIMS provides on area two-way catch. Um, I know they spend some time pulling together um, the progress um, of all of the fisheries. Um, and so my thought was for purposes of the council, um, this would be an easy vehicle um, to uh, use to transmit that information to the council um, without um, establishing kind of a new and independent reporting um, process to the council. Um, with regard to the um, in-season discussions that go on between agencies, um, you know, we all do that all the time, independent of one another. And I think what would be of interest here is knowing, um, for example, if there are three fishing periods, 
um, when the first period concludes, um, what can NIMS tell us? Um, and if you notice here, the language that I use in this motion, um, just asking NIMS to provide information, I'm not saying exactly what information, how specific the information needs to be. Um, I, you know, again, they're going to be very limited in what they can tell us and, you know, they're going to have to use the rules that apply with what they can convey to us. But I think the key here is trying to get information on a timely basis that, for example, if period one, um, they see very little yellow eye, I mean, I'd be interested in hearing a report that they saw very little yellow eye or, um, you know, uh, de minimis or however they would characterize it. Um, I mean, they've used some descriptive language in this report they provided us here about um, some things. They they clearly looked at the records and uh, were able to summarize in some ways because they could tell us that 77% of the trips were absor uh, observed um, off the Columbia, Columbia River um, general area. So, you know, I'm I'm not intending to be prescriptive in what information they provide but again i think the goal here is really just to increase the transparency and um make folks uh have some comfort that period one um didn't have any significant consequence and then you know similarly for period two uh and three if there is one and so on um and those communications i wouldn't you know be intending to um make them be formal or um you know uh put out a press release kind of thing but these are be more in line with the informal communications we have about in-season catch tracking already um between the agencies and nymphs and the iphc so that was my thinking um if my um you know, if there are other ideas on how that be done, um, I'm certainly open to it, but I guess that's that's where I would, that's what I would like, <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you for that explanation, Marcy. Thank you. Okay, okay. any more questions, comments, discussion? Maggie Summer, Maggie? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you for the motion, Marcy. Uh, I, I certainly agree with the uh, desire to have um, some more timely information on yellow eye bycatch in this fishery. Um, uh, on the first part of the motion, I I am uh, I, I guess unclear uh, about how it would work, um, and that is stemming primarily from the, the fact that I, I am not familiar with how IPHC. Uh, processes their logbook data and, and what they do with it. Um, I, I do understand they provide, you know, there are several options for which logbook fishermen in 2A can use. Um, so there's you know, everything from a little bit of logistic question of are the, is there an appropriate place on each of those for fishermen to use. Uh, but then I, you know, I'm not sure what the expectation we would be conveying to them if this um, motion is adopted as as proposed here on what exactly they would be providing to us would it simply be copies of those logbooks um, in which case there would then be a need for uh, someone at the national marine fishery service uh, the, i guess the way this is written to enter uh, and, and summarize that information, or you know, might we expect IPHC to do that? I, I can say um, right now, ODFW receives copies of halibut logbooks that when they have ground fish on them, um, and we enter only the ground fish information into our own databases, but that's certainly one state out of three, uh, uh, you know, that, is not a solution to this issue. I will say it does make me think that this is um, 
an item to flag for future consideration as we move into the transition of, of manage, you know, transition into managing this fishery. Uh, but for right now, um, you know, if you have any more, uh, I guess, clarity on, on what the expectation we would be conveying to IPHC here would be, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, Arcee? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Maggie, for the question. Um, I will admit to likewise not being well versed in how the IPHC processes its data, um, nor what um, sharing arrangements IPHC has with NIMS, but I would presume that since it would be IPHC. You know, if the record is on an IPHC log, then it would be an IPHC record. And the request would be for summary data um, because I would expect that IPHC is, um, you know, or the confidentiality rules would still need to be adhered to. So um, I appreciated Frank's response that. There just wasn't really time to explore this option very thoroughly um, between the discussion I had with him on Friday and today. Um, when I had the discussion with him, there was more of a, you know, maybe this this might be viable kind of a response. And I, I don't think I heard anything different um, in the discussion here today. So if it is viable, um, I would just like to see if we can do it. Um, I'm viewing that this is our um, only bite at this apple. If it's not, um, I'd love to hear that too. Um, if taking that up, but but I, I feel like, you know, with regard to IPHC, um, this is our only bite at the apple. Um, and so, you know, I would, I would just, I think, you know, the details of how this would happen, I agree, um, need some fleshing out. And um, it's just, I, I can't say what, you know, what works and what doesn't work because <laughs> I'm not NIMS or IPHC, but I appreciate that there are some details here that we don't uh, understand in full. Um, but I don't think that changes um, our fundamental interest in capturing data from this source if this is a, if the tool is available uh, in the toolkit. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Frank Locker. Frank? Um, thank you. Um, so, um, Marcy, I think um, I'm, I'm getting some um, you know, information uh, from the Observer Program that um, some of the specifics may require more work um, uh, than um, maybe as it then was anticipated. But so, but so I'm kind of wondering: is it uh, is can can your motion kind of be taken that you're very interested in coming up with a way to get better information more quickly on what's going on with yellow eye and, and that general kind of concern is more important than the specific how it's done is 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 that correct Marcy? yes thank you uh, mr vice chair thank you frank um i think what you're asking is will i be satisfied with something that is less specific and the answer is absolutely yes, um, but I guess what is concerning me most and what is, I think, driving the impetus for this type of, uh, this type of specificity is I thought we left the September meeting with some um, discussion around NIMS providing us some inkling of how the fishery did in 2020. And I know you mentioned uh, in our discussion earlier that um, no alarm bells went off with the observer program such that um, it, that 
levels wrist um other fisheries but that's where my concern is greatest i'm if if other fisheries would be involved because of a very high level of yellow eye take um, i'm going to guess that that would mean that the yellow eye take in the halibut fishery reached a level that approached or exceeded an abc uh, maybe an acl and you know again i i'm very concerned that that really isn't the point um just because we didn't exceed the acl doesn't mean there isn't a very real um situation here that we need to address so that's why um i'm i'm just really i think looking for a tool that will ensure that we get information in 2021 about the 2021 fishery um i realize it's not going to be precise information it's not going to be the standard what got uh, bycatch estimate but something that lets us know um you know other than by having to read a press release that nymphs took action to close the fishery because there were too many yellow eye and an acl or an abc or something was exceeded um what you know what can we do um aside from that other than watch and wait um you know again it, it just acknowledging the kind of the concern that none of us have information for the 2020 fishery and here it is november and um i guess i would have hoped for something okay thank you marcy um, Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I'd like to respond uh, to one thing Marcy just said, and then I have some comments uh, specifically on the motion in front of us. Um, I, I just briefly, I, I want to say I, I um, fully agree with the uh, level of, of concern, I think, that we all have for the successful rebuilding of the yellow eye rockfish stock. However, uh, as as a more of a matter of, of principle, I uh, don't agree with a statement that says uh, taking an up to the full amount of an ACL that the council has established based on the science we we used to set ACL levels uh, would jeopardize rebuilding or or a stock status. So I, I did want to share that thought. Um, specifically on, on the motion in front of us, uh, again, I, I also share the desire to have more timely information uh, on yellow eye uh, bycatch in this fishery, but I can't support the first paragraph of this motion. Um, I, I don't feel that it's appropriate for us to be uh, making this recommendation to an international uh, organization responsible for managing halibut fisheries uh, you know in, in order to address our specific bycatch concern particularly without uh, any understanding that they already have any kind of data processing protocols and systems in place that would facilitate uh, their provision of such summary information to us. Um, so I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think that there is potential in the long run to explore uh, the option of using logbooks as one tool to obtain more information on, on yellow eye bycatch. Uh, I, I would not support um, making this recommendation to IPHC at this point. I, I just don't feel that even if we were able to um, uh, to make the recommendation and IPHC uh, chose to implement it, I, I am not confident in in the quality of data we would get in this upcoming year and the, the our ability to just process it and deal with it in time. So uh, I, I think I would uh, prefer to not see this first portion of the motion. Um, the second part, uh, I suppose, after listening to the responses by Frank, I, I can live with it. I, I really appreciate 
the information he's provided. Um, I, I would like to um, make sure, you know, to, to emphasize, as I think you're doing with this motion, the council's interest in obtaining this information. Uh, I think the wording of directing NIMPS to do these things is, um, is really quite strong, um, but uh, it seems like that that is acceptable. So uh, I am I'm okay with the second part. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Um, Frank Lockhart, Frank. So um, maybe I'll just say um, that even had there not been this motion made, um, we would have heard loud and clear from the council, um, you know, the interest in, in finding out more information on the yellow eye. And, and as I said, we had already started down that road on having those discussions internally about what we can and can't do. You know, we're still at a very early stage of that, but, you know, we, we've heard loud and clear, you know, council guidance on wanting to have more uh, information um, in a more timely manner on yellow eye bycatch and in the in the directed halibut fishery. So we we would go ahead and do that now, regardless of what happens with this motion. I agree with Maggie. You know, we're directed is perhaps a little strong, um, but uh, Marcy did a good job of explaining by what she meant uh, by directed, which means she wants us. I, I the way we took it is that she wants us to further explore how we can provide information from the observer program in season. And um, she expresses a desire for that to be after each commercial fishery uh, period opener. So we are gonna go ahead and do that and see what we can do. Uh, and then I asked her the question about what, you know, it seems like it's more the kind of the, the information rather than the specifics of how it's done that are more important and she agreed with that. So, you know, I think, um, uh, we have heard loud and clear from all of the members that spoke and also from uh, the gap on the need to have better information. So we're, we're going to go ahead and do that, you know, regardless of the outcome of this uh, motion. So I just wanted to say that. And, and finally, I'm, I'm going to abstain on any vote on this motion, not because I'm opposed to it, but more that, uh, like I said, I'm not sure, given the specifics of it, how, if, how we can we may not be able to do all of this, so I'm going to abstain for that reason. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Marcy? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, with the approval of the second, I would request to withdraw the motion. Uh, Bob, your hand. I approve. Okay. Okay, Marcy? Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the council's discussion here around the table. Um, really, that was the point. Um, we, I think, talked in detail about what may or may not be possible um, through the IPHC. And um, in withdrawing, I would expect that there be some discussions that might ensue between NIMS and IPHC about um, prospects of um, using that tool uh, down the road. Um, there are a lot of things that I'm still learning <laughs> and struggling to understand with regard to regulatory authority uh, over this fishery. What uh, regs are um, promulgated under authority of the Halibut Act um, versus Magnuson. Um, and I think, you know, I've got a lot to learn in that regard. Um, but I feel like the discussion we've had here um, today, I really appreciate Frank's um, acknowledgement that um, the direction is clear. Um, they will move forward. Um, I think he's understanding exactly what I'm seeking with regard to uh, in-season communications on um, what the observers are seeing, even though, of course, um, he can't provide us hard numbers. Um, but you know, whatever um, the confidentiality rules will allow, um, whatever descriptive information he can provide us um, over the course of the season to um, improve our transparency and improve the um, confidence that the fishery is um, working as expected um, and, and in line with the amount of impact that we ascribe in the scorecard. 
Um, so with that, I will um, withdraw the motion, um, but I, I do appreciate the time we've spent here today digging into some of these um, issues for future work. Um, I do look forward to um, discussing um, these concepts uh, in more detail, um, looking forward to the following season. And, um, you know, I, I just can't say enough how much I'm feeling for our, our GAP members that um, are really just looking at this, you know, this big blow and saying, you know, how can we do nothing? And I, I absolutely feel the same way. And so I do um, appreciate Frank's um, willingness to do their best to get us something uh, in near real time um, next season. And that that's a start. Um, but recognizing the impact this fishery can have on yellow eye bycatch and the, the sharing arrangements that we have, um, I think we have um, quite a lot of work ahead of us um, looking down the road um, as we bring this fishery more um, within our realm and our, our council discussions and, and regulate um, under Magnuson and NIMS authority and council. Uh, oversight. So um, again, I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for indulging me. Thank you, Marcy. I see Frank, your hand is still up. Sorry about that. I'll lower it. Okay. All right. Um, further discussion? Heather Hall, who I think may have a motion, maybe. Heather? Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I didn't mean to jump in too soon. Um, before you um, ask if there was more discussion, but I, I do have another motion to offer on the season structure for 2021, if folks are ready for that. Please. Okay, Sandra, if you could put that up, that would be great. There it is. I move that the council recommend to the IPHC a season structure for the area 2A non-tribal directed halibut fishery in 2021 that includes a 58 hour fishing period, which begins at 8 a.m. on the fourth Tuesday in June and ends at 6 p.m. on the subsequent Thursday. If the fishery limit has not been exceeded, the IPHC may announce a second fishing period of up to three fishing days to begin on Tuesday, two weeks after the first period. And if necessary, a third fishing period of up to three fishing days to begin on Tuesday, four weeks after the first period. Fishing period openings will continue in this manner until the fishery limit for the 2A non-treaty non directed commercial fishery is taken or November 15th, with whichever comes first. Thank you, Heather. Uh, does the language on the screen uh, accurately reflect your motion? Yes, it does. Okay, uh, please speak to you. Oh, look at for a second, Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Uh, okay, speak to, uh, please speak to your motion. All right, thank you. Um, I, I really think the council's taken a, a good step um, to work, develop a process that solicits input from um, folks involved in the Area 2A directed halibut fishery. Um, and based on that input, this motion includes a season structure um, to recommend to the IPHC so that they can um, consider that during their interim and annual meetings. Uh, WDFW held two meetings with our stakeholders and heard strong interest in changing the days of the week that the fishery operates from Monday through Wednesday to Tuesday through Thursday. And I really appreciate the council's willingness to put those that proposal out for public review. We also heard consistent support for the move away from 10 hour fishing periods and general support for the 58 hour fishing period that was in place in 2020. During our discussions about the move to a Tuesday through Thursday fishing period, we heard that while a fishing period that ended on Thursday would help fishermen deliver product to the public over the weekend, it might disrupt commercial buying schedules. This is the discussion that led to the idea of a two-day, 34-hour fishing period, um, which was reasonable to the Washington stakeholders that I met with. Um, it resolved potential commercial buying concerns 
and addressed input from the enforcement consultants. However, from the advisory body reports today and, and um, public testimony that we've heard over the last two council meetings, I hear a stronger preference for a 58 hour fishing period, um, but a willingness to consider a Tuesday through Thursday fishing period in the future. While I, I really appreciate the concerns from, from the EC, I think this season structure has merit and gives fishers uh, marketing opportunities that are beneficial to themselves and our coastal communities. Um, and finally, while it isn't currently part of the scope of action, there's been a fair amount of discussion around allowing split deliveries. Um, the GAP has made their support for this clear in their reports to the council. And I support looking for ways to give fishery participants a flexibility to maximize the econo economic benefit um, from this fishery. Um, but as we discussed in the WDFW report, um, a way to sell to multiple buyers currently exists in a way that addresses the EC's concerns with split deliveries. So while allowing split deliveries might be the simplest approach from a fishery participant's perspective, it creates a significant enforcement challenge. And given the additional stress that's put on our enforcement resources um, associated with the longer fishing period, I don't think we should add to the enforcement challenges that are associated with, with split deliveries. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for that, Heather. Um, questions for Heather on her motion? Uh, Bob Dooley, Bob? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I'm just a question on the, on the wording. Uh, I assume this, the, the, uh, the additional openings, if they're, if they're uh, are able to happen, are 58 hour fishing periods too, not three days? Uh, I, I'm a little confused by that, but I assume it's, the, it's in the same format as the first 58 hour fishing period, is that? Is that correct, Heather? Heather? Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Thank you, Bob, for the question. I I took the language specifically from the IPHC rules, um, but can certainly appreciate that it is a little bit confusing when we talk about three days, but it's it's really 58 hours. And I found myself doing that too with the, the option for a 34 hour or two day <laughs> fishing period. So um but yeah it's intended it's intended to mirror that that same um 8 a.m uh tuesday ending at 6 p.m on the following thursday throughout thank you heather i just wanted to clarify thank you sure okay further questions comments okay um well seeing none um i'm going to call for the question let everybody uh, unmute. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Um, okay, um, Brett, are we, uh, are we done here? Thank you, Vice Chair. I believe your work here is done. You've adopted the season structure for 2021. You got some thoughts and guidance from around the table, and I'm sure National Fisheries Service is going to take that to heart and try to come up with other means to report halibut bycatch in the future. So I appreciate that discussion very much. Um, I think your work here under E3 is completed. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brett. Um, okay, well, that, as that concludes our action, I'm going to uh, hand the gavel back to our uh, our chairman, uh, Chair Grolick. Mark? Uh, thanks so much, Brad, uh, for getting us uh, back on schedule. Uh, you should have the gavel more often, maybe. Um, we really do try to split it 50-50, but it, uh, some days it doesn't work out that way. So that completes our business for today. Tomorrow we have a ground fish item that uh, Brad will um, start with. Um, and let me turn to Executive Director Tracy to see if he has any concluding thoughts for the day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Uh, well, I, I guess I would just mention that uh, <clears throat> um, we, uh, depending on how things go tomorrow, we had talked about the possibility of moving up a couple of things from Wednesday, uh, specifically the Sablefish MSC update and the methodology review. So uh, I, I, while I'm not uh, recommending that at this point, I just did kind of want to get people that, uh, uh, that are involved with those the heads up to see um, we'll be checking in to see the status of, uh, of the reports and materials and uh, people's availability uh, just in the eventuality that we do find ourselves in a situation where we might be able to do that. Um, but uh, other than that, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Chuck. Um, good job today, everyone. And uh, I guess we will break until uh, 8 o'clock.